put me in. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, 15th of December, 2020. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the sites for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Will all present stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country, at sea, on land and in the air? Thank you. Thank you, members. Please be seated. Members, we have a packed agenda tonight. Uh, welcome to members of the public who are joining us in the gallery tonight. And I also believe there's a number joining us in the Queen Adelaide room. Um, welcome. Uh, members, we have no apologies or leave of absence tonight. So I'll go to item six, which is the confirmation of minutes from the 10th of November and the 8th of December. I look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Abraham Zadeh, a seconder. Thanks to Councillor Knoll. Members, any alterations, suggestions? If not, I'll go to move to sum up. Okay. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, sorry, uh, Councillor Kerr, I didn't see your vote. Councillor Martin, did you vote? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, deputations. Members, I know we would normally only have five deputations. However, I have allowed a few extra this evening. We have seven deputations. Um, the first will be Tim Hall uh, to speak on Park 9 development by PAC. Um, <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Uh, just before you start, um, we uh, so there will be five minutes for yep. the deputation, but there's no questions afterwards. Okay. Understand. Thank you, Tim. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, make this deputation. Uh, I do appreciate how busy tonight's agenda is. I wish to cover five very briefly main issues uh, put uh, forward by the proposal. Firstly, size. Recommendation 2.1 on page 19 of your papers proposes a footprint of 375 square metres, which results in only 335 square metres of usable space, whereas the 410 square metres recommended by PAC, the proponent, and approved by APLA results in 375 square metres of usable space. This discrepancy arose from a combination of misunderstandings about impact of walls and areas dedicated for building services 
and what is and what is not AFL facility compliant. 335 square metres is fundamentally too small to be AFL facility compliant, as was the case in 2017 when it was first before council and remains the case today. I confirmed that issue with um, Lisa Farachi, uh, the Infrastructure and Community Development Manager from SANFL, and in her email to me on 4 December 2020, included the following paragraph, and I quote, City of Adelaide's proposed footprint of 335 square metre floor area with a total footprint of 375 square metres is below what could be considered compliant under the AFL preferred facilities guidelines. I'm happy to provide a copy of that email to you as well. Um, APLA has accepted the explanation and requests that Council adopt APLA's recommendation for 410 square metre footprint as included in the proposed redesign. Secondly, location. Um, I refer you to uh, the overlay plan in page 32 of your papers that disclose the current proposal compared with the 2015 proposal. Um, what we've done is made it shorter and fatter to fit on a, a location that makes sense. Uh, and the reduced footprint represents a reasonable and really compromise for users of the oval and, and hopefully any concerns about location. It simply makes sense and provides better utility to users of the oval and the play space. And please also note that location does not dictate use and behaviours. As to use, use is dictated to by the lease terms and the liquor licence issued by the liquor licensing authorities. The lease provides for a permitted use is for sporting activities with limited social activities as to time and only ancillary to sporting activities and no legal licence can be obtained without City of Adelaide consent. This is not a pub in the park, and to use such words is simply incorrect, misleading, and creates unnecessary concerns. There is no way that opponents want to run a pub or the legal licensing authority or City of Adelaide will allow us to do so. Very little change from what we have done for the last 30 years. We hold a club licence for football in winter and we need to vary the licence to take into account the new facility and club licences can't be used for third party events. Both City of Adelaide and residents will be consulted and have the power to object to any application to vary the conditions of any liquor licence. I very much look forward to dealing with any such concerns as a use in an appropriate forum before the Liquor Licence Commissioner next year. Time. I refer you to the timeline at page 30 of your agenda papers. It has been five years since this application was first put to community consultation and we have responded to each and every concern raised back in 2015 by making the facility smaller, both in height and footprint, moving it back towards Bundy's Road and limiting the use and activities. This has taken way too long and further delays should be unnecessary given the proposal and the lease is going back to community consultation. Um, it is not unreasonable to uh, request that no further delays and that Council resolves the new proposal and leaves to go to community consultation. Um, parking was an issue raised by somebody. Um, it was a bit awkward in July this year due to COVID restrictions. There were um, an incident where parking was uh, extremely very bad weather. Uh, due to uh, COVID-19 restrictions, we couldn't use our normal marquees and facilities. Uh, and hopefully the new facility will alleviate those issues. Therefore, it's my uh, request um, uh, that Council accept the recommendation to approve the proposal and the lease for the purpose of community consultation early next, next year with a current design proposal as opposed by PAC and recommended by APLO. To avoid yet another redesign and three to more four month delay, it would be appreciated if Council would amend recommendation 2.1 on page 19 to read instead of 375 square metres, 410 square metres as opposed by PAC and recommended by APLA. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, our next deputation is from uh, Ted uh, Jedniak on part nine development, PAC. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, I need to, first of all, um, just uh, declare my conflict of interest in this matter. Uh, it was 1982, I was 
playing centre half forward for the St Ignatius Old Collegians Football Club. And we were in, we we're going to lose this match, it meant we we're going to be relegated. This match happened to be against POC Old Collegians. So, uh, as it turned out, just before the final siren, at centre half forward, I took the mark and I am now in a position to be able to, we're four points down, so I've got to get this goal in order to be able to save our whole team and club from being relegated. Anytime I hear POC, a psychiatrist says I am actually coping with this quite well, but uh, three decades later I just wonder. But I do have some affection for the Parklands, and particularly right now we reside 13 McKinnon Parade. It's literally 85 metres from that half forward flank position where I took the mark. And what uh, has become apparent is that on behalf of the residents, in this local area. I want to make it crystal clear that we fully support a development that promotes sport and use of the playing field. Council approved the development in 2017 on the existing site. And as local residents, we fully support that. It's worth noting that Park 9 is the smallest park in the Adelaide Park lands with a playing field. And what this means is that residents are closest to the literal playing field. Our key concern is with the new proposed development is the change of use from change rooms and toilets to licensed venue serving alcohol right next to a playground. There is currently a license in place for up to 350 people. And this is the perfect scenario to create the environment for the pub in the park atmosphere. With up to 350 people drinking and celebrating into the evening, the likelihood of disruptive behavior is very high. The impact of a pub in the park on the residential amenity is our primary concern as local residents. And 350, it's an interesting number because within 350 metres of Park 9 are three licensed venues, the Kentish, the British and the Lion Hotel. Each of those are perfect venues for post-match activities. Other Adelaide and North Adelaide residents living in close proximity to the parklands are watching this approval process very closely. If there was just one thing that you remembered from my deputation, it would be this. If you approve this license for booze, it's our votes you will lose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jedniak. Uh, the third deputation we have tonight is from Robert Cardoni on the RCC activation during Fringe 2021. Welcome, Robert. Good evening, all. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to respond to some of, maybe some of the comments I've received back from councillors and probably just some of old versus new RCC, Royal Croquet Club, RCC. We kept the brand and the name mainly because there's a big loyalty to it and it's mainly a lot of young people, yes. But I just want to remind you that this first started in 2014 in Victoria Square when council was looking for somebody to activate a square when it was just uh, newly uh, rebuilt. There were no guidelines back then. You were allowed to trade until three in the morning or you were testing it. You were allowed to have high music levels or it was a test to find out how it went. You were allowed to close off a road, but it was a test. And I think in those next couple of years of being on Victoria Square, it became a bit of a pest event for most people in the area. And I understand those concerns. Things have changed. We've been um, on an, at that university campus now, when now we're looking to come back to Victoria Square. We're not gonna be going until 3 a.m. It's just impossible. You have strict guidelines. You've learned from the past. 
We've learnt there's no pushing the button here of trying to get it past that. There are music levels that you mitigate and that you have set. They're things that we have to do. If we don't, if we don't do them, you just kick us out. It's quite simple. And you know, myself personally, having to invest millions of dollars in this event, it is not. And I thanks Tim for this line. Um, a pub in a park. And I think a lot of people get misunderstood, and they kind of like think it's just young people getting drunk and and disorderly. Well, I got to remind you, we've actually created some young families from 2014 because they were going there when they were young, and now they're young families, and they'll be coming back and they'll want to share it. I've got children that are in, you know, 18 and 15, and obviously my daughter would love to go, but she probably might get a hand in, but not very, not uh, at uh, very late times. But you've got to understand that this is just, there are things that young people need to gravitate to. And if it's in the middle of the heart of a city, you are giving people, when I was young, we didn't have much. We left this city and then we all came back when it's COVID. You know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not the way I'd like to see it. But I just want to let everyone know that there, there is a change. COVID has changed us. We can't have a massive music concert thumping out there. It has to be seeded. The experience we create, you know, there's an investment here of millions of dollars. It's not, it's not just a food and drink and beverage that just sucks the volume of money from people. This event has attracted 400,000 people in two years on the city of Adelaide University campus. So in this COVID year, I don't expect to get those sort of numbers. And that's to be real about it. But I know in all of my experience of having multiple businesses across this city, and I've had probably at least 10 of them in the city centre over my career, every time an event, every time a festival was on, we were so happy that we got to get money in sales that we otherwise would never have received a boost. When I lost, um, when we had uh, Scuzzi and Rundle Street and the Grand Prix disappeared, I can tell you our bottom line changed very much in the next year. There's a couple of things that we should be aware of, and that is with COVID in the East End, I don't think you'll have any trader complaining about, um, about uh, the fringe not coming back to the East End. The biggest problem we're going to have this year is the flood of people going into the East End. And, and, and how do you mitigate that? And how do you spread these people across the city? If there was another place in the city that it could spread to, and we could spread people around the city, like the centre of the city where RCC is hoping to go, I think that would be a very smart move. Um, working closely with SA Health has had to make us create a new format, um, an offering and experience, and limits to concerts is one of them. Um, this is a visual arts installation. We have the Stables Project, which is a world-class physical theatre of South Australian people that are recognised internationally doing this. Um, we attract, yes, young people, but we attract young families and we have people that go to shows. And when they go to shows, they like to go to dinner first or they like to go out afterwards. Unfortunately, we cannot operate closing at 10 p.m., but we can operate under those guidelines issued by the council at 12 on weekends and 11 during the week, and we can operate mitigating the noise to the level set by council. We also are very good at ushering people on and off premises. It's something we've become very good at. But I can say from 12 o'clock onwards, all the pubs in town, the bars and the nightclubs will get all of that trade that otherwise would have been something that we would have probably held on to. It is no longer for us. We will hopefully start earlier with after work trade and then go and finish at 12 on the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Um, Thank you. The uh, next deputation is from uh, Stephen Yarwood on the East West Bike Lane. Um, we are actually uh, ringing the bell at four, then we've got a minute to finish. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, uh, Councillors, CEO of Administration, it's a delight to be here. I come uh, not only as the uh, patron of Bicycle South Australia, but someone who was sat in that chair, has had two terms on council, uh, but also addressed mayors and administrations from cities around Australia, dozens if not uh, over 100 mayors on how cities work and how transport uh, should work and the infrastructure uh, that we need. My primary message tonight is to ask that we stop this discussion about bikes versus cars. If nothing 
COVID has taught us uh, that we need to be kind and compassionate and work together as a collaborative uh, to solve problems and provide solutions for all our citizens. It's about creating a better normal that works for everyone who wants to use the City of Adelaide. Uh, I really want to stress that this bicycle lane is not controversial. It is fundamentally bog standard infrastructure that every city in the world should uh, provide, like airports, uh, like trains, like bus stops. It's not crazy, it's not unusual, it's something that is long overdue. Uh, just as your colour, your religion, your sexuality does not define your place in society, riding a bike does not make you a second class citizen. And turning down funding to put this cycling infrastructure in is an absolute no-brainer when the piggy bank is empty and it's time to spend and create jobs and create transport solutions for the city itself. Uh, there's no doubt that cars are important in the city and I've never suggested otherwise. We have 26 east-west lanes for cars. We also <laughs> have 45,000 car parks in the city. We have washed the city with car parking infrastructure. It is one of the top cities in the world in terms of car parking per person, per capita, of the uh, 500 cities over a million people on this planet. We even have 26 east-west pedestrian lanes. The pedestrians get a fair go as well. Uh, but unfortunately, we do not have one single safe separated east-west bicycle lane for the 5% of people that choose to ride in the city. Uh, that, to a certain extent, could be argued is institutionalised segregation, where we're not fulfilling our obligation to provide balanced network of transport infrastructure uh, for, for all uh, users of the city. Uh, and I understand this city uh, is focused on economic development, and as a government, not a private sector, your role is to think about the business of citizens and the business of cities. We have an obesity epidemic. We lose $20 billion of lost economic productivity from sitting in traffic jams. Providing this infrastructure is a part of the solution to making our citizens more efficient, more healthy and more productive as we move on. I'm really concerned about this media fueling a campaign over a loss of just 200 car parks. Our downtown urban environment is awash with car parks. Uh, we have 45,000, and so actually reducing the number of car parks by 200 is 0.0005% of car parks. Uh, keeping in mind that if we bring in hundreds more people on cycles, on bicycles, if not thousands, these are people that would have otherwise potentially driven into the city and actually used those car parks in themselves. We may actually create more car parks by reducing the number of people who drive into the city. So um, having studied the cities of the world, uh, I believe we're holding ourselves uh, back from creating the most efficient way uh, of moving hundreds of thousands of people in and out of the city every day. We need a choice orientated and equitable transport system that all modern intelligent cities strive for. The key here is that we do not always need to ask permission of the community. We don't consult on airports, we don't consult on repaving roads, planting trees, electrifying rail or even putting in bus lanes. You don't have to ask the community's permission to provide essential infrastructure. Uh, my challenge to you is that you can ask the community's permission to do anything you want or, as elected members, you can lead and actually do things because you've been given the power and the opportunity. Uh, I know that during my term, there was a reputation of getting things done, and I certainly hope you will keep hold of this funding and to be seen as a council that gets on and doing things. If there is one thing that I could offer as my time as Lord Mayor to all of the councillors in the room is that building cities is not all about you. It's not about me. It's about all citizens and we have an obligation as urbanists, as planners, as, as elected members to provide infrastructure for all citizens and not create an environment where we provide for one and build a second tier, second class citizen in the city of Adelaide. Uh, you, the catch case has been to stay safe this year and I hope that we can create safe infrastructure for all Adelaideans. Thank, Thank you. you.
members, our next deputation is from Bailey Underwood. Um, again, on the east-west bike lane. Thank you, Bailey. The bell will go up four and give you a minute to sum up. Thank you and good evening, everyone. My name is Bailey Underwood. I'm a 23-year-old commerce graduate. Um, I work on North Terrace here in the city. I've been coming into and out of the city since I was about 16 and uh, my most common form of transport to get in and out is uh, cycling. Um, partly for fitness and recreation, but uh, partly because it's actually the quickest way for me to get from my home to university and to work. Um, I own a car, a motorcycle and a metro card, but cycling is often my first choice. Recently, while cycling to work down Paynham Road, a car crossed two lanes of queued traffic in an, in an attempt to complete a right-hand turn. But unfortunately, they didn't check the third lane, which was the bike lane. I was flung over the handlebars of my bike and up the side of the car. I landed on my back with my face a few inches from the car's rear tyre in the middle of a very busy road. <clears throat> my bike was quite badly mangled from the impact, and I was actually quite lucky to walk away with a few grazes, bruises, uh, quite a sore back and some stiff legs. The driver was deeply apologetic and uh, very kindly offered to pay for the repairs for my bike. I didn't see you until it was too late, she told me. Unfortunately, this is a phrase my fellow bike rider and housemate has heard twice in the last six months alone from two similar incidents while commuting to and from the city. I was quite lucky in that I walked away without serious injuries or worse, and being hit by that car really only highlighted to me the safety issues present with much of Adelaide's current cycling infrastructure. Bike lanes are either not clearly marked enough or motorists often just forget all about them. For a cyclist, being in close proximity to vehicles can be quite life-threateningly dangerous. As a road user who travels by multiple forms of transport, I take extra care to be wary of other cyclists and motorcyclists while driving a car. I treat bike lanes as real lanes, but from the countless near misses that I've experienced from my time cycling to and from the city, it would appear that many motorists don't. A solid white line or a green lane often does little to protect people. This issue, however, is one that I believe can be significantly lessened through the power of smart city planning and design. I believe that cycling is good for health it's good for the environment and it's good for people's back pockets. And any initiative to make cycling a safer, more efficient and traffic busting option has my support. I come before you this evening to promote safe cycling for all young people and to implore council to, pro to prioritise safety for our most physically vulnerable road users before you vote on the East West Bikeway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Underwood. Uh, the next deputation tonight is by Nick Karazopoulos uh, on the East West Bikeway. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thank you, Lord Mayor, councillors. Uh, the Greek Orthodox community of South Australia is a not-for-profit not community organisation with strong ties to the City of Adelaide and the broader Greek community in South Australia for over 90 years. It operates a very broad range of services in South Australia, including, including in the City of Adelaide. It is also operative in aged care, community services and religious activities, with many of its members being elderly and infirm. The community in the latter part of the 20th century expanded support programs providing service and assistance for first generation Greeks through church services, community care services, aged care services, and social housing and continue to provide social support and radio programs keeping the Hellenic community at large in contact with the new the news of the day-to-day -day, of the day-to-day -day, as well as supporting their children who are seeking greater information and support in looking after their aging parents. The Greek Orthodox community has remained the beacon, the central point of call for all Hellenes in Adelaide and the surrounding suburbs. The community is now aiding a major cross-section of the Greek community, ranging from the old and frail to the middle-aged to the younger generation. The younger generation receiving tuition in Greek and Greek culture through its after-school hours 
Greek classes, while mature persons require access to facilities that were established for their use, as their place of worship, the Cathedral of Michael and Gabriel in Franklin Street, where we also conduct weddings, funerals and baptisms. The hall next door, the Olympic Hall, is where they can congregate, socialise, celebrate or commiserate, which leads me to the topic at hand. There are two main reasons why the committee requested to be heard this evening. There was no consultation between, between council and its ratepayers in Franklin Street about the pending decision regarding bike lanes or the east-west bikeway, not recently. There were also flaws in the report that had been produced in relation to the east-west bikeway, which, need, which needs to be highlighted as it would and should have an effect on the decision that council make regarding this topic. Under our, the secondly, our, under our constitution, we need to act in the best interests of our community, and we do not believe this proposed concrete structure, single-use bikeway, is in the best interest of the Hellenic community using its Franklin Street facilities. You may say, build it and they will come. We say, if not broken, why tinker with it? The South Australian motorist community at large have, with the bike fraternity, coexisted for several years. Now, given the increase in popularity of bike riding, we applaud the success. Recent state laws have further protected cyclists' safety with all indications of the increase in usage of cycle lanes, as well as there being an increase in the provision of bike lanes per se by all councils has worked well. The bike riders must feel safe, as we would have heard about their safety concerns throughout through their lobby group. Two dedicated bike lanes running through Franklin Street is not going to change the big picture. All bike riders are not going to use that one lane going into the city and coming out. There are numerous destinations that the bike riders will be heading to in the city and Franklin Street will not deliver them to their final destination. We say to council, why not wait and assess the impact of the city's current expansion before council start putting up concrete barriers that will cause untold safety issues for those who use our facilities in Franklin Street. That does not mean we are not willing to change, but we see this proposal as a backward step. Franklin Street will not be easy access, easily accessed because of these barriers and a lack of parking will, first, will force persons to do their business elsewhere. Members of the Greek Orthodox community will not be able to easily access their hall facility, especially those that are aged or incapacitated, nor a funeral will be possible given the proposed bikeway will abut the footpath and the hearse will not be able to park on Franklin Street. Further, we have over 400 persons attending bingo over the weekend. Moreover, the concerns in relation to the report the council will be basing its decision on this evening, the report outlines figures and, expect and expectations that should occur once the bike lanes are constructed. We question these statistics. Is that really the case with Frome Road bike lane? that was constructed two to three years ago. What benefits has Frome Road, uh, the north-south lane, brought to the city? The report has also failed council that it does not provide detail of the effect that the dedicated bike lane would have on the existing ratepayers. Some, like us, have been in their location for over a night between 90 and, 100 and 130 years. How can council make the right decision regarding this process proposal unless all the information that is all the information, all the informed as to the benefits and proper facts and uh, to the downside uh, with a clear outline of what impact would be on the stakeholders. In concluding, I, I ask council to, to as follows, please understand that our city was constructed within one square mile. So do not try to compare us with what has occurred in other cities in Australia. In respect to bike lanes, our uniqueness also prevents us from trying to be their equal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our final deputation tonight is from William Stewart, uh, talking to us on Franklin Street Land Management Agreement. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, William, this isn't going before Council tonight, but I know that you've they've been in contact with a lot of members, so I thought I would allow you to speak that, to this. Lord Mayor. We have a couple of uh, show and tell boards. I don't know if it's possible if I can have someone just show them. They might be difficult to see, but if it's possible, is it possible, Lord Mayor? Not, if, they, if they can do it from the gallery, that would be fine. I think it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, right honourable Lord Mayor and uh, elected council members. 
My name is William Stewart, as you know, and I'm a resident of Altitude Building uh, and a representative of the Community Corporation 26048, which is, encompasses 171 units uh, in the Altitude Building located at 10 Balfour's Way on the West End. I've been given permission to speak on behalf of the owners of the building tonight. I'm here today to voice our concern over the proposed development of 156 to 172 Franklin Street, known as West Franklin 2 or Balfour Square. This development site is located on the southern side of our building and directly in front of our building entrance. SCAP recently deferred the decision on the development until Council approved a variation on the height limitations of the current LMA. The current LMA in place limits the height of the building on this development to 25 metres with a 20% variance and the developer is seeking a further 28 metres <laughs> in height, maximising the development to 53 metres. Some years ago, the City of Adelaide Council had a vision for this site known as the precinct, and Council endorsed, advertised and designed the LMA to uphold this vision. This is the legal document to make sure that this site is developed per the original plan and it should not be amended for any reason. Recently, Mr Michael Roder QC uh, made it very clear to us in a meeting and simply said this development does not pass the pub test. We believe that if Adelaide City Council want to grow the population of the city and they have to uphold this LMA as it stands and give the public the confidence to invest in the city precinct for the long term. In 2014, Zen Tang Precinct Loft Price Limited, the current developer of the West Franklin site, signed the current LMA, clearly showing the council's vision and plans for the development site known as the precinct, with scaled and varying building heights ranging from 58 metres to 25 metres in height. Stage one of the development had already been completed and it had been completed within the LMA specifications. And as such, we investors, bought properties with confidence, knowing that the LMA was enforceable and would safeguard us against any further overdevelopment of the site. The current altitude building was originally designed and built to have a lower level building on the southern side with privacy concerns and balcony designs taken into consideration. If this development goes ahead as proposed with a 53 metre tower, a further 30 to 40% will be wiped off current property values. Investors and owners in Altitude have already seen considerable losses in property values. Statistics have shown that if you purchase a property in Adelaide, the likelihood is you will lose money. Data provided by CoreLogic 2018 indicated that apartments purchased off the plan lost an average of $166,000 after 10 years of investment. The new development plan pro proposes that the new building will be no more than 6.9 metres from the current altitude balconies on the southern side of the building. This will totally entomb the building in concrete and extinguish all primary views, cut out all natural light and destroy the current privacy. It may also have potential structural effects on the building with wind being channeled through West Franklin 1 and then forced into a 6.9 metre channel between the two buildings. Existing residents in Altitude will have huge privacy issues and a loss of remaining natural light. If the development goes ahead, population density will more than double well over 1,000 residential lots in one Adelaide city block. Uh, currently, Egalry has 134 lots, Altitude has 171 lots, West Franklin has 274, Common Ground to the north 52, Cullinan, which has recently been approved, 202, and West Franklin Stage 3, 200. We already have social discontent. Saturday and Friday nights can resemble a war zone. We, have already, we already hired two security guards and have installed $65,000 worth of CCV2 to record and manage poor crowd behaviour. Adding another 200 apartments will only add fuel to the existing fire. What's really important here? Owners of altitude are not opposed to development and as such, it is just the additional height and density that is of major concern and detriment to the current owners of the scheme. The proposed development only uses approximately two thirds of the development site. Utilising the remaining one third of the site at a lower level would make more long-term sense and we hope enable the developer to finish the project. 
Once again, I ask all councillors to retain the existing MMA over 150, 156 to 172 Franklin Street and ensure the building height of any development on this site is limited in accordance with the height stipulated in the 2014 LMA and that was signed by the developer. I would like to finish by inviting all councillors to come and visit the site where the residents can meet and would like to meet them firsthand. Thank you. For your Merry Christmas and tonight. thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Um, members, uh, just to let you know, I also did receive a very late request uh, at 4.30 this evening from Kelly Henderson, who wanted to speak on the Water Action Plan, which I denied. Uh, members, I'm actually going to go to the agenda um, to call if what we can in terms of um, going through on block. So if we look to the agenda, as I call the numbers, if you could raise your hand if you want to pull out um, a, uh, an item. Um, there are three items on the agenda tonight, 10.6, 10.15 and 10.16. Um, I'm going to do them on block as procedurals and I'll go back to them for the nominations later um, in the evening. So, members, uh, 9.1, the advice from the Adelaide Parklands Authority for the 30th of November. 9.2, the recommendation of the Reconciliation Commission uh, Committee. Um, 10.1, free transport ticket, three public transport tickets. Uh, 10.2, Melbourne Street pedestrian crossing investigation. 10.3, Bundy's, thank you, Councillor Abraham today. 10.4, the bikeways, thank you, Councillor Donovan. 10.5, the Adelaide Economic Development Agency transitional funding agreement. 10.6, which is the procedural for the appointment of City of Adelaide member to the Adelaide City of Music Limited Board. Uh, that's the procedural. Oh, sorry. Yep, thank you. Um, 10.7, which is the proposed event in the Parklands uh, Digital Arts and Culture Exhibition, Victoria Square, Tartan Younger. Councillor Martin, is that you? Yeah. Um, 10.8, proposed, proposed event in the Parklands RCC. 10.9, proposed event in the Parklands Wonderland Spiegel 2021. 10.10, uh, .10, the City of Adelaide's Water Sensitive City Action Plan. 10.11, uh, the Draft Community Land Management Plan General Provisions. 10.12, uh, the 2021-2022 Business Plan and Budget. 10.13, the draft planning and design code response. 10.14, uh, the Adelaide Parklands Authority strategic plan. 10.15, procedural for study Adelaide. 10.16, procedural for members to appointment to the reconciliation committee. 10.17, Council of Capital City Lord Mayor's 2020 update. 10.18, the City of uh, city Business Stimulus Program. Thank you, members. So I would like a uh, member to move a motion for the following items to be moved on block, they being 9.1, 9.2, Oh, sorry, Council, which one? Sorry, Councillor. 9.2. Apologies, Councillor, I didn't see your hand. 9.1. 10.1, 10 10.2, 10 10.5, 10 10.6, 10.9, 10.13, 10.15, 10.16, 10.17. If I could have a mover. No. I've got that oh, I've got that called out, sorry. Did anybody call that out? Uh, Councillor Sims did, I believe. Yep. And I called out. Okay, so members, were there any others? Would you like me to read that list again? Yes, please. Okay, 9.1, 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, 10.6, 10.7, 10.8, 10.9, 10.10, 10.11, 10.12, 10.13, 10.14, 10.15, 10.16, 10.17, 10.18, 
those against that is carried now i'll just take a moment make sure that i have double checked which number Thank you, members. Uh, that takes us to uh, 9.2, which is a recommendation of the Reconciliation Committee. Um, Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, look, Mayor, I'm happy to move it. I just had I look a... For a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. I just had a question in respect uh, to the uh, report, which was presented to the Reconciliation Commission, uh, or at least committee, on the uh, uh, December the 2nd. Um, has the Reconciliation Committee been consulted about the city removing uh, staff members who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander? CEO. Thanks, Claire. Uh, through the presiding member, um, staffing at the City of Adelaide is under the remit of the Chief Executive Officer. Um, I'm unable to confirm whether or not any formal consultation has been undertaken um, with our Reconciliation Committee. Um, has the Reconciliation Committee been informed that our target of 1.8% employment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, has uh, is unlikely to be met um, because of the reduction uh, of two and possibly five Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from our employment list. And is there any expectation that we will meet the target of 1.8%, which is set to be met by June, that is in six months' time? CEO. Thanks, Claire, again. Uh, through the presiding members, so as part of the stretch reconciliation action plan, um, that's an important goal, um, and also as part of um, our, um, our requirements as an organisation, we do work really closely with the reconciliation committee members um, to find ways in which to make sure that we, as an organisation, um, can be the best we can be when it comes to meeting those targets. And uh, what is the best likely to be? Uh, for the plan, may I ask, Lord Mayor, given that there has been such a reduction in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'll go to the CEO. Um, if there's any other questions, perhaps we can take them on notice. Yes, yeah, three, Lord Mayor, not clear on the question. Sorry. What, what is the likely uh, percentage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment in the City of Adelaide at June 30th, given that we have a target of 1.8%, do we expect it to be 0.91%? Yeah, three of them. I'll take that one on notice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Donovan, did you wish to speak? Okay, members. If not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Thank you to the vote, members. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, members, that takes us to uh, item 10.3, which is the Bundy's Paddock um, uh, Tidlango Sports Building. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to um, move an alternate motion. There is a slight amendment uh, under uh, point two, two point one, uh, which essentially um, makes the area consistent with APLA's uh, recommendations. Thank you. I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Abraham is today to speak. Uh, Thank you. Councillor Knoll. Yes, Members? Councillor Martin. Yes, look, uh, Lord Mayor, um, I wish to raise a point of order in relation to uh, uh, part 12 of standing orders. Um, uh, I ask um, if the, uh, the Council will hear me out on the point what, of order. What is the point of order? Um, well, I'll explain that if you'll allow me to. I'm sorry, what was that? Point of order? Well, the, the point of order, Lord Mayor, is that um, it is um, likely that this matter is ultra virus. It came to Council 
uh, in December 20, uh, 7, November 2017, um, when Council resolved six points. The significant one, uh, which is in our papers at 23, is that Council resolved a detailed building concept with its footprint beginning at the site of the current club rooms would be submitted. Now, Lord Mayor, um, that is not the proposal that is before us. This proposal before us is for a building that starts well away from the footprint. Therefore, um, it is in, uh, it's put to me anyway, that the concept is ultra vires. Now, it is not canvassed in our, our standing orders, Lord Mayor, but this is a legal principle which is well used in this council. And uh, the principle is this, and I'm, I'm happy, Lord Mayor, to read to you from the well, legal... Well, what I might take is some legal advice on whether or not it is ultra vires, Councillor Martin. Well, Lord Mayor, um, would you like me to put the principle of ultra vires or...? Um... Uh, no, we'll take some. I'm sure that our legal advice will be able to tell us. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Martin, I'll just be one minute. Lord Mayor, it, would it help if I explained the argument and then you could decide whether it was necessary? I mean, it may be uh, something in the remit of uh, administration. Sorry, Councillor Martin, was the date of the decision you're referring to the 2015? No, 28th of November 2017 was the last time the matter came to Council. Thanks. Thank you for your patience, members. Lord Mayor, may, may I explain why I'm putting that point of view? Um, I think you did. No, no, I haven't. Uh, that would assist, I think. Well, the we'll just see if it is ultraviaries and if it is ultraviaries. No, but if you don't know why it's ultraviaries, um, it's impossible to provide the advice. Yes, I thought you did say. No, I, I'm mean. saying that the uh, the reason it is ultraviaries is that the nub of the issue is that it does not begin on the footprint of the current building as stipulated by the council decision of November 28, 2017, and that has never been the subject of a rescission motion. Therefore, that is the current standing decision of council. Anything that is put without a rescission is ultra virus. That is the number of the argument. I will ask um, CEO. Thanks, Rudy. Through the Lord Mayor, you don't necessarily need an explicit rescission motion or rescission wording to achieve that outcome. Uh, a decision of council, which is actually um, um, to some extent altering an earlier decision of council, that is a, an implied rescission. So if, for example, the square meterage is, is uh, being resolved to be different tonight as part of council decision compared to an earlier decision in the past, that is indeed a rescission, but it's an implied rescission. So you don't need to have a specific rescission motion to obtain that effect. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, could I ask the administration then 
given that the Legal Services Commission says that the most important ground of ultraviaries complaints, which can be heard by courts in the event of a decision of any level of government, what is their view of uh, the, the argument that um, where a council or a level of government in reaching its conclusion fails to take into account factors which were not considered, factors which were not considered, um, uh, the court can intervene? CEO. Three of ordinary, it would be helpful to receive these sorts of questions prior to the meeting because it's very difficult for the administration to sit here in a public forum and ask answer such technical questions. But I will ask Rudy to, to respond as best we can. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, we can't preempt the outcome of a, of a court ruling, a ruling or a court decision, so I can't comment on that. Thank you. And does that mean, Lord Mayor, that you're not accepting the point of order that the matter is ultra-virus? Is that your decision? So... As the presiding member? Well, based on the advice from Mr Decker, I'm ruling that the, it hasn't been breached, the point of order hasn't been breached, um, which is the advice that I've been given through the CEO. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Members, uh, Councillor Moran, yes, sorry. I'm alarmed by that. I've never heard of implied rescission in my entire career on council. So are you telling me that our legal advice is that we don't have to lodge rescission motions, we can just lodge a new motion and um, the a rescission is implied. Now that contravenes every advice over 25 years that I've asked when I've rung. In fact, I've had motions sent back to me saying, no, 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 you have to have a rescission motion first. So I think it's an important point that Phil's bringing up here. This hasn't got a rescission motion. Um, it hasn't gone through the right channels. There is no such thing as implied precision. I mean, for goodness sake. Councillor Moran, is there a, an answer you want to that? Yeah, or? What is the, so, we, have we now scrapped precision motion? No, I don't believe we have well, scrapped precision motion. There's been is the, an implied precision uh, good enough. Okay. Through. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, we have received earlier legal advice on this uh, through Kelly Jones. Um, when an implied uh, rescission makes it clear that it is indeed rescinding an earlier decision of council that is acceptable, a proper rescission motion, of course, uh, removes completely the, uh, any doubt on that intent of council. So if, for example, in this instance, my understanding is that we're talking about square meterage, which is being changed. Um, if you change that number, it's pretty clear that council is overruling its earlier decision on that. Therefore, it is an implied uh, rescinding of the earlier decision of that. If there is a, a, a proposal that is um, creating that potential doubt, then yeah, it's better to go ahead with a proper rescission motion. So it's clear for every council member that um, we are completely rescinding uh, the full decision of the past. Well, well, my motion further on in the agenda says that I want all the positions that have been voted for uh, for external we're, we're and internal not... paid boards. Why did I need a rescission for that? For that, that was quite clear that I wanted the decision upturn. When is a res when is an implied rescission motion not clear? So, uh, anyway, I, look, I won't we'll, waste we'll the get to I that. won't waste the time. I think the legal advice needs to be checked because it doesn't make any logical <laughs> sense. Through will be uh, happy to take that on those. Yep. Thank you, uh, members. Can, uh, d uh, <laughs> hide. Um, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. The, the line of questioning just concerns me a little bit because I was under the impression that we're only approving this for community consultation purposes. We are, that is correct. So as a result of this, nothing will be built. There's, not, there's no backhoes going into Bundy's Park and digging it up and concrete going down, is that? No, as, for, as by point five, it's being released for statutory consultation for a period of four weeks. Okay, I just wanted to clarify because it sounded like that was, this was the final decision. Um, uh, but I, Look, put, I wouldn't be... Lord Mayor, yeah, there was no such inference. Um, he's out of it. Well, okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that okay. means, Councillor. Councillor High, Councillor High, did you wish I, to just just to clarify, Lord Mayor? You know, I I would be happy to approve for the purposes of consulting. I'm not necessarily to see what the community thinks. And we've heard from some, and we've heard from others over email and over the phone, and I'm very grateful for that feedback because I believe it will factor into the final decision making. Um, I wouldn't be comfortable approving it right now. Uh, without having gone and consulted. So to say, I mean, the argument would say that uh, if you needed a, if, if you're saying you need a decision now, it's because you're making a decision now on the footprint. Um, but in fact, we're not making a decision on the footprint, we're making a decision on consultation. And perhaps if a rescission is required for the previous motion, noting that, of course, under the Local Government Act, it is illegal to bind uh, a future council to a decision of, say, this current council or, or what have you. Um, so I think the ultraviaries argument is sketchy at best. Um, uh, anyway, what I'm saying, consultation is fine, then we can make a final decision based on of that feedback. Um, uh, if, it, if it comes back and there is negative feedback, we can take that on board. And if a rescission motion is indeed needed, if the advice dictates as such, um, then that can be brought back into council at a future date alongside the final decision. That's all. Thank you. Lord. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Uh, Councillor Martin. Um, look, Lord Mayor, I, I maintain that this is ultra vires and there is nothing implied in the papers before us to suggest that this is an entirely different location. But look, notwithstanding that, I speak against this proposal. Um, can I say that there is one thing on which we all agree, um, and I, I, it is that we have uh, the right facilities. And uh, I might just pause there, if I may, Lord Mayor, because our, our speaker tonight, representing PAC, put forward the view that the facility that has been proposed by the administration and which was recommended to us as being 375 square metres and meeting all of the AFL standards was in fact adequate. Our speaker says it is not, it does not meet requirements. Can I ask the administration whether they are still of that view or whether they have made an error? CEO. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'll ask Ray to come forward and answer that. Thank you. Yeah, through the Chair, and they were still of the opinion that it's a fit for purpose facility, um, noting that the social space would be smaller than what is um, normally nominated by the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. So, look, uh, members, uh, what you heard tonight may not necessarily be correct. Uh, and this is the nub of this issue. Uh, we all agree about a fit for purpose AFL standard toilets, change rooms, showers for people playing sports. That, that is the issue. The facility at 375 square metres meets that. The thing that separates the residents, me and Prince Alfred College, is that they want a facility located away from where council decided in December 2017, viewable from Hackney Road, but also with a view of the Oval, um, incorporating club rooms with a viewing deck where alcohol can be consumed while watching sport. That is the nub of the issue. On all else, we agree. So um, if this building does not have this viewing space with a club room and a drinking area, um, pub in the park or whatever you want to call it, if it does not have that, then what's the difference? Well, the difference is that residents are satisfied, I'm satisfied, the AFL is satisfied, the administration is satisfied, but Prince Alfred College is not. It says if we can't have this where we have a viewing space with club rooms, in order to be able to serve alcohol, um, then we are not prepared to build this facility. That is to say, we will not give our, um, our members, people playing sport, the facilities that are fit for purpose and to AFL standard. They've made that clear at Adler, they've made that clear at Council. And that is disappointing because that's what this all turns on. The school wants that facility liquor licensed in that park. And at the detriment, in my view, uh, to the detriment, in my view, of residents who live nearby, you've heard, this is the park that's smallest and closest, smallest and closest to residents. With liquor facilities operating all around there, businesses who will suffer 
if they no longer have that trade. Now, if you vote against this tonight, all that happens is we go back to 2017, and 2017, that motion will deliver precisely what the club wants if it's serious about delivering state-of-the-art facilities to players. If it's not serious about that, if it's not serious about that, uh, then so be it. But look, I urge you to reject this and allow the administration to go back and discuss that 2017 proposal, which, which pleases everybody. It pleases uh, council from 2017. It, it pleases uh, some of the members of council today. It pleases all of the residents. It pleases many of the businesses. Um, uh, around the area, but uh, sadly, and I do concede this, it doesn't please PAC looking for a license to sell alcohol from club rooms. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, members, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think uh, Councillor Hyde has highlighted that this is a consultation. We have been speaking about this, the council has been having discussions about this for a very long time. And we've ha have heard the viewpoint from Councillor Martin many times um, since I've been in council. And I really do want to hear from the public. And that's what this is about. This is about bringing the plans out for the public to make a decision, to have an informed decision. I've had three phone calls on this since leading up to this meeting. One was from someone that has been very vocal about this from the beginning. One was an elderly gentleman who thought that the liquor licensing was going to be permitted until midnight. And another one was someone that had three questions. They're not um, uh, they're not against this proposal, but they have some, want some further clarification in regarding the um, how the club will be conducting the rooms there when it's not match day. So um, I guess you know we have to really look at this for what it is, um, and um, we need to take it out for consultation um, and uh, give it to back to the community for them to um, view and be able to have an open discussion with the council in regard to how they'll be affected and what more is required for them for this proposal to be to satisfy them. Thank you. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, look, we've heard this all before. It's just consultation. This is the death of a thousand cuts. We have consulted three times here. The resident body is much the same as was during all three. I don't know the people that uh, Mary's talking about, but as a resident of North Adelaide, as Phil is, uh, we are confronted with a daily consultation on these matters. The other consultations we did were thorough and the consultation limited the square metrage, which was agreed to, to 375. I'm not that fast about 410, but it is, it's a creeping change, isn't it? The actual difference uh, of the positioning of the uh, building is, the, is what concerns me as much, if not more. Um, this is PAC Old Scholars, uh, fine school, has not got any brownie points, I would suggest, over the years with the residents. Um, the drinking there, the disturbance are, uh, uh, are well known. So there isn't a, a great trust that the club can actually um, abide by these. I'm not saying they don't, but anecdotally, there's been a lot of problems with drinking. They've got to also remember that this is right next to a children's playground that we just spent thousands, you know, tens of thousands that Councillor Martin vigorously opposed, but then opened. Um, the co consultation is Team Adelaide's, Team Adelaide's way of saying, let's not make any decisions. Let's try to please both parties in the gallery. Let's try to please PAC and please the residents as well. We know what the residents want. They want it in the current position and they want it to keep be kept at the footprint of 375. So this waste of, uh, Team Adelaide always goes on about what, oh, you know, staff time, how many hours? This is this is big staff time you're talking about doing another consultation. Just stuff, stuff the old one, bring up people and see if they still feel the same. They will. You'll get a consultation back saying the Kinnipray does not want the change of position. It doesn't want it to enlarge. 
They're all, as, as Bill said, they were all happy last time. The AC said they were happy. Why now? So it, you see it over and over again in local government. People come back, come back, come back, come back. So you just nag to death or bored to death. Or they get into a new council where they're also new, they don't know the history of it, and they say, well, that sounds reasonable. It's only consultation. I mean, how many times have we heard that? Vote against it. Thank you, members. If not, I'll go back to the mover to sum up. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, um, I've, I too have had a number of uh, residents uh, contact me and it just um, seems like there are people out there spreading uh, uh, um, uh, false facts and, and conspiracies. So uh, let's, uh, let, let's try and put that to rest. It is not signed, sealed and delivered. We have not made a decision to go out and, and build what's being proposed. Um, it is not a drive-through liquor store. Um, what we want to do is we want to go out and consult on the proposal, on the design, the location, uh, the liquor licensing aspect. Uh, we want to consult on everything. And we do want to hear the feedback, all the feedback, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We want to hear it all. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Division has been called. Could all those members in favour please stand and remain standing until all names have been called? Councillor Abraham Zadeh, Councillor Canole, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde. Apologies, Councillor Mackey. Thank you, members. Uh, that takes us to uh, item 10.4, the East West Bikeways. We have Councillor Donovan and Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Donovan, are you moving? I'm moving, yeah. Moving as printed? As printed. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, are you seconding? No. So I need a second of first. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. So our role as a city council is strategic decision making to benefit all city users. And we receive expert advice as we have over the past four years in regard to this east-west deed. Uh, we receive that expert advice from our transport planners, from our urban designers and city planners, and we use that information to make the best possible decision that we can. Members of the public don't necessarily have all of that information and in many instances of council decision making, we have a much higher level of information to make the decisions that we do. So what's the information that we know and that we have been provided with over the period that we have been in council? We know that separated bikeways work and we have countless studies, many of which we have received through our experts on council that show that, count, that separated bikeways work for a multitude of reasons. They work to improve health, they work to improve safety of all users. But not only that, they work to bring more people into the city and those people who travel into the city spend more. They also work to increase the value of property along the route of the separated bikeways. They work to, by providing that safe route, we know that the small number of people who would choose to ride without that separated cycling infrastructure, which is estimated across countless studies at around about 3%, we know that the separated cycling infrastructure boosts that up to about 60% of the population who would choose to ride if they had safe, separated, connected network of bike routes. 3% up to 60%. So the current user's tiny reflection of those who we would be catering for were we to continue to build this separated bikeway. Interestingly, of course, the irony is so often when this conversation comes up, it becomes this cars versus bikes conversation, which is absolutely an irony because, of course, what happens is when you facilitate and enable more people to ride, you actually benefit all city users because you're taking cars off the road and you're allowing more people who would choose to ride to not need to use those car parks, to not require the road space. So you decrease uh, traffic congestion and you make available more of those car parks. 
Not that that is actually required in the City of Adelaide because we have more car parks than not only per capita than any other capital city, but just flat out more car parks. So even though we have half the number, in fact, less than half of the population of Melbourne, we have double, we have, I should say, 50% more car parks than Melbourne. So we are saturated in car parks and we now have all of the smart city data that shows us that we rarely even get to 80% usage of those car parks. Even during Mad March, we don't hit 80% usage. What we do know is that people who would choose to cycle have no safe route to do so in the east-west direction. And we're working on the north-south. It's not quite complete, but zero safe, uh, 30 seconds more, in fact, two minutes. Members, members, show of hands, thank, thank you. you. We also know that people who ride have fewer sick days, we increase their work productivity. We know that um, by reducing reliance on cars, we actually increase discretionary spend. So for all those people in the city who choose to reduce their household car by one or two, typically that represents an embedded cost of somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars that then becomes discretionary spend with which of course if you're living in the city is going to flow onto city businesses. We know that at present around 64% of people walk, cycle or catch public transport. So by always catering to the car parking, we're actually only catering to 34% of the existing users. And, and we know that that's only, a, that in fact, that number would grow of people who would walk and cycle with that increase in separated cycling infrastructure. I wanted to point out that the, the comments that were made before um, from Nick, for example, we really need to listen to those comments. And that's an important part of this conversation that as we go through, as has been identified and articulated in this motion, when we deliver this and we decide tonight that this is the route, then very importantly, we will go to consultation through an iterative process. We, our staff will go and talk to Nick and will ensure that those parking controls will meet his needs. We will go and talk to everyone along that pathway and ensure that we can come up with the best solution possible for all users with the infrastructure that we require. Lastly, I want to point out that recently there has been some misdirection and some comments that have come out that have been uh, intended, it looks as though, to misdirect the conversation and to confuse the conversation. Because back in 2019, February 2019, there was a motion that was put forward to consult on the east-west bikeways. That was not passed by this council. So any suggestion that there has been no intent to consult is an absolute furphy. There was also a consultation motion back in 2017, which was also not progressed by the previous council. So the only reason for a lack of consultation at this point in time is because the previous council and this council did not progress on the motions that were put forward. So I would really um, uh, exhort my fellow councillors to support the proposal and the motion that has been put forward as it is, not to get distracted by talk of any other consultations, because at this point it's an iterative consultation that will go forward. Thanks. I've got two lots of extra time there. Um, members, if I do give you extra time, please finish when the bell goes, or I will ask the chamber to allow more time. Um, thank you, Councillor Donovan. Um, I have Councillor Sims as the seconder. Okay, members to the floor. Any other speakers? So, I'm not sure if your hand is up or not, Deputy Lord Mayor. Just sorry, do I put in my turn at motion at this point or? Uh, if it's an amendment. Amendment, if you want to sorry. put forward your amendment. Yes, I would you like to do that. An amendment in yep. Yes. I've given may I ask a procedural You may. How many times may a motion be amended? It's twice, isn't it? Twice. Twice. Okay. Councillor, can I just confirm that this is your amendment? Yes, this is. We won't put it in 
read because that's I think there's too many changes. Um, members, I'll just give you a moment to uh, read that, and then I'll look for a seconder. No, Councillor Martin. I don't mind. <laughs> Councillor Abrams. <laughs> Um, so it's noting instead of no, the, So the whole the whole um, am amendment is in red. Oh, totally. Okay. So I think you have to read it. There's slightly different wording on each of those. So I have a seconder for you, Deputy Lord Mayor, if you'd like to speak to it. Can I ask a question first? You may ask um, a question first. Can I ask uh, administration um, to clarify something? Back in the 10th of March 2020, um, I've got here a um, motion that went through um, as a receipt in point two to approve administration to undertake research of business and customer activity on the East West Bikeway route to include current perceptions of the streets and feedback focused around the specific needs. Would that get passed? That was that uh, passed through the council? CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, Clinton, please. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Yes, I believe it was passed through Council and the details of that um, were Sorry. given to Council in a recent report. Yeah. Two, three, so, we, so we did have back in a March, uh, just to clarify, uh, on the 10th of March 2020, in point two, we, we asked for administration to speak uh, to and research to, to speak to businesses and customer activity on the East West Bikeway route to include current perceptions of the streets and feedback focus around the specific needs. So, um, do, we, do we receive information? Through the chair, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Did we receive information on that, Lord Mayor? See you. Clinton. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, it was received as link to through the report that went to Council. So yes, it was received by Council. Thank you. Um, the reason, uh, thank you Lord Mayor, um, I believe that um, we've come to a point where we have um, worked towards what route we're going to undertake with the East West, West Bikeway. Um, we have We've, uh, it's been discussed in council at length, and I'm not saying that uh, 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 Councillor Donald is correct. It, the city, we, we need to plan our city for these bikeways. That is true. This is the future. We, we need to um, uh, expand on that. We need to ex expand, expand on the, the bike network, and 100% uh, and agree with everything that she had said. But the missing element of that is now that we have decided that this is the way it's going to go um, and this is how we're going to do the East West, before we do that, let's have a consultation. Let's speak to the community, let's speak to the residents, let's speak to the, um, uh, the, the businesses on that street. Let's talk them through it, let's bring them on this journey. Um, and so instead of just saying that this is what we're going to do and you have no say and we are only going to talk about where the trees are going to be placed, um, I don't think that that's an, an appropriate way in us that we should be acting um, in council. It is part of our strategic plan to ensure that we consult on everything that we do. That, that's what we plan to do as a council. I, I disagree with just saying that this is what we're going to do without actually working with the businesses, working with what the future is going to be happening in that street, planning forward, planning for what might happen, planning for what infrastructure might happen, speak to what will be built, work towards what will be built in that street, what is planned for the street, and then come back um, to council. And I've got a um, timeline on this. I understand that we are looking at, uh, we have a deed in place, 
uh, Lord Mayor, and I understand that uh, we are subject to this um, taking place. That's why I'm seeking that we can have an extension and we can have a consultation to take place and we can come back in March and, um, and work through what was consulted and uh, be able to implement that further. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Today, did you wish to speak? Uh, members of Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'm, I'm very concerned um, about this. I see this as being once again another attempt to uh, delay um, this uh, process. We've had years and years of the wheels spinning with very little action here in uh, this place. And uh, I make no criticism of Councillor Kouros because she's uh, new to the council, so I'm, I'm certainly not um, holding her to account for the um, series of delays and missteps that have dogged this project. But I do think um, pushing for more um, delays um, is, uh, is going to potentially result in us losing funding for the project. Um, and also compound the um, community anguish and frustration with this council and its inability to uh, deliver this project. Um, I remember uh, Lord Mayor back when the East West Bikeway was first talked about five or six years ago. We agreed on a plan around making that happen. Um, we then, uh, the previous council agreed on Flinders Franklin. Um, then that was pushed off into the never never earlier in this council term um, and under the um, leadership of Hassan Abiyad who argued for a different route to be um, considered when information came back suggesting that that was possible these are the implications he was then against that and we've found ourselves you know backpedaling and spinning ever since um, I know that the original motion does include some um, consultation but I am very concerned about this reference to a prudential um, report um, and what that's going to mean um, with respect to this project. I don't think we need more analysis paralysis for there. I think the community is looking for this council to get this done. I should also point out that I consider the proposal that's come from the administration to be less than optimum. I'm not a fan of just um, just a 30 seconds or there. Um, I'm not a fan of the dog leg that's been proposed. I don't think it makes sense. Um, but I'm willing to live with that because I recognise that it's potentially a compromise. And I'm urging councillors to come to this meeting recognising that um, we're on the cusp of a potential compromise here, not to vote for more delay, um, more delay and more pushing this off into the never never. So, you know, we need to show some leadership. And after years and years of waiting, the community are looking for us to deliver. Thank you. Two small points, Councillor Sims. Um, Councillor Kouros is now the Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, apologies. And How could I forget that? I know, we have to change that over. And the Prudential Report has to be done if uh, the valuation is over $4 million. So that would have to be done in anyway, just so that all members know that that would be something we would need to undertake. Uh, I have... Uh, Councillor Just a question, Lord Mayor. Do amendments need to be considered consecutively, or can you amend an amendment? What's the what's the process? So we do. We deal with this amendment first. There can be small variations to the amendment, with the acceptance of the mover yeah. of the amendment. But other than that, it has, this has to be dealt with first. And if I speak to this and then return to the substantive, uh, I'm still able to move an amendment in the substantive when we get back to it. That's correct. Yes. No, they take them separately. Uh, yep. Because yeah. you're not a mover. Because you're not a mover. Both, Correct. Both things. Well, I'll take that under advisement. Thank you. Members? Councillor Kira? Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'll just speak briefly uh, because I am compelled to address uh, this narrative uh, that's being set up. Uh, by some councillors that this is a foregone conclusion uh, and uh, that there must not be any more consultation. Um, I, I think it's incumbent on us to recognise that we are entirely, uh, it is entirely within our remit to reject uh, ca categorisation uh, of this uh, caution and prudence as somehow, uh, you know, uh, being glibly uh, uh, described as analysis paralysis, kicking the can down the road. 
uh, and any other similar catchphrases. I think they are empty and vacuous. I think at all times it is incumbent on councillors to be prudent and cautious, especially, uh, especially Lord Mayor, uh, when there is such a manifest and obvious effect on small business, which will be consequent on this decision. I think it is very important that we reject the narrative that this is a foregone conclusion, that we must agree to this, that any, uh, a, a, any consideration is a mere delay. Uh, 170 parking spaces makes a difference. The difference it makes is to employers uh, who have already, uh, already been smashed beyond belief this year. Uh, uh, setting aside the timing of this year, this would be an important and prudent thing for us to consider with proper consultation to begin with. But this year of all years, uh, it is even more profound. It is absolutely more profound because the effects of ill considering a motion, uh, a, a proposal like this, uh, uh, can will uh, will be uh, the loss of jobs, the loss of jobs of working class people who depend on small employers. And we've got Councillor Martin Councillor, shaking his head at that. And there you have the abject. And I, I, I will say, I will, I will say, Lord Mayor, that interjection illustrates my argument completely. You do not councillors, you do not want to fall in the category of being uh, someone who has a sinecure and doesn't care and doesn't give a stuff about jobs of the working class. Councillor you don't Kera. want to be those people who are privileged and insulated Kera. from Councillor Kerr, that's the this second warning, last warning, otherwise I'll ask you to speak. Uh, well, Lord Mayor, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, I, my, my ratepayers uh, will not be silenced on this consideration of not ignoring unemployment in this decision. It must be considered, it is important that we consider and reject that narrative. I'm very happy for anybody to actually enter the discussion and the debate, but we can do that without being offensive or disrespectful to other members in the chamber. And we will not be disrespectful to other members in the chamber this evening. Councillor Hyde. Um, I don't wish to speak as yet, Lord Mayor, but I just have a couple of questions. Um, uh, and I apologise in advance. They are somewhat detailed, and I just want to thank the administration for indulging me earlier today on some detailed questions. Um, but I just note at 28 in the report, there's a table there which details the pre-bikeway and post-bikeway um, changes. And I just draw attention to Wakefield Road, the section of East Terrace to the Parklands Trail. Currently, there's parallel parking full time um, and two lanes of traffic in each direction. Post-bikeway is proposed to be two lanes and no parking <laughs> at all. But if we refer members to the um, to link. Uh, one in, in item 10.4, talking about on-street parking um, in there. Uh, the total parking loss detailed there along one, two, three, four, five corridors um, adds up to 170. But the most easternmost section of Wakefield Street that's mentioned there is Pulteney Street to East Terrace. Um, uh, and we're missing the East Terrace to the Parklands Trail section. Um, it's not detailed in there. Could the administration please confirm whether the table at 28 in the report is in fact correct um, and we will have no parking in that spot? Thank you, CEO. We'll see if we're able to answer that. There may be some questions we have to do on notice. Thanks, Clinton. Uh, through the chair, the design through that section has not yet been undertaken, but we would need to look at options for how we could get through there with the bikeway to connect up to the Parklands Trail, and that may include removing that section of parking. Okay, but that but that section hasn't been contemplated as yet in the report or predicted. J judging by the five sections, we think. Thank you, Lord. CEO. Thanks, Ben. Uh, it, it's included in in the length, but it may not be included in the, in the total number because that section there's still options for taking the path up into the parkland. But we haven't got it. We haven't done enough work to, to work out if that's feasible or not. There's okay. obviously a lot of trees in that section and so the parkland impacts. Thank you, thank you, Lord Mayor. So it is possible to say that, but we may lose it. It depends. What, yeah. What as, the detail design. As you said, we're just trying to work out what the design yeah. is, so whether we can take it into um, the parklands. Okay, it's it's just concerning that wasn't in the report because there's 52 spaces there um, over and above what's been reported. Um, regarding, uh, and I'm uh, I'm looking at page, um, forgive me, it's not on here. I'm looking at on-street parking, possible by by post 
post bike way possible occupancy. Apologies. And I'm comparing um, the uh, uh, chart or the, the diagram that shows the, the loss and the uptick in occupancy. Um, and if, if you start on the westernmost portion of Franklin Street, there are currently 144 spaces there, uh, and that is going down to 65 spaces, um, uh, which would actually be a reduction of 79 parking spots. Am I, am I reading this correctly? Because if you extrapolate it out, um, you actually end up with a total parking loss on Franklin Street of 108, not 66. Um, uh, and uh, and a total parking loss on Wakefield Street um, of 168, not 84. So I'm just I'm trying to reconcile okay. these. I've heard the question, CEO. Are we able to clarify things, then? Uh, through the chair, I understand some of that discrepancy is a result of there being a lot of motorcycle parking in some of those sections. So, so we, we need to essentially through the design undertake further analysis and work out what that balance of retaining motorcycle parking as well as car parking. Okay, and, and through Lord Mayor, so, so in the report where, where it highlights um, the approximate reduction uh, of 170, if you actually compare the predictions of current and potentially post bikeway, um, am I correct in, in reading that we may actually lose 265 spaces based on the administration's figures and not actually 170? I think the answer was that they're just working through that. It depends how many motorbike parks we put in, put back in. CEO? Through Lord Mayor, I understand that's correct. Do you want to clarify? Um, through the chair, in the documentation provided late this afternoon, obviously the design hasn't been done, but it does provide ranges of parking loss in the various sections. So again, the, the upper end of that is over 200, the lower end is below 200. Okay, all right. Um, uh, probably more questions, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, Councillor Knoll. You know, I, mean, I speak to uh, support I mean, uh, about uh, the consultation, etc. I mean, uh, we haven't had, you know, we've had all these ideas and uh, all these different uh, uh, you know, ways to go through the city, yet we have yet to, to just really discuss it with the actual stakeholders. And, uh, you know, I, this, the safety of cyclists is certainly is, is a, a paramount, but also as, as, as a, a one that sits with that, we also have to consider the people that we're affecting and uh, potentially, in some instances, potentially bankrupting businesses, et cetera, also needs to be taken into account how we're going to do that. And if we look at, you know, we are, this is now a, going to consultation, consultation and design together. And that'll at least give us an opportunity for that uh, consultation to help inform how we're going to do uh, the, the bikeway and enable to see are we able to get something that will work as, as good as possible that will satisfy uh, both concerns. And it is really difficult because the east-west component uh, is a lot harder to, to uh, uh, plan simply because the north-south uh, is uh, has because of Adelaide is designed east-west as were the main streets rather than a north-south component. So the north-south is a lot easier to work with simply because it doesn't have the same street frontages and things like that because it's uh, the uh, crossroads rather than the main uh, streets. And so that, that, that makes it more complicated. And uh, I think it's, it is very important that we go through that process. One, at least we'll be informed on how we can uh, put something together. Two, we'll enable the people who are most affected by it, I mean, obviously cyclists are, but for, uh, with the, the ones that are going to the businesses, etc., cetera, uh, still need to survive because they made decisions based on what they knew. And obviously as we change things, we actually need to see how that works. And I think it is, it, you know, is incumbent on us to consider how uh, well, all those things work together. So that's why I, I support um, you know, the consultation process anyway for it to come back to us so that we're able to make a, a much better and recent judgment. Members, Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, uh, we're a city designed for life. That's, that's our brand, right? But uh, the truth is that we're not a city that was designed for, for bikes. And, and, and that's the truth. I'm not um, uh, putting down bikes. I'm not saying that uh, they don't deserve to be in our city or that they don't deserve a dedicated bike lane. No, that's not, uh, that's not my argument. If anything, I would encourage all modes of transport be it bikes, bicycles, cars, trucks, um, 
um, e-scooters, Vespas, whatever it might be. This here is about engaging and consulting our traders and our rate payers. It's not um, analysis paralysis. Uh, when you have traders that come to you, when you have rate payers that come to you and they, uh, they are surprised that you've confirmed this bike lane and we're going to, to go ahead and build it, it's kind of like building the rail track as the train is coming. We're putting it down as the train's coming quickly. We need to get there because the train's gonna get here before we know it. It's about stopping the train saying, hey, let's see what path we wanna take. Let's see how we wanna go about this thing. And then let's roll down the train. That's, that's what it is. It's about engaging with our ratepayers, engaging with our traders to make better decisions for our city. That's what it's all about. Members, Councillor Moran. This is once again delaying tactics to say that our streets weren't designed for bikes. They weren't designed for cars either. The reason the north-south ones are narrow and the east-west ones are wide because the bullet trays had to do U-turns on the east-west. Anybody with any idea of stroke history would say that bikes probably came before cars. The, uh, so yes, they were designed for horses, bullocks and bikes. They weren't designed for cars. So, you know, let's put that bullshit aside. Um, this sounds like Moran. Could we, I, I heard what she said. Um, can we please keep our comments respectful? Well, Thank you. I wasn't calling anybody a bullock. But um, moving on. This is a straight, this motion unchanged. This is a straight thing. Do you want the bike path? You don't want the bike path. Um, I like consultation too, but in, and we've done some already. Don't, everybody seems to just completely ignore what Clinton said. Um, they've spoken to the businesses. Uh, businesses are never going to like the removal of parking. Uh, that's why, and when they're powerful enough, they can make a dog leg in your um, bike route. This is a simple thing. Do you want the bike path or don't you? Because these people will never, ever vote for a dedicated bike path. They're just kicking the can, as somebody said, down the street. Councillor Moran. Well, they won't. Can and we, so can we please speak, to, to be, speak to the amendment okay. or stop speaking? It has to be speaking. looked at with great ho-hum when uh, passionately, uh, councillors passionately ask for more consultation. Um, your consultation will come back fairly negative. It does on separated bike paths. Um, so then you've got a really good excuse to can the whole thing. If you want a north-south one, and I've been in two minds about it myself, uh, if you want one, you've got to be brave, and as Stephen Yarwood uh, said, you've got to lead um, and take take the, the hit. The Greek church um, can find other parks elsewhere. Um, they don't pay rates, so perhaps they can buy some, but um, that's, that's not really a great concern, and the iterative consultation can speak to them, as it did with John Colshaw, who was very against the North-South, and now is one of the biggest proponents of uh, dedicated bikeways. So don't be fooled by this. This is a no vote. Councillor Martin. Uh, look, uh, Lord Mayor, I endorse much of what uh, uh, Councillor Moran said. In fact, I endorse all of it. Uh, this is actually a motion that will put to bed the east-west bikeway. The effect, as we know, of a consultation will delay the process of spending the money of implementing the uh, the bikeway path. And we know from government, we know from government that we have until June thirtieth to have it substantially completed. Therefore, if we are consulting for much of the remainder of the financial year, then it's guaranteed that it won't happen. Um, I am a supporter of uh, separated bikeways. I am in, I suspect, a minority here at Council. I certainly know that uh, uh, from the people mentioned in the correspondence that went out to voters, the, uh, the majority of other councillors are supportive of delaying this further. Uh, it is a great shame because it would have brought uh, a, a great deal of equality to modes of transport in the city. Um, it is not safe to traverse the city on a bicycle, a bike lane, a separated bike lane would have done that. It certainly would not have uh, led to more unemployment, uh, business bankruptcy, as we've heard tonight. Um, in, in fact, Lord Mayor, I'm really surprised nobody mentioned granny bashing because I thought, I thought that's coming next. Someone's going to say it's going to lead to granny bashing or something other silly. Uh, but look, Lord Mayor, if people choose to vote for this uh, consultation process that is noting 
uh, that this route has been proposed, that you're going to write to the minister and say, hey, how about extending this for yet another period of time? Um, they will say, well, uh, no, sorry about that. Moreover, they will say, I am sure the city of Adelaide is not trustworthy. You can't enter into an arrangement with them because they well, I don't think you can it. speak on behalf of the state government, Councillor Martin. So are uh, you going to continue to speak to the amendment? Well, Lord Mayor, I was speaking to the amendment and can I suggest to you that standing orders don't allow the presiding member or any other council member to interrupt speakers when they are not breaching standing orders. I'm not breaching standing orders. I was making a point. And the point is that I think the government will regard us less highly by not agreeing to this in the terms that they expected. Um, please do as you will, um, but remember bike riders vote. Um, members, I am going to ask a question uh, of the CEO uh, because we have both been in discussions with our counterparts in the state government. CEO, do you have any update for us in terms of the, um, the bike, the deed and the funding. Through you, Lord Mayor. Look, I can confirm that I have spoken to Tony Braxton Smith, who's the CE of the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. And um, yes, he is receptive to providing a further and final extension. Now, that would be on the basis of council undertaking the consultation, um, which would then enable us to confirm the route alignment by the 31st of March next year and also on the basis of council constructing and completing by the 30th of December next year. So in effect, a six month extension, but that is only um, um, operational advice at this time and it would still be subject to ministerial approval, which is not yet provided. Correct. And so, but we would need an absolute decision on that by March. That's okay. We need an absolute decision on the route alignment by the 31st of March. Why, why is a CEO choosing to do, we're nearly through the debate, nearly come to the summing up, why are we only hearing that now? This is entering the debate and it is introducing information that's pertinent to the debate. I am absolutely gobsmacked the way this council administration operates in Thank the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Well, can I have an answer? Why was not this in the report and given to us before the meeting? See Have you just heard it, CEO? Have you? Through you, Lord Mayor, I spoke to Tony Braxton Smith today. Well, um, why were your councillors informed? Because we have not actually had confirmation by the minister. So I'm, we okay. are updating well, that. That should not be included in the information given on the floor in the dust of battle. Oh, Councillor, that is Moran. absolutely unconscionable. This so the, the CEO is able to uh, give council um, any information that can clarify or rectify information. So this is in response to, I know that the discussions are taking place. We have not received written confirmation or formal confirmation, but there is a discussion taking place. Now, Councillor Martin, you have spoken. There are other people that are waiting. Uh, that's fine, but you, I will come back to you once I go to the others. Thank you. Councillor Mackey. Uh, um, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, a, a question first, if I might, in relation to the report, and, and then I would I'd just like to speak to the Deputy Lord Mayor's amendment. The question relates to, for the benefit of the many people who are here, not only in the public gallery, but which, as we know, is COVID constrained, uh, but in the um, uh, Queen Adelaide room, uh, watching uh, on a screen. Um, uh, uh, through you, Lord Mayor, I'm, I'm wondering if the CEO or, or one of um, our um, colleagues from the administration can just clarify the the pros, the, the an iterative consultation process. If I'm understanding it correctly, and but I may be wrong, does that imply that there is section by section engagement as the design work is um, is advanced? Uh, CEO. Three, Lord Mayor, I believe that's correct. But Clinton, thanks. Or Dan. Uh, through the chair, that would be correct. The design would be undertaken in parallel with the consultation, so the consultation would feed straight into the design. Um, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, 
with with absolutely the greatest of respect, and, and I do believe uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor's motives in the variation are, are well placed, absolutely well placed. Um, but I, I will just foreshadow that I, I won't be voting for the variation uh, because I do intend to vote for the substantive <coughs> motion should uh, the variation uh, uh, fail. So should the amendment fail? Thank should you, amend. Councillor Matney. Now. I have got, um, I had a question from Councillor Martin. And Councillor Hyde, did you have your hand up? My apologies. I will actually go to Councillor Hyde first and then back to Councillor Martin. That's right. Just to confirm, I can do this and the substantive when we come back. Yep. I can speak on the substantive when we return to it. Yes. Yeah, because I didn't speak yes. on it first. Um, I just want to address this, this employment point um, because I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it's going to have a substantial unemployment um, uh, issue if we proceed just with it as it is now. Um, but I would like to highlight, because I think it speaks to the need for consultation, and I'll, I received an email today from a managing director um, of uh, what would be a medium to large size business on Franklin Street. And I won't refer to them directly um, so as to protect their identity, but I will say, uh, this is, this is uh, verbatim, my company has been based in Franklin Street since 2001. Uh, we run a company with in excess of 200 vehicles and 22 staff. The car parks uh, in front of our business are used every day as drivers need to come and go picking up parcels and paperwork. We would not be able to run our business and would need to look at moving out of the city due to the inconvenience and frustration that would be caused. We are a South Australian business and have over 2,000 clients, including the Adelaide City Council, uh, yet we did not hear about this proposal. Um, and it goes on, Lord Mayor, to talk about how they already struggle with parking limitations. Now, I'm not in principle. I'm not principally opposed to this bikeway, but I am principally opposed to approving it and then asking them what they think afterwards. And so, I just wanted to read that out. I've received many emails like that. Um, uh, this is the sort uh, of action you are undertaking if you don't approve this motion and approve the original recommendation. Uh, you, are, you are effectively alienating and removing a substantial portion of your community from the decision-making process. Bear in mind as well that this dogleg iteration, um, the last time this council considered uh, the East-West Bikeway was in March. And I actually recall, we met in this room. We met in this room in March before Zoom meetings. And of course, before the pandemic ramped up at the end of this month, at the end of that month rather. And so it's completely understandable as to why, if I can just have 20 seconds more. It's Thanks. completely understandable, Lord Mayor, uh, as to why this wasn't happening. It's very frustrating. But we've only seen this uh, three, three or so weeks ago. That was when it came to a workshop, and now it's come to the very next committee and then to council. This has not had time to filter through the community and for them to then offer their feedback to us in the organic and natural way in which most of our decision making is undertaken. Uh, we need to consult on this, uh, not just for this uh, business, which has, uh, which has over 20 staff, but for many other businesses along there as well. We need to hear their views before we press the button and say that we're doing it. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Martin, you had a question? Uh, yes, it's related uh, also to the uh, CEO withholding that information in relation to uh, the state government issuing an extension. Uh, and Lord Mayor, I ask, uh, having now read that proposal <coughs> from the Deputy Lord Mayor, it is absolutely consistent with what the CEO told us. Was the Deputy Lord Mayor also made aware of the likelihood that the state government would extend the agreement? No, she was not. I did not share that with any other of the members. And did you assist her with that motion? No, I did not. Thank you. On the Bible, if you would like me to. Um, members, are there any other speakers? If not, I'll go back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as it's been um, highlighted by our, uh, Nick from the Green Orthodox Church uh, today, they did not know um, about this at all. Um, even though we have said that we want to consult with businesses and the community and residents and whatever, but that, that doesn't appear to be the case. There have been numerous emails that I have been receiving from businesses, even residents, 
um, and communi the community on Franklin Street, which are really concerned that they have not been consulted about this pathway. I don't want to be a bully. Councillor Moran, please. I don't want to bully people into a decision into accepting something. They are our ratepayers. They are our ratepayers to this city. They are the ones that are paying for this, but half of this pipeway, the other half is coming from the state government. So therefore, we need to take into consideration what it is that that will affect them with this pipeway. What design do we need to do for them? What what do we need to take into account? What do we need to, um, you know, understand about their business, their home, their community? And as highlighted by the Greek Orthodox Church today, it, it is a very big community. Um, we have a big weddings, they have large gathering at funerals, um, they have a big gathering at Easter, they have a big gathering at Christmas, and it does affect them a lot. They have been there for almost 100 years. So to say that we're going to be leaders to go in and bully them and tell them what we're going to change in their street, no, that's not the council that I want to be. I want to be a council that's inclusive, understanding, speak to them and reach to a, a decision that we can all agree on in order to enjoy the city. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Division. 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 That is carried. Council members, the division has been called. All those in favour of the amendment, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Abrahams, Abrahams at eight, Councillor Canal, Councillor Carer, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Hyde. That now becomes a substantive. Members, uh, Councillor Hyde. Uh, I wish to move an amendment, Lord Mayor. It's been circulated and there are paper copies on members' desks. So, Councillor Moran, I'm being told that there can be two amendments. Councillor Moran, I will ask Governor's advice. I want, I want you to read that out. Councillor Moran, Regulation 13.4 of the meeting regs. If, if an amendment is lost, only one further amendment may be moved. The amendment wasn't lost. It was oh, sorry, done. my apologies. If, sorry, if the amendment is carried, so my apologies. Only one further amendment may be moved. So you first read it saying it was lost. It's sorry, part five. I read it's part five. So. Councillor Hyde. I'm, I'm happy to read it out if members. Yes, please. I yes. think you actually have distributed that to uh, members. Right. I asked for it, but I am happy to. Thank you. There are copies on all members' desks. Um, so, so I'll be guided by yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. So, so uh, before you go ahead, uh, just um, had uh, I saw this very late in the piece. Um, parts two and five we can accept as further amendment. The other parts that are within four, which is part four A, B, and C, um, is introducing new information into the um, motion. In which case, I would need to have that on notice as opposed to uh, bringing it through at this point. In what, in what sense, Lord Mayor, how is it new information? This is information the council has been aware of since May. These are improvements. This is talking about the bicycles network. This is in the, um, this is in the smart move strategy. This is all, this is all actually, actually a lot of it's existing policy. So I fail to see how. No, it's not existing policy. Where, where is it though? Members. So, members, just some government's advice because it's a it's a an amendment. So, an amendment. This this isn't substantially changing the intent and nature of the motion. So, it, that's why it's not an acceptable amendment. An amendment is meant to be just a change, an addition of a few words, removal of a few words, and so on. But the rather original, than sorry sorry rather than actually introducing all these new concepts, 
on different consultation, which is taking it away from the original, which we've got in front of us. It may also impact also on the delivery time, which the decision has just made. Okay, look, I'm, I'm happy to accept that. I'm happy to accept that. Um, uh, that's fine. So, Councillor, we can bring that through on notice in January. Oh, I may well do it in the new year, or I may wait and see what, what happens with the consultation. Thank you. Um, but, so just clarify what you are keeping. Is the extension well two? Um, if yes. you are happy to keep that amendment, that would be the changes at two. Mm -hmm. Um, and also the and changes the change at five. five. Yep, that's fine. That's fine. It's really, it's really just about a discussion. Um, Lord Mayor, before I make. Sorry, my... I need a seconder, Councillor Hyde. Oh, I sorry. need a seconder. Yes, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Kerrin, thank you. Um, uh, and so, Lord Mayor, before I make my address, um, there's a few documents that I wish to take for inclusion in the minutes. Yep. Has everybody so I wish, got those? Uh, pardon? Yes, I wish to table a copy of the City of Adelaide's Community Consultation Policy. Do you have to seek leave or I just read them out? If, has everybody got a copy? Has it, sorry, has it been distributed or you want to distribute? No, th these, are all, these are all public documents, but we can table, per the meeting regulations, oh, okay. we can no table documents. Yep. And I understand they just get included in the minutes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I seek to table a copy of the City of Adelaide Bikeways Design Guide, September 2017. Yep. Uh, I seek to table a copy of the uh, freshly released from Confidence Today Bikeway Opportunities Possible Projects. Yes. Yep. I seek to table a copy of the City of Adelaide Smart Move Transport and Movement Strategy 2012 to 2022. Uh, These are all public documents. I wish to table a copy of... Can we tell me why you're tabling so many documents, uh, Councillor? Because it's my right under the meeting regulations and we're often accused in this chamber of not having done our reading and I wish to make it clear uh, the research that's factored into the decision making this amendment that I've got here. Okay, and there's, they are all public documents and they will be attached to the minutes. Fantastic. Uh, I wish to take a copy of the bike lane. can refer to them and we can put the links. The yeah. bike lane design guidelines for the City of Melbourne. I wish to table a copy of the City of Sydney Cycling Strategy and Action Plan. I wish to table a copy of the Infrastructure Australia Assessment Framework from March 2018. And lastly, I wish to table a copy of the 20-year State Infrastructure Strategy from the South Australian Government dated May 2020. Would you also accept the law? And with that, thank you for your indulgence, Lord Mayor. I'll just speak uh, to this far reduced amendment, um, uh, but I would just like to highlight in, in tabling the, uh, the bikeways network opportunities, um, I'm seeking to have a discussion around broader improvements and lower impact improvements to the network. There's no doubt, uh, there is no doubt, I've also got a copy of here, uh, here of the Port Adelaide Enfield local area bicycle plan and also um, some academic work done by the uh, University of Adelaide and their stuff. So I have no I have no objection to the idea that if we want to get more people coming into the city, uh, they need to we need to be making allowances for bicycles. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, uh, it's not the academic argument we're talking about here. It's not the why, it's very much the how. Um, and the how is that we need to we need to go to consultation. In fact I'll note the City of Adelaide strategic plan and our enabling priorities uh, we talk about reviewing and improving the way we collect and present data and share insights, yet we still have um, no cost-benefit analysis, despite the direct advice of our audit committee. Uh, the previous motions on the topic have not necessarily been fulfilled. There is no uh, reliable estimation of increased cycling patronage along the corridor once complete. There is no traffic impact study or modelling uh, to detail how other corridors are affected. Uh, and as we know, uh, there would have been no community consultation on the original motion. Uh, that's despite at 5.8 us saying that we will implement new approaches to engaging the community and council decision making. Well, suggesting not to ask them or engage them at all is certainly a new approach, um, Lord Mayor. Uh, but in, in, considering, in considering very much the how, and it is a question of the how, we have to take into account, if I can have uh, two members, more minutes, please. Members. We have to take into account the existing state of the transport network in South Australia, and I draw your attention to the 20-year state infrastructure strategy. Uh, it says that Adelaide is dependent on car travel with approximately 85% of daily trips using a motor vehicle. 
It then goes on to detail the changes in modes of transport between the last measurable census period, 2011 to 2016. And it highlights uh, that there was an increase in motor vehicle usage by citizens of 14,650. Whereas for bicycles, and that was up to 414,000, whereas bicycle usage grew from 6,500 to 6,700. This actually tells us that the growth in use of a motor vehicle has outstripped the growth in use of a bicycle 80 times, or by 8,000%. Um, uh, furthermore, it does not appear that separated bikeways appears in the infrastructure strategy um, at all. So I would just say we need to work with our levels of government and we can't do this alone. Um, I'd just further like to uh, draw members' attention to the City of Melbourne 2020 bike lane design guidelines, um, which actually highlight that the, the primary uh, separation method that this administration or the our administration is proposing that we use um, uh, is actually labelled as less desirable. Um, and it actually highlights that it is only desirable for use in locations where there is long-term parking or all-day parking occupancy. And I draw members to page 16 um, and 17, where they detail how they've trialled a version of what we're seeking to do. And they have found that this could lead to potential safety issues, particularly when used by delivery drivers, which uh, I've just detailed. Uh, delivery drivers, children, parents with brands, disabled passengers that say might be on the U in U City and Franklin Street. Um, uh, and uh, as they have narrow corridors. So we've got three schools, um, and I have information from those schools detailing the number of their students that ride and the number that are actually dropped off. Um, uh, and yet we've got the City of Melbourne who have actually tried this method, and they are saying that it is unsafe to use painted chevrons and flex boards. It is unsafe to use them adjacent areas that have a high turnover parking rate. Um, that's why, Lord Mayor, we need to consult the community on this. Uh, I think this proposal, uh, uh, while noble as it is to try and meet the existing deadline, is just not good enough. Thank you. Councillor Kerry, did you wish to speak? Uh, well, Lord Mayor, uh, just briefly to say that uh, putting aside your uh, uh, internal uh, views about whether we should have a bike lane or not have a bike lane, I think the case has been uh, very strongly made uh, by Councillor Hyde for this amendment. Councillor Hyde has clearly undertaken uh, um, some much needed diligence from reading provide information that I dare say was absent uh, from the report with which we were provided uh, by the administration, uh, some very crucial uh, uh, information. We cannot rush into this. Um, we have the information from the CEO about the deed. Um, you may dispute uh, how uh, you, know, you think that information should come up, but there you have it. The information is there. We have to act prudently. Um, and, and I think that, it, you know, I, I've outlined my reasons. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to brush aside my own reasons for proposing the bikeway as it is proposed with the dog leg. I think the pros, uh, sorry, the cons outweigh the pros. Uh, but I think for all of us, uh, there is now no reason not to undertake this, this consultation, given the information that Councillor Hyde has, to his great credit, uncovered in relation to what's been proposed. Yeah. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I commend Councillor Hyde on his reading list. Um, I'd encourage him to also pick up a few reports about climate change um, and to consider reading those as well, because if he actually bothered to read those reports, he would understand how vital it is that we get this infrastructure done, Lord Mayor. We can't keep pushing this off into the never-never. And uh, for those who are watching at home, and just to be clear on what Councillor Hyde is proposing here, he wants to ask the state government to broaden the deed so that it can be used for other cycling infrastructure improvements in the city of Adelaide, code for don't build the bikeway. And he also wants to prepare a cost benefit analysis consistent with the approach outlined in the Infrastructure Australia Assessment Framework, code for let's delay, let's push it off into the never never so that we we miss the deadline and do nothing. And I love, I see Councillor Kira nodding enthusiastically when uh, Councillor Hyde mentioned a um, cost benefit analysis. If only we had subjected uh, Drivers Month to a cost benefit analysis, Lord Mayor, and some of the other um, more Absolutely. absurd ideas that have been put forward okay. to this council um, by Councillors Kira and Hyde. The reality is, they don't want to do that, Lord Mayor, when it comes to their own uh, absurd proposals. But when it comes to something that is good for the environment, when it comes to something that is good for our city's people and our community and community health, they want the project to jump through every possible hoop. 
The reality is they just don't want to see this project succeed. I have seen this project subject to every delaying tactic imaginable. Don't build it here, build it over there. Okay, let's look at that option. Oh no, we can't do that. You know, we've got to do it there. This is a delaying tactic. It is so transparent, Lord Mayor. It is so transparent. It is clear to everybody watching today what this is about. And I'm urging councillors not to fall for this con again. Reject this amendment, vote this down, and send the community a message that you actually want to get this done sometime this millennium because they are really sick of waiting. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Moran. Yes, look, I voted against in the first um, amendment, but I wasn't that unhappy with it. This, it's not even very clever. It is clearly a no vote. It's swamping it. Look at the, um, the reports he's added to the uh, minutes. It's ridiculous. The only person being rather disingenuously honest is Councillor Garrett, who when, when it suggested that there'd be no bite, when Rob Sims was saying this is a, a no vote for any bite lands, he nods and giggles. I mean, he, at least he's being honest. He doesn't want any bite lands. Um, so I think if you want bite lands, vote for the substantive motion. If you don't want bike lanes, vote for this. Um, if you believe that there are any sort of decent, uh, honestly held views, I moved number two about six months ago that we, uh, thinking, knowing that Team Adelaide or the majority faction would actually just shilly shally around and muddy the waters and kick up a lot of dust. I moved a motion asking that we go to the state government and alter the deed so that the money could be spent on other infrastructure for bike paths, like the green overlay or rumble bars. The team voted viciously against it and called a division. So it is, it is naive to think that they really think that that's a good idea because they have voted against it and it was recorded. So if you want the dedicated bike lane and you want it to be done, vote against this and vote for this. Well, the substantive motion is now noting, which is a bit of a shame, but still, it's better than this one. Don't be fooled by this um, junior politicking. Councillor um, Moran. This, okay, this uh, Councillor uh, transparent Moran. politicking. Um, to stop it, nobody's fooled by it. Um, some of the media might be, who knows, but it is just a no vote. So seriously, if you want to build in your lifetime, you vote against this rubbish. Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I mean, this is just a classic one-two delay, delay process. We've had, first of all, the delay from um, the previous amendment, which is just kicking the can further along. We know what the outcome is going to be when it comes back in March. Somehow there'll be another, oh my goodness, look what's come back from the consultation, and now we have to choose another route, and now we have to go back, and now we have to consider it, and nothing moves forward. Now we get the second amendment, which talks to let's use the money for anything other than what it's intended for. Let's throw it at some lighting. Let's throw it at something else. So this amendment now, in, in Councillor Hyde's very own words, looks for lower impact. Lower impact means lower impact for those who want this bikeway to safely get to where they need to go. And um, I commend Councillor Hyde on perusing, skimming the documents that he mentioned. Alas, he did not um, get to the essence of most of the content that he threw out, including things like the statistics that he pulled out, which actually proves the very point that Jevons paradox goes through and is well known by anyone in transport planning that if you build a network of, uh, of um, safe passageways for cars, then that is what will use those roads. If you build a network of safe ways to travel for bikes, then you will enable people to travel on bikes. Same is true of footpaths, same is true of any mode of transport. So the stats pulled out represent the 3% of the cycling population, of the wider population, I should say, not just the cycling population, 3% of the population who are happy to ride on painted roads. We know, as has been cited, not only by the documents presented by our transport planners who are in, in mesh in these documents, we know that this represents a tiny proportion of those who would choose to ride. So pulling out and skimming these documents and cherry picking little bits and pieces to confuse and misdirect, good try, no joy. 
Um, and speaking to the consultation process, in the very documents that we received, 30 seconds please, Lord Mayor. And this, yep. Regardless of the approach taken, this is the words from the documents that we have received tonight, the engagement will follow these principles. The details of the engagement process will be developed in conjunction with external engagement specialists to ensure that it meets best practice. The engagement process will be inclusive, transparent and, account and accountable and undertaken in line with City of Adelaide's community consultation policy and community engagement strategy. The engagement will seek the views of all impacted community members and stakeholders, consistent with our responsibilities as a capital city council. Once the bikeway route has been approved by council, the alignment will continue through that engagement process. The negotiables will be considered through the community and onwards and onwards we go. Controls applied to on-street parking spaces i.e. where there is space will be short-term parking. All of these things will be considered and will be consulted on. So we have the details of the iterative consultation process that would have been used if we were to have to have moved the original motion. Now we've moved on to this ridiculous second amendment that moves it into the world of we could spend the money on anything at all to do with cycling. Uh, and, and in fact, no doubt would end up being spent on things that were already in our budget and strategic plan. So please members, at the very least, put this amendment down and at the very least, let's move forward with the unfortunate amendment that we now have as the substantive motion. Members, not oh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the, I, mean, I love the theatrics, but I just want to just break it down. It's only to inquire. So we're only inquiring uh, to, to the state government the desire. So we're still going ahead with speaking to the state government about the East West. But we just want to test their appetite just in case. They are thinking of other things in regards to the um, uh, infrastructure, cycling infrastructure. There is, has been a lot of discussion on this over the years, and we are still debating this. I think, what are we, 40, 50 minutes in? Um, and, and it will always, always, in this chamber, it will always be discussed at length. Taking it out there, taking it out for consultation, inquiring with the state government what the appetite is. We might even have further discussions about further bike networks in, in the city, and that might come you know, to fruition. <coughs> but at, the, at this point in time, we're only asking to inquire. We're still wanting to go with this east-west. It's still part of the, uh, the deed, um, and it will stay part of the deed unless it's meant to be. But you know, it's place. only an inquiry. So I just think that we are just giving our administration direction in regards to the state uh, government's appetite in regards to, to this. I think we're just taking everything out of context here. I don't think you understand. What are you afraid of? <laughs> <laughs> afraid of I have Councillor Martin and Councillor Mickey. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it is a misrepresentation to say that we're simply making an inquiry. What we're actually doing is delaying. We're saying to the state government, well, have you an appetite for other infrastructure, puncture repair stations, I imagine, or some other such uh, 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 proposal? I mean, look, uh, this is uh, and always has been a very clear intent. Um, we not doing it alone, as Councillor Kira suggested, in partnership with the state government, with the state government, have agreed to create cycling infrastructure in Adelaide, in the city of Adelaide, that is safe and separated. That's that's the number of it. We, yeah, very specifically, we entered into that. We entered into that agreement. She's right. Specifically, we entered into that agreement. And here now is a proposal that is simply designed to delay, to frustrate, and to ultimately lead the government to say, which is, I suspect, the intention. Sorry, guys, the money's gone. It's gone. Now, uh, I regret that very much because I do remember the excitement, uh, Lord Mayor, and I think you were in the room, or Councillor Sims was, one of you was, because you replaced Councillor Sims, but I, it was Councillor Sims, I think, it was in the room, as the former Lord Mayor uh, told us excitedly that he'd secured this massive infrastructure project that was to be delivered 
uh, we thought in the term of the previous council, and now it's clear, Lord Mayor, it's unlikely to be delivered even in your term of council. Um, this is Team Adelaide dragging us back to the 60s. Um, I, I am sorry about that, and I do apologise uh, to the many cyclists, some of whom I understand are here in the Queen Adelaide room watching this debate. I regret this bikeway does not appear likely to happen. Councillor Mackey. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, firstly, a question with regard to our relationship with the state government and our our forum, the Capital City Committee, which, which you um, um, sit in with uh, two fellow elected members. Um, would I be right to think there's nothing that precludes uh, uh, us, through you, Lord Mayor, uh, pursuing a dialogue with the state government regarding prospective future investments, co-investments in, in bicycle, um, bikeways, uh, etc., and that therefore I, I would think potentially actually renders um, uh, Councillor Hyde's amendment um, not not so relevant because we have a we have an amended substantive motion that's been very expansively uh, reflected upon by Councillor Donovan and very acerbically and sharply commented upon by Councillor Moran. Um, so sorry, I should ask the question first. Yeah, before I'll, 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 I'll wait. <laughs> so no, there is well there is a, an undertaking if there's a direction of the council for me to write. Uh, to the minister, uh, then I will. But yes, these discussions do happen at uh, that level all the time. Thank, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, this is uh, a specific request. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, look, I, I guess I, have in effect, foreshadowed my my, my comment um, uh, with my previous uh, commentary. Um, I, I would encourage uh, fellow elected members uh, to not vote for Councillor Hart's amendment uh, and to vote for the the uh, now amended motion, as councillors Donovan and Moran have said, uh, it is not uh, uh, as as um, uh, uh, cut and dry as the substantive motion was. But now that the amended motion is a substantive motion, I certainly will be voting for it. Members, if not, I'll go back to councillor Hyde to sum up. Sorry, councillor Knoll. <laughs> In, uh, I mean, this is a really, really difficult uh, uh, motion overall, and, and just, I mean, there are so many important uh, aspects to it, obviously, uh, you know, and, and, and the conflicting uh, needs between uh, the various businesses and, and those that are on those main streets, and also, uh, obviously, the this, this, this safe transition from for, for uh, cyclists into the city. And I suppose if we're looking at that in the bigger context, and it's part of what I suspect what this was also trying to uh, uh, allude to, is that there are so many uh, other issues in regard to access to our city. There is no network plan, uh, specifically, you know, the smart cities, uh, you know, has certainly given something towards that. And uh, there is, is a whole different range of, uh, we talk about safe in the city, we also need to talk about safe into the city. And those sort of issues haven't been addressed either. And we also need to talk about, okay, down the track, we have our consultation. We have all of our people that have their various uh, uh, interests and their obviously need between the different uh, uh, groups and, and businesses and, and uh, individuals. Um, in all of that conversation, we've got to come up at the end of this, uh, and obviously we have a time, to, uh, a time frame, but it's very tight. I mean, there's, there isn't too much room to move here, and sadly, we're just, we're just saddled with that. The point is, is that uh, um, if, if that consultation does work out really uh, badly, and uh, with all the information that we're given through all the consultation, what are we going to do? I mean, is it going to be an either or type situation? Here is, a, a, I suppose, um, a, Whereas I, I would have liked a, a network motion to say, okay, what's a network and let's have a look at this as a separate conversation. Um, but if, if things do go badly, do we have a plan B? And that's my concern. If we have a plan B that uh, can still access all those funds, deliver a, a substantial improvement to the cycling infrastructure, that infrastructure is not necessarily perhaps, I'm not, this is like, uh, within, directly within the city, but it brings people to the city. You know, that is a safety aspect too that we can look at, and that's crossing all the main roads. If I have thirty seconds, that's you know. So, so I see that. I mean, I've had a few representations, and you know, getting across 
Green Hill Road and all those sort of things are just as important and those issues are just as critical if they're, you know, all we're doing is that we're dealing with it here perhaps, but we're not actually addressing those. So bringing them one step closer, bringing them into the parklands, enabling them to do that. There, there are, uh, we can put in traffic lights around through the parklands and all those sorts of issues that we could think about and possibly deliver even greater value, greater safety coming into the city and accessing a smaller, uh, already shared uh, ways through the city. And I think we're just going to look at that as well. If in all of this there are certain uh, major impediments and it at least allows us with this funding uh, uh, to potentially uh, look at other aspects that may satisfy the cyclists and all of those uh, people that are certainly highly important uh, in, in this sort of conversation. And if we can do some of those things, perhaps uh, that is, is another way to think about this. Members, I'll go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Councillor Hyde. Um, very briefly, Lord Mayor, I think we have some crocodile tears uh, for the East West here in the, in the chamber today. And of course, we remember the history of the East West, and that was that in 2017, um, Councillor Moran was integral uh, to stopping the work that the administration was doing on the East West. Um, and notwithstanding that, the, the council then befell the same approach that it was proposed to take now, which is which is approved. What is which your is, point of order, Councillor Moran? That I was integral in. That, that's uh, what is your point of order? I was. That's that's not a point of order. So it's a point of if that's a point of clarification. Thank you. And of course, of course, of course, Lord Mayor, when it was stopped, it was stopped in an incredibly sloppy fashion. I think the words were that the council stopped all work on the east-west bikeway. And that actually meant that they stopped considering alternative routes. They stopped uh, considering going down Piri Waymouth, and we had to actually activate that and look at that again. They didn't consider uh, this dogleg uh, iteration. They couldn't consider it legally. Uh, they weren't allowed to. Um, uh, they couldn't actually go and engage people. They couldn't proactively go and speak to them. So because of the incredibly sloppy nature that this has been handled by previous councils, um, wherein, 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 not a point of clarification. Well, the facts are the facts, Councillor Moran. I'm, I, I have no fear or favour. I don't care who did it. Someone stuffed it up and you certainly voted for it. But, Councillor Moran, please stop but, interrupting. Uh, Lord Mayor, this council is clearly determined to help get uh, safer cycling infrastructure in place. It, it is, it is, it is. We might disagree on which parts of it we look at first. As I've said, I, I firmly believe that we should do all of the low impact things uh, first, uh, because if you actually look at the routes that are there, they actually benefit a total of around four to 5,000 cyclists per day to come to the city. Of course, I had a minute and a half where Councillor Brown was really interjected. Um, uh, if you look at, so if you look at all those things, none of them impact parking. Uh, uh, none of them impact uh, uh, businesses, property owners, or, or other stakeholders. Uh, but all of them assist, yes, not as much as a separated bikeway, of course, I understand that. Um, but they all add to the network, they all add uh, uh, to the benefits of cycling into the city. They connect with all the other networks. And uh, I've obviously nailed my car to the chair, to the, you know, to the desk, and, and, and I'm saying that this is what I want to look at. Um, at first, but ultimately, that's because that's because I worry. Um, uh, I, I worry about how the council is approaching this. I worry about how this original motion, uh, now amended, was drafted, and I worry about the approach that we're taking. Um, because, Lord Mayor, we are committed to doing something. But if we don't have an alternative, if we don't have an alternative, depending on what that consultation comes back with, well, councillors are correct. It may be too difficult and unworkable. Um, to do something, especially, especially, and I know the works. I know the works that are on Groat Street at the moment. Um, we didn't really consider that corridor. Uh, if I could just have thirty more seconds, Lord Mayor. And and by by failing to look, by failing to look at the network as a whole, uh, the the administration and, and actually cycling advocates and those people that push for it have actually done a huge disservice to the cause because we should always be looking to how we can help the highest number of cyclists. And that's something, that's something that we haven't really been considering. The entire debate has been incredibly politicised and hijacked, um, uh, hijacked by this one element, which is constantly peddled, constantly peddled. And Councillor Moran and Martin uh, and Sims, by large, uh, use it as a tool to stoke division. 
which is completely oh, bounce, bounce for hard. Can you someone please put the time's, time's up? Thank you. Um, members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Division. Council members, the division has been called on the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please stand or remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Canole, Councillor Kerra, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Hyde. So that now becomes a substantive members. Councillor Sims. Thanks Lord Mayor. I just want to express my uh, dissatisfaction at um, this. I will not be um, voting for um, this uh, appalling um, compromise motion. Um, Lord Mayor, just to recap on how we got to um, this point tonight, there was a compromise put forward by um, our administration, which I was not um, very happy with. It was a compromise, but I was willing to come into this chamber and meet council members halfway in terms of saying, okay, let's try and get something done. Then we get into this chamber and it's diluted further by uh, Deputy Lord Mayor Kouros. And now it has been amended beyond recognition and turned into a let's do nothing motion. Another effort from Councillor Hyde and the Conservatives on this council to stymie the progress of a bikeway in this city. Now, as a result of this motion, we're going to be going to the state government saying, what else can we do that's going to be low impact? I mean, could this council have any less impact on cycling law there? I mean, if what we've been doing isn't low impact already, I don't know what low impact is. But what Councillor Hyde now wants to do with the support of the Team Adelaide grouping is go to the government and say, let's do something other than um, the uh, East-West Bikeway, and then let's waste more time. Let's get the wheels spinning yet again on a cost-benefit analysis and reopen Pandora's box and start to reventilate this whole discussion once again. Sadly, the reality of this motion tonight is we will not be seeing the East-West Bikeway during this term of council. That's the result of Councillor Hyde, Councillor Kira, and others who have fallen in behind this. It's really disappointing because there was an opportunity to reach a compromise here tonight to actually get something done and to finally deliver an outcome for the community. And once again, the Conservatives on this council have kicked the can down the road and demonstrated that they do not care about cycling infrastructure and they do not want to show leadership on the climate crisis and they don't want to deal with active transport in our city. And I am bitterly disappointed. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, as I said before, um, the fact that Team Adelaide voted to a man against... Members, can we just stop doing the Team Adelaide stuff? Otherwise, I will ask you to Why? stop because I because it is actually derogatory and we're name-calling in the chamber and I'm, and I'm well, over it. Derogatory. So if we could please stop okay, that. OK, the dominant faction, ACCA, um, voted strongly and quite venomously against my motion earlier in the year to ask the deed to be broken. So it's, it's very disingenuous to think that they're, they're, they, they're passionate about doing that now. They know it's just a delaying tactic. Um, just to answer one of the accusations, I wasn't pivotal in stopping the, the East-West. Hassam Abiyad. Members. Hassam Abiyad and Members. David Slammer moved it. Mayor, what does that have to do with the um, motion? It has to do with answering. No, what does it have to do with our motion? Thank you. Debate. Are we going to, into history, then we can dig up everything Can't, Deputy Lord Mayor. Yes, so um, just uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, in case you didn't notice, uh, your previous Deputy Lord Mayor accused me of that, so I'm just correcting that. I watched uh, the dominant faction, led by Hassan last time, do exactly, exactly, I could almost um, repeat the debate. You, I'm very disappointed with because you're supposed to be for it. If you think these guys are telling you the truth, then no, I can't. Councillor Moran, you're talking, you are either men. talking to. I know that the some of the councillors are passionately supportive of dedicated bike lanes, and I wish to just point out that this is not a motion that will give you a dedicated bike lane in this council term. Hopefully we can sweep most of you away next term and get a dedicated bike lane, because God's sake, the city needs 
Not you guys. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Kerrin. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Please um, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't speak. You seconded the other so motion. Under, under Same. Thanks for the warning. Uh, thanks for the warning, Lord Mayor. No, uh, sorry, Councillor, you can't speak. Oh, is that what you said? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I wasn't. <laughs> 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 be careful. You can't speak. Wasn't that for the. I don't know. Councillor Ho. Oh, Councillor Moran. Well, I'm actually feeling quite frustrated that I, I mean, another member always tries to speak on my behalf. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in last in, in last this meeting, I have made my decision quite clear, and I like I do like to see the byway to be built, to be finished within our, within our turn. And however, like over the last couple last couple of days, we received heaps of emails. Half of them support it, half of them want to see the public consultation. They like to have their say. And that is something why I, that's why I actually support the First Amendment, all right? Because we need to give people the opportunity to share their views before we make the final decision. And, and, and then the Second Amendment is about a plan B. What if, what if the public consultation's feedback come back is something that is almost unacceptable? It's something that we could not vote for, and at least we have a plan B. And indeed, tonight, tonight, later on tonight, we have another motion moved by Councillor Moran to move the byway to somewhere else in Southwood. I mean, if I'm not wrong, it's on Gilbert Street or Stir Halifax. And that would would that be considered as another delay, another tactic? I don't know. All right, so. The reason why I support both amendments is, on one hand, I like to see the byway to go ahead. On the other hand, we have a plan B if somehow the public consultation comes back in a very negative way. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Uh, members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Donovan to sum up. Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I know you yourself would be very disappointed, I can only assume, because you've said on so many occasions, on the public record, in the public eye, how there will be an east-west route delivered in this term of council. That's been said over and over again. Deputy Lord Mayor has said the same thing, but we can clearly see from this series of amendments that that is close to zero chance of happening. This is another another example of just pushing it further and further, delaying further and further, and now we're broadening it out to the point that I can see the likely outcome of this amendment is that we're going to end up with some lighting on a path. Lighting on a path is a great thing. We should certainly be looking at that for um, cyclists and pedestrians. And there's a series of other very important um, changes that we should be looking at. But as Councillor Hyde said, it's low impact and it's low impact to the user just as much to the infrastructure outcome. So the impact of tweaking around the edges is that we will not get the outcome we are looking for because the thing that makes the difference is putting in the separated cycleways. If Councillor Hyde had actually read through his documentation rather than skimming through the edges, he would see it's pointless doing the tweaks without first of all delivering the primary endpoint. The same is true of roads. If you were to put in a footpath and no actual road, then the cars are not going to drive along them. It's pretty straightforward if you think about it. Same goes for putting in a network. If you put in half a road as opposed to a complete road, as opposed to two intersecting roads, as opposed to four or six or eight intersecting roads, again, you fail to achieve the outcome that you are looking to deliver. This is just another delay tactic, and it's right out of the playbook of the previous council, which is unsurprising in the end point. And I'm really disappointed that this is where we're getting to, and I'd love to hear anyone else on the council actually commit who has, who has moved forward with this amendment and the previous amendment to commit to the idea that there will be an east-west, because with this series, we're basically dooming the whole process to failure. We're tweaking around the edges, which means we will not get the ultimate outcome of safety for people who are choosing to ride. We are abrogating our responsibility entirely for a huge proportion of the population, and it's disgusting. It's beyond disappointing. It is disgusting. Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Division. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called.
Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Canole, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor, and Councillor Hyde. Uh, members, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, do maybe one more item and then we'll go to a dinner break at eight o'clock. Is everybody happy to keep going for a short while? Okay. Uh, so members, that takes us to uh, 10.5 and I'll look for a mover from the floor, which is the Adelaide Economic Development Agency transitional funding. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. I'm looking for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Councillor Abraham today, did you wish to speak to it? Uh, Councillor Mackey. Uh, members, Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, I should declare that I won't be uh, voting for this. It is uh, the most extraordinary proposal, and I'd not fully understood the implications until uh, researching and asking questions. But with this motion, the Council is agreeing to hand responsibility uh, for a range of matters to a new bureaucracy, which uh, at point five will cost approaching $3 million a year to operate, um, including exorbitant fees for board members, uh, the, the nature of which is secret, uh, and then take from the elected body decision-making for online advertising, public relations, web and digital development, the Adelaide Convention Bureau, City Corporation brand, City Growth, um, Renew Adelaide funding, events and sponsorship, festivals Adelaide. Essentially, uh, we are, as a council, outsourcing to a new body all of these responsibilities. And for those who haven't thought about it, um, it is a budget for half a year of $7.6 million, uh, which will be uh, determined by this new agency at least it will determine how it spends it. Uh, we're simply transferring the money and it represents these amounts. It, it is a separate board and it can determine, if you hadn't considered it, it can determine how it spends it. So if there's an allocation for study Adelaide and at this minute it's X dollars, it can be minus X dollars because they are the board to which we've outsourced all of this work. Um, but equally important at a time when this council is talking about um, uh, financial problems, uh, some would say financial incompetence, at a time when we're talking about this sort of stuff, we're handing a huge slab of our budget, uh, $7.6 million, maybe uh, twice that, won't be long before it is, uh, and it is untouchable. We cannot manage it. It's being outsourced. So this is a really dangerous precedent, Lord Mayor, uh, and it adds to the growing list of measures that will be unpicked by the next council. Uh, they will have a huge job ahead of them. Members, Councillor Mackey, you wish to speak? Uh, um, thanks, Lord Mayor. Can I just ask a question of uh, yourself or the administration? Um, given that council had resolved to establish the Adelaide Economic Development Agency uh, and that it had been made quite clear the areas of devolution of, of responsibility. My question um, uh, goes to the relationship back to the City Council because my understanding is there will be quarterly reporting uh, and that matters substantial such as, for example, the allocation of sponsorship um, uh, grant, um, funding We'll come back to council. There will be recommendations that come from AIDA to council. Is that correct? That is correct, Councillor Mackey. And in fact, we will always be the funding body. Um, CEO, did you wish to add anything to that? Three little minutes. No, just that it is very correct. Correct. Uh, members? Uh, so well, yes, I am confused. If we've established a board, as we've established other boards, including the Rundle Wall Management Authority, in whose affairs we do not intervene. If the Rundle Mall Management Authority decides it has an advertising budget and it will spend it on billboards, we do not intervene. Why do we have the capacity to intervene in the way in which the Adelaide Economic Development Agency, AIDA, why do we not 
uh, why are we not bound by the, the same The question rules? was uh, directly about sponsorship and strategic partnerships. Uh, there will be recommendations. The funding will always come from the council. The council will approve the funding. So why are we transferring the money to the agency? CEO, would you like to talk about operational matters? Not three, Lord Mayor. Look, just to be really clear, council will be signing off on the annual business plan and the annual report for this entity. So we'll be having the opportunity to resolve upon the activity of the agency. This is a transitional budget that's going to enable the agency to establish. Um, and there's plenty of work to be done by way of um, transitioning to the new organisation. Um, it you know, might be quite appropriate. Ian, you might want to just comment a little further. Thank you. Back through the Lord Mayor. Um, so just to be clear, aid has been established under a section 42 of the Local Government Act, so it's a fully owned subsidiary of council. It's not a statutory authority or a corporation. Um, it does need to provide an annual business plan for approval, for approval by the council and the elected body. Um, and the elements that would sit within that business plan um, would comprise these functions that are following the structure here. So the functional function and then the funding follows the functions. But the, to, to give the elected members some comfort, that approval comes back from the elected members around the funding profile. Thank you, uh, Director. Um... Hello, Mayor, that doesn't answer the question. I asked, can we intervene and direct AIDA in how it spends its dollars, allocating I, money to festivals. I think that was answered in that the business, no, the business plan and budget has to come back to us for approval. Yes, but the business plan and the budget are not the detail of funding allocations to sponsorships the, and events. The sponsorship other than and headings. events will come back with recommendations for us to fund. The funding for sponsorship and events will decisions on sponsorship funding and events will come to council for each event. As as it does now. For each event. As it does now. So why have we got an Adelaide Economic Development Agency? Why are we paying these people such enormous fees, sitting fees, for decisions that we will make? CEO. Thanks, Ian. Thank Can you respond? So through the Lord, through the Lord Mayor. The, sorry. Sorry, members. Can we have the question answered? So, CEO. Director. Sorry, through the Lord Mayor. So back in the 2016-2020 strategic plan, you asked administration to explore options around a city-wide business model. In your current strategic plan, you asked us to implement one. So we're taking direction from council around implementing a city-wide business model, which has been agreed by council to be the Adelaide Economic Development Agency with a skills-based board. And Nikki Governor recently appointed as the chair and that board will provide um, strategic advice back into a business plan for approval by the elected body, including funding matters. Specific funding items. I asked that question. Can I just add that answer? Yes or no. Will the council approve specific budgets for specific events sponsored by the city, including the Adelaide Festival and the Fringe? That's a simple question. Thanks, Ian. Uh, in, in my view, absolutely, it's through because that would be embedded in the business plan. So, what have you got to support? Thank you, uh, Councillor Canal, then uh, Councillor Hyde. I mean, I look forward to the agency getting its job done. I mean, what makes us the premier um, business advisory group in the city? I certainly don't think uh, that we are that. None of us are. We're certainly a component, maybe some certainly individual skills and all the rest, that's all good. But what we need for uh, the behalf of the city is not uh, a bunch of councillors who are politically elected and we are certainly overseeing what's going on, we certainly can influence what's going on, we can certainly say no to what's going on. But the thing is that we need a coordinated uh, effort in this city not just Rundle Mall, not just Central Market, not just Hunt Street, whatever, because the people aren't coming into town. So what do we do? So we give it to experts who uh, work together with stakeholders, and that is what I am most excited about, because I've seen it often enough, the disjoint between the administration, uh, and, you know, the, the board, and also the people, they're all trying to help. So now we're able to narrow that down. That's the objective of this uh, agency, is to bring 
uh, one, a professional group of people, and I have to say, like Ronald Wall Authority, I, I, I hold them, I think they've done a great job. The, the administration there has done a brilliant job because they're focused on delivering people to the city. There's two sides, the commercial aspect and the social aspect. I mean, the one is about making this place fabulous and livable. The other is attracting people to the city for the purposes of the businesses are and for what we have infrastructure for. So we need people who have got a clear view on that, who work together with every other element that creates that vibrancy in the city, whether it be from the study Adelaide to the convention centres and all these uh, that bring together and coordinating them together. That single conversation means that we're able to influence across all of those and bring them together. And not just that, it brings the businesses with their funds, the marketing funds, etc., that they have, where we can unlock some of those into what we're doing. Why? Because we are delivering them uh, opportunities, etc. We're working with them uh, for those, and we're uh, like it's, uh, the Rundle Mall right now, they're engaging with their, uh, their traders in a fabulous way. And we can just and so and that's what we need and i think if we're having those sorts of conversations if they're doing that and each element is uh, functioning at its best then we will be able to attract more people to our city in a way that we don't get in each other's way in regards to you know different events competing etc and if we're able to uh, run this as one uh, certainly good organization then we will have more people coming here they will want to live here and buy things here and it is all about first making us the centerpiece of which we have been losing that mantle now for uh, the last decade and we need to stop that and this is a way to do that Councillor Knoll, Councillor Hyde. Uh, yes, look, Mayor, I, I, I am operating on the understanding uh, that we are able to direct, um, through a motion of council or even the CEO operationally, we are able to direct a Section 42 subsidiary at any time and on any manner that's uh, more or less consistent with their charter. Is that correct? CEO. Three, Lord Mayor. It's a subsidiary of council, so therefore we have the ability to direct. So we have the yes, yeah, yeah. And are they able to know, take out loans without it seeing our approval or letting us know, or from sources up with us? CEO. Three, Lord Mayor. No, requires council approval. And so when we're talking about their budget, every cent that they spend comes through here. CEO. Yes. No, and so that's But the authority to, to, to raise the funds, I suppose. No, they're Be part of the annual business plan. Ian, do you want to clarify? That's part of the commission we have. Back to the Lord Mayor. The, the charters, it's, it's, it's referring back to the charter. So I, it's a fully owned subsidiary. I wouldn't sort Autonomous. It's a fully owned subsidiary of council, and council does have the ability to direct um, the subsidiary in line with the charter. Um, so, just in terms of, sorry, back to the Lord Mayor, back through in terms of um, the ability to raise revenue and apply for grants and leverage third party investments, but council can do that now too. So, um, that's exactly what this body will be closer, closer to the business community. This body is also being formed off the back of. Um, literally hundreds of consultations with the business community, with people like Study Adelaide, with people like the Adelaide Convention Bureau, with the producing groups, with the Adelaide Business Collective. Um, there's been a range of consultations and I, and I think it's been strongly agreed that a new citywide wealth business model is what they are seeking. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just speak very briefly. Um, uh, this is not this is not an extra bureaucracy. This is about removing <laughs> The decision making from the bureaucracy. This, and of course, we well, remember, I mean, we set up a section 42 for the central market. And gosh, you know, I walk the floor at least a few times a week and I still get complaints from councillors who may or may not still be in this chamber who are apparently responsible uh, for the good management and good operation of that place. I still get complaints uh, from people who have not forgotten. That's why we set up section 42s, because you can grab a skills based board and you can put them over the organisation or that part of our organisation and you can be confident in the decision making. This is about, the reason businesses are asking for this is because, is because they are not confident in the decision making of many councillors which are elected in this city over many years. They are not confident in the decision making. That's why this has been set up. Let's be honest here. That's why you need an independent skill-based board. 
Lord Mayor, that's a, that's a this is why. This is why, Lord Mayor. That's the reason for this funding. That's Councillor Hyde, I don't think that is too. the reason for this funding. So, well, it is for the businesses that I've talked to, and I think I talked to quite well, a few. So, I think that's um, quite disrespectful to the chamber Lord and the Mayor, previous, Mayor, and the previous terms of council. I didn't make any reflections. You certainly did make reflections. I didn't make any reflections. It's a bit of a guilty conscience that's talking. Um, but, Lord Mayor, <laughs> what, I would say, what I would say is that we have the ability to call this in at any time. We have the ability to direct our section 42. We have the ability to direct our section 42 uh, at any time. We have the ability uh, to comb through their budget. We can talk to our administration about elements of their budget. And in fact, uh, thanks to my uh, amendments in their charter, they're going to be reporting to us four times a year, which is uh, which is which is an extra three times on top of what our subsidiaries do at the moment. It's all about accountability uh, and it's all about ensuring that this body can make decisions for the business community that are in their best interests. Councillor Martin, you've already spoken, so I'm assuming this is a question. Yes, it is a question for the administration, Lord Mayor. But I do understand now why you think the term Team Adelaide is derogatory. Um, it's a question for the administration. Um, Given that we are transferring funds across to this body, for example, all of the funding for Study Adelaide, wouldn't it make sense instead of, as we are going to be asked tonight, to elect a councillor to be our representative on the body, to ask a, bo a board member from AEDA to be on well, the that's, board? That's study. actually not how that works. So we actually have council members as part of the board. But I understand that. I'm asking, though, if council has no direct funding, no councillor has any role in that process. Council will be directly funding. Council will be funding through the business plan and budget and the recommendations of AIDA. No, I understand that. I'm saying, given, though, that those decisions will be made by AIDA, even if ultimately we sign off on the, the business plan. The decisions won't be made by AIDA. The recommendation will come from AIDA. The decision will be made from council. The recommendation for what? The um, recommendations around funding for sponsorship and events will come from AIDA and it will be... <laughs> Bless you. Um, and the decisions will be made by council. Well, Lord Mayor, uh, wishful thinking, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Martin. Our members, if there's no more, I will go back to Councillor Abraham today to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you for clarifying, uh, Councillor Mackey, for, for, for asking those questions. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, can I suggest to, to members that uh, if they're worried about any implications, that they read that attachment that was sent through, I don't know, Friday or Monday, uh, pages two to four, uh, clarifies it all. And if you've got further questions, uh, do the normal thing, go to administration and ask the questions rather than waste everyone's time. Thank you, members. Oh, to the vote, those, those in favour, those against, division. that division. is carried. Oh, division has been called. Council members, division has been called. All those in favour of the motion, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Thanks. Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Canole, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Kara, Councillor Ho, Councillor Sims, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde and Councillor Donovan. Now, members, just before we go to the break, there is one more because I do realise that we have a member of the public, in fact, Mr Cardone, who spoke to us in the deputations. I would like to do 10.8 before we go to uh, the dinner break. Uh, so, members, if we can go to 10.8. Thank you, very much, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Abraham today, seconded by Councillor Hyde. Councillor Abraham today, did you want to speak? Right, Councillor Hyde. Um, uh, only to thank the proponent for their address um, and for the work they've done uh, to address what were clearly the deficiencies with the previous operators um, of the event. I'm very glad to see that it's in uh, uh, under new management, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I, I take on board uh, the comments around the viability of whether or not um, uh, it can work from, from 10 p.m. per the recommendation that is before us. Um, uh, what I would say is that I'm, I'm very, very nervous about deviating from that recommendation based on the uh, annus horribilis that it has been uh, for our hospitality sector, and, and particularly I would talk about our, our, our clubs and our pubs, and particularly clubs actually, because they've had, uh, they've had the, the unenvious task of having to choose between drinking or dancing. 
um, uh, and, uh, and that's obviously a, ruined their reason for opening. Um, uh, and, I, uh, and I note there are some excellent changes in this revised um, proposal, but uh, and I may be open to looking at 12 p.m. in subsequent years when when the industry and our business sector in, in the city of Adelaide is perhaps a bit stronger. Um, but I'm very reluctant to jump into that uh, at this point in time from now, which I think is why um, I'm happy to support the recommendation um, before us, and I would encourage other members to support it as well. Um, I, I wish to, to, to highlight that I hope uh, this can go ahead and still work, and I hope the administration will work with the proponent um, uh, to, to come up with a, with a way to make it work, um, because I think as it stands, if it is uh, if it is going to have such the artistic offering that it's talking about, it could present um, a substantial value. Um, and I note that bringing people to that part of the city while the East End, you know, because we often get complaints that the East End sucks up everything. Um, uh, and then for the previous RCC, we had complaints that RCC sucked up everything else. Um, uh, this, as it's presented, has an opportunity for people to go to RCC um, and then still go on thereafter, which is why I think it's appropriate for this, uh, for the coming pandemic, post-pandemic fringe season. Members, Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, just a, a quick question to the administration. Why was the uh, trading hours schedule amended to 10 p.m.? CEO. Thanks, Christy. Thank you, through the chair. After the feedback in consultation, we took into account some of the recommendations and feedback from members of the uh, business community, including one that specifically requested that noise uh, and the event be controlled to 10 p.m. Um, uh, may I ask the name of the business? Through the CEO. Through. Through. Sorry, the question Thanks, comes Christy. to me. Sorry. Thank you. CEO. Thanks, Christy. Through the chair, my apologies. It uh, was Kate Osp, Osp uh, from the Adena Apartments. Okay, uh, next door. Um, look, Lord Mayor, um, I'll be uh, guided on this by uh, the ward councillors, um, uh, Councillor Kira, Councillor Ho, and uh, Councillor Mackey, because it's clearly uh, their area, and if they believe that it is satisfactory for this enterprise to operate until 10 p.m. I, uh, I will vote accordingly. However, I would just like to note that in other areas of the city, there's no such consideration given. If the Adelaide Festival applies to operate a licensed facility until 2 a.m., regardless, regardless of any impact on neighbouring businesses, then that's accepted by this council. No matter how much I might say I'm worried about residents, about noise, um, we do. We agree to allow the festival to trade until 2 a.m. when other businesses are operating. Uh, we allow other events associated with the fringe to trade well after midnight. And we have no concern for the businesses around, for example, the East End. In fact, the businesses around the East End all say, um, you're doing us a great favour by allowing it to trade until midnight because we benefit from the rubber. Now, if it is the decision of the ward councillors to restrict this enterprise in a way that we don't do with others, as I said, I'll accept that. But I am seeing some inconsistency in the way in which we apply the rules to licensed activities in, the, in this city. Councillor Kerr. Uh, well, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I do support this, this motion. I say that uh, I say that on the basis that it is uh, it's a difficult one for me because uh, I still do believe uh, in the principle that our uh, that our squares, uh, that our public squares, uh, and most particularly our principal public squares, uh, should not uh, should not be commercialised and turned uh, into outdoor nightclubs. Um, I think that is an unfortunate uh, development, uh, and I think that we have accepted uh, this language, uh, these buzzwords of activating space, uh, this language has done the thinking for us and led us to the idea uh, that we must commercialise our public, our, our, our squares, our principal squares. I don't think that should be the case. Um, I'm supporting this because uh, the change to 10pm uh, at night 
uh, means that that uh, nightclub effect is ameliorated somewhat, but more particularly uh, given the uh, crushing year that we have had uh, for business in the city of Adelaide, I think the, the, the cons, sorry, the pros outweigh the cons. It's a gesture of goodwill uh, from us. And there is a significant element with the RCC of people uh, from outside the CBD, uh, people who are coming in who may not necessarily go to the CBD. I've seen that effect. Uh, with that. So it is, I think, on balance bringing people in. Uh, but I do urge caution and I, I do urge uh, councillors to challenge uh, this narrative uh, that our public squares should be uh, uh, commercialised at all costs. I think we're better than that. There are uh, event spaces already. Um, there is the uh, Torrens Military Parade Ground down the road, which is not turfed. Uh, there's, there's ample other space. I don't think our public squares should be. I don't see this. This should not be an imprimatur uh, for turning public squares into nightclubs, and I will give my support uh, on that basis. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sims. Oh, sorry, and Lord Mayor, I'm reserved my right. I'll take that. Thank you. Councillor Ho. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I actually speak against this proposal for the following three reasons. Firstly, like it's a bit different as a few years ago. Nowadays, on I mean, just surrounding Victoria Square, we already have two major residential apartment buildings. So there are actually people living next to the square. Not like a few years ago, you have all commercial buildings on the square. Second, because of COVID, a lot of our business in that area have been impacted. They are already suffering. Why would you like to offer another competitors to them? It's already struggling. All right. There's less people coming into the city. There's less customers in the evening. Why should we offer more competitors to, to our ratepayers? Last but not least, the pandemic is not over. Why would you, even though, yes, they have got the COVID management plan in place, but is that 100% guarantee? I doubt it. So for, the, for, for those above three reasons, I'd like to speak against this proposal and I'd like to urge members to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. Councillor Mackey. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Lord Mayor. And through you, I'd also like to extend thanks to Mr Cardoni for uh, making a presentation uh, earlier in the evening. Um, uh, I'd like to reassure Councillor Martin that I am supportive of this recommendation. Um, uh, like you, I, I might have been quite relaxed about midnight um, uh, as a time frame as a considerable investment, as Mr Cardoni um, referred to. However, I'm also uh, heartened that our public consultation uh, about this uh, has been um, taken into account. The results of that public consultation have been taken into account and our administration have been in dialogue with Mr Cardoni and his colleagues and they still believe that they have a, a, a business model for this activation uh, that, will, um, uh, that will, will make it viable. Um, I welcome, uh, for, for different reasons to Councillor Ho, um, I, I welcome any additional activation during the fringe period. Don't forget, um, uh, colleagues, that there will be no Adelaide 500 uh, piled on top of the, um, the, the fringe and the festival. Um, the fringe and uh, well, the, large, the fringe will largely be uh, uh, presenting South Australian product this year. Uh, and, and of course, now as the borders are relaxed, um, I'm sure we'll see some other interstate, but far, far less, if, if any, international uh, product. Um, the the act of temporary activation of our city squares is something that I, I welcome and the fact that we have infrastructure in place uh, in some of our squares to make, uh, to enable activation um, is, is in fact actually a, a very, very positive thing. Uh, city squares in, in Europe, city squares in the United States, in North America and indeed in South America and Asia are places where people gather and celebrate and uh, I welcome I welcome that and pleased to support it. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor and then Councillor Sims. Uh, I just want to point out that in the consultation there was a member of the public I uh, believe that um, said that I may have a conflict um, of interest in regards to this matter. I, I don't. 
have a conflict. I'm not associated with, I think that might have been confused, I'm not sure, but I'm not associated with RCC and nor do we have any food trucks um, scheduled. Thank you for that clarification, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm also uh, supportive of this. Um, I would have also been inclined to uh, consider um, a 12 a.m. finish as well. Um, my uh, view is that the arts sector has been really um, significantly impacted by uh, COVID-19, as have all sectors. Um, and you know, uh, councillors are right to point out the impact on the business community. Um, but there has been a significant impact on the arts community. And um, as Councillor Mackey has identified, festivals and events in our city have been adversely impacted. And so I think um, this would have been an opportunity for us to give the RCC a bit of a, a leg up, a bit of assistance, um, and it made things a little bit easier for them. So I would have been very open to that, but it doesn't appear that there is um, support for that approach um, on the council. I'm sympathetic to the argument that Councillor Kira puts around commercialisation of our public space. And that's why I've always opposed commercialisation of the parklands. But I think when we're talking about our squares, in particular premier spaces like Victoria Square, Light Square and others, they are designed to be community meeting places and gathering spaces. And in particular, Victoria Square, the council spent a significant amount of money to turn that into a premier events space. And it shouldn't be locked down like a museum piece, uh, Lord Mayor, it's got to be used by the community. And um, I saw the RCC activation several years ago as being a really exciting way to use Victoria Square. And um, so I'm excited to see that this is back on the agenda again. Um, and I hope the council can give it the green light and um, I hope that it is successful. Thank you, members. If not, I'll go to Councillor Abraham today to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. up. Members, to the vote, those in favour, those against. Division. That is carried. Ah. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Carer, Councillor Sims, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Martin. Members, thank you for that. Um, I think we might break for half an hour for dinner. Is everybody uh, happy with that? Members? Does everyone realise we cannot go ahead with the I'm sorry, Robert, no. I can't have no. interruptions from the gallery. Uh, members, half an hour break. We'll see you back in the chamber at uh, in, in 30 minutes, 8.45.
did not go through community consultation because it's actually about operation, operational matters, so things that we are doing within our own organisation. Um, one one um, item that will, for example, be something we'll be looking at for the community is how we use our sustainability incentive um, scheme to provide incentives for the community. But we actually have to, if you look at the time frame, we actually have to um, look very clearly at what we will offer um, in terms of the incentives. Um, Consultants say, for example, the Department of Health. That's hard thing. Okay. So, so just so I'm clear, there may well be consultation with respect to specific initiatives down the track. CEO? Uh, yes, uh, through the um, Lord Mayor, that's correct. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? No. Members? If not, back to the move to sum up. Sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Uh, members, that takes us to 10.11, which is the draft community land management plan, the general provisions. Councillor Martin, are you moving? Um, I'd like to move an alternative motion, Lord Mayor. Sorry. Do we have a copy of that? No, you don't need one. It's very simple. Um, it is that Council defers this matter to a workshop at which supporting information is provided. I'll look for a second. Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I, um, I commend the administration for proposing this. I think it's a great idea to have a, uh, a set of basic principles that we don't have to revisit every time there's a CLMP. Um, but uh, this document is a, a bit controversial for some ratepayers, and uh, I would, uh, on their behalf, suggest that it be deferred for more consideration. And there are, and I raised these briefly at committee, um, there are a couple of things that have uh, been raised with me. Um, let me say that, first of all, I'm not sure about the, uh, the general principle in there that we should uh, light parklands paths to encourage night use. I know there are long-standing arguments that lighting uh, paths in the parklands uh, that weave through uh, vegetation um, and on which people cannot always be seen is, uh, is a matter that's uh, been raised many times before. Uh, it's suggested sometimes that actually puts people in danger. And I note that there is no feedback from SAPOL, though the administration says if we adopt this, then they will talk to SAPOL. And I actually think it would be good to hear from SAPOL before we actually adopt it. Um, the City of Adelaide is also proposing essentially only three uh, approaches to dogs in parklands. On a leash, which is mandated at two metres, uh, when I know uh, my, my kids all have dogs and I swear those leashes are not two metres, uh, they are significantly longer and they come down and go up depending on where the dog wants to go. That's the way people walk dogs these days. Um, uh, and additionally, that they also be uh, on a leash at all times or banned. Now, I, I do think that needs a bit more consideration. Uh, I may agree with those, but I'd like to hear the arguments. And I don't agree that the parklands, as this proposal says, should automatically be considered opportunities for memorials. May I have just 30 seconds? I'm almost finished. Um, uh, the, uh, the growth in memorials uh, is such that we need to consider tightening the guidelines, in my view. Um, they have grown exponentially in the last uh, decade. And in fact, in, in my view, I think we have repetition of memorials in places. And I want to hear more about drones. Um, we are proposing here, and I know because of aviation rules, that they be banned generally, but in some areas, I would have thought that drones are uh, possible. Uh, and I note also that in photography, and I have a friend who does it, um, it is now the new trend in photography 
to have a camera in a drone 30 feet above the ground. And highlighting the parklands in this way seems to me not terribly invasive, and perhaps even uh, to the betterment of the, the way in which people regard the parklands. So I'm just asking uh, that this just be withdrawn for a considered approach, because this will be a long-standing, long-term agreement. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Uh, Members, may I ask a question? I just uh, of administration. Is there any time sensitivity to the consultation on uh, the draft provisions, CEO? Rick, thanks. Uh, thank you, through the Lord Mayor. I think the time sensitivity is really in relation to the it's the overall project in updating the Parklands Community Land Management Plan, which is. Um, outside of its statutory time in terms of updating, which is required every five years. So I guess I'd, this would just mean that that would slow the, the progress of the overall review. And a second question is once it's gone out for statutory consultation, it comes back into council? That's correct. Uh, members, any other questions? If not, go back to the move to sum up. Uh, look, this is a theme that comes up all the time, uh, Lord Mayor, that is to say it's not for implementation, it's just for consultation. Um, but it seems to me that if you're going out to the community saying that we want to place these restrictions on the parklands and they have not yet been considered by the body that's recommending them, um, it would be a bit like putting the cart before the horse. Um, do we really seriously want to propose that the parklands are an ideal place for memorials? Do we want to actually advance that? Uh, do we want to advance that um, dogs are only allowed in the parklands on a leash uh, or not allowed? Um, and what are the circumstances related to uh, the length of those leashes? Uh, look, it's not a big issue. I'm just suggesting that it would be very good, particularly in regard to lighting, to have informed opinion from say poll before we actually go out and say we're thinking about putting more lights in the parklands so you can walk through them. Um, that's the nub of it. Uh, if it's defeated, it's defeated, but it seems to me to make sense that we have a, a, a considered discussion. Thank you. Members, to the vote, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. I know you did. I just said the deputy Lord Mayor voted twice. I'm not quite. Just let us know which way you're voting and we'll record it that way. Against? Thank you. That's still carried. Thank you, members. Um, we go to uh, 10.12, which is the 2021-2022 business plan and budget budget parameters. And I'll look for a mover, Councillor Hyde, and I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have an alternate motion. Uh, this one wasn't printed out and circulated, so I'm happy to read it out. Um, members will prefer. You may, Councillor.
I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Today, uh, Councillor Hyde. Uh, yes, so what this does is uh, notes the very good advice we've received from our administration. And I want to commend them because we have a clearer picture now as to what our uh, asset and infrastructure spend will need to be over the next 10 years uh, than probably this council has had in the last 10 years, or possibly even 10 years before that. Um, uh, so I do feel we are operating uh, with, with absolute clarity, and I want to commend the administration for taking an incredibly conservative approach um, uh, to the finances um, and what we need, uh, what we may need to do there. Um, uh, but of course, there are a number of assumptions within the long-term financial plan um, that we haven't yet made decisions on. Um, those one, those are ones which are by default better to incorporate, such as infrastructure and what have you. But I note there are other building renewals, such as almost $15 million for the Aquatic Centre that we'll be discussing later today. Um, uh, and there are other sorts of renewals to our buildings and commercial assets which are incorporated into that plan. Um, we also are yet to have had our asset management plan a workshop and discussion around that plan. And while I note there are sustainability, uh, asset sustainability ratios uh, that have been mentioned by the administration, I think we really need to be digging into the guts of the AMP uh, so that we can understand precisely how it translates into the long-term financial plan before we set budget parameters that would, on the best advice of the administration, of course, based on the circumstances in front of them, uh, put up rates uh, the, the like of which we haven't seen probably in this decade in the City of Adelaide. So what this does uh, is adopts uh, revenue targets based on continuing uh, the freeze of the rate and the dollar, um, but resuming the normal CPI, so inflation rises uh, for, for fees and charges, uh, which is standard as to how we've uh, operated in recent years. Um, uh, it also uh, it also shows that we are very keen to discuss as a council um, things uh, that would and the policies that we need to uh, that feed into the assumptions in the long term financial plan. And I know there are substantial assets which we are currently assuming that we will pay for the entirety of that would usually come under the purview of state and federal government. If I could have two more minutes just to explain the amendment, please. And um, and what and those, those assets are things like the Adelaide Bridge at I think 50 or 60 mil, the Weir at 35, and Grenfell Curry, uh, which I understand is in there at 80 mil, yet may only require substantially less uh, to just uh, remediate the road um, uh, as, and keep the corridor uh, largely as it currently is. Um, it's also asking us to look at all of our building and commercial assets that are approaching the end of their useful life in the long-term financial plan, which means that assets and buildings, whether they're U-parts or what have you, are, which are approaching the end of their useful life and therefore we write off the entirety of the value in that asset. Um, we should be discussing how we're going to reuse, repurpose, recycle those assets. Um, just as we've discussed things regarding our strategic property review. Um, I don't think anyone wants to spend tens of millions of dollars rebuilding a car park like for like as it is, but that's really a part of the assumption that goes into the long-term financial plan. Furthermore, it's important for us uh, to think about policy and policies for growth. Uh, this at item four resolves that we are determined to grow our tax base, to grow the pie instead of taxing the current pie uh, at a higher rate, because I think that will ultimately shrink uh, that will shrink our tax base in the longer term. So this talks to devising economic policy that will uh, ensure that we reach our growth targets within the City of Adelaide, which is incredibly important. And it allows us uh, to have a discussion about how we incentivise developments. And we can incorporate into that discussion how we incentivise things like excellence in design, but by and large, we should be thinking about how we can get some of those places that have gone through the necessary approvals to actually put their money where their mouth is at a time when credit is cheap, um, so that we can achieve a, a substantially greater uh, growth in our rate base. And I've put in here uh, no less than 3% per annum for a majority. So it could take a few years to get those policies in place and functioning, and there could be a bit of lead time. Um, but ultimately, we need to be pushing uh, to have substantial rate base growth for the majority of our long-term financial planning forecast. So that's what this is about. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today. <coughs> Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. <coughs> I have some questions about this um, surprise uh, variation. I was wondering whether administration were consulted um, prior to uh, this um, proposal being put forward to Council tonight. See you. Clear? <laughs> Clear. 
through the presiding member, I think this this does. Um, sorry, when you say consulted, I'm not sure consulted. Um, I'm not sure in what sort of context you mean, Councillor Sims. But what I would say is that this does capture many of the conversations that we've had with um, with council over the last few months. So in relation to um, our tax base, we certainly shared and started those conversations. So our rating policy workshop, when we talk um, talk to members around our renewal and replacement, we've certainly talked to council members about the fact that um, our renewal and enhancement budgets over many years, the shifts and um, ebbs and flows in terms of how we've managed that and certainly in relation to um, the need for um, strategic asset management planning and new asset management plans have certainly been shared with council members over the last few months um, and clarity around how we bring that back into the chamber um, early next year has certainly been discussed with council. Um, in terms of our strategic property management, members have certainly been engaged and informed um, over many months in relation to the principles around how we turn the, um, the city of Adelaide um, into a more sustainable, um, from a financial perspective, organisation around um, divesting underperforming assets into performing assets. I've certainly committed many times around um, ensuring that we have a proper revenue strategy and that piece of work hasn't progressed as quickly um, as I personally would like, but certainly that's been discussed. So much of that is captured, I think, within that motion. Um, but in terms of was I consulted personally, I'm not sure I can um, you know, say that there's been consultation at that level. No, that, that's fine. I guess um, what I was seeking to understand, because the, um, the variation is a complete surprise uh, to me, you know, I've not seen uh, the wording prior to the meeting. It, it obviously um, has financial implications to the council, so it would have been helpful um, for the mover to have circulated it. I just wanted to understand whether or not administration had had input so that I can have some confidence around the, um, the impact of, um, of such a resolution were it to pass the, the council. But I, I hear what you're saying um, through you, uh, Lord Mayor, I hear what you're saying, Deputy CEO, that um, this picks up the uh, strands of some of the conversation that has um, happened to date. I note the reference to uh, continuing to um, freeze the rate um, in the dollar. Uh, my understanding is um, there was a report that came to administration um, through committee some time ago, um, well, certainly warning against um, council taking that course of action, at least that's how I interpreted it. What would be the long-term financial implications for the organisation should we continue to freeze the rate in the dollar? CEO. Thanks, Claire. Uh, through the presiding member, um, our current long-term financial plan doesn't have a um, sorry uh, doesn't have a dollar freeze um, ad finitum. Um, Nicole has modelled um, this recently. Are, are you able to comment on that tonight, Nicole, or would you prefer to take this on notice and do this? You Through the presiding member, I have modelled this amendment um, motion this evening. Uh, what it does result in is a operating deficit of sixty thousand dollars. So call that break even. Um, it would increase borrowings to one hundred and forty two point nine million at the end of the long term financial plan, which is sixty four percent of our prudential limit, and borrowings would re be repaid in 2045-46. Thank you. Look, I'm going to um, move, uh, Lord Mayor, that this be deferred um, until the new year, until Council next meets, to give us the opportunity um, to uh, consider administration's advice and to actually read the motion in more detail. Uh, this is the first I've seen of it. It hasn't been circulated prior to the meeting. It has significant implications for the organisation. So I suggest it be deferred until the new year, lodged as a formal motion on notice, and then that would give everybody the opportunity to consider the implications and give us the benefit of a report from administration. Sorry, Councillor Hyde. Can, can I just clarify, Lord Mayor, this is actually just about setting budget parameters. There's no financial implications for the organisation of doing this. There is no money that is going to be expended or saved. Um, uh, what it is saying in a, in a policy sense is, 
go and model it on a freeze of rate in the dollar, which sorry, is different. Sorry, I'm sorry, Councillor, you've already sorry, sorry, spoken sorry, to sorry, it. Sorry, so, just, sorry. just wanted to clarify that. There's no immediate impact as a result of this. Thank you. Councillor Sims, I'll just get you to turn your mic Oh, sorry. Um, members? Um, I'm still, no, the seconder was Councillor Avery Hempster. He reserved his right. Oh, for the deferral, my apologies. Um, so there is uh, a motion to defer. I need a seconder to defer. So Councillor Martin. Yeah. Okay. So we won't go straight to the vote. So, um, so would anybody like to speak to the deferral? Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I have a question. What are the um, implications of delay? To CEO, are there any implications of deferral of this item? Thanks, Claire. Thanks to the presiding member. I think what we were trying to do was get a steer from, from this council body um, around how we build or start to build um, our future budget. Um, usually during December, January and half of February, the organisation starts um, and does a you know, fair bit of work to build a budget to bring into um, this council, um, usually around the end of February. What we were hoping to get tonight was a clear steer from council members so that we didn't um, you know, waste unnecessary time building budgets that weren't meeting um, the needs of the city or of the council. There's no real implications if you decide to defer tonight. Um, I think um, last week and certainly this week has given us a, um, a bit of an insight into um, how this council is thinking in relation to various elements, either revenue or expenditure. Um, so, you know, if, you, if council decides to defer, I think that's okay. We're already, you know, um, planning and scheduling uh, many workshops with council members through February, March, April, before we go out to statutory consultation in May and resolve your final budget in June. Sorry, i will just asked for clarification, Councillor Sims, you're asking for this to be brought on notice in the January meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Over the last few, uh, well, since that story published, since that recommendation was published, um, suggesting that we should uh, adopt the uh, the aggressive surplus model um, immediately, um, I filled numerous calls from ratepayers who were very concerned and thought it came a little bit out of the blue. And of course, it came a little bit out of the blue for us as well. Um, uh, but that's because we were we were furnished with the best information. Um, possible, which is excellent. Um, nevertheless, uh, while the issues in our long-term financial plan are starting to actually become issues in years eight, nine, and ten, we need to resolve them now. We need to talk about what we're going to go, what we're going to do for growth now. We need to talk about how we're going to treat our future fund now. We need to talk about what we're going to do with our assets now, because I can tell you, and looking at looking at the amount of things that have come into the long-term financial plan. I can tell you that it hasn't been done in a very, very long time. Now is not the time for delay when, it, when we're talking about economic policy in the city of Adelaide and how we treat some of our most substantial assets and the infrastructure we're charged with maintaining. Federal government budgets are being put together now. State government budgets are being put together now. You want your aquatic centre or your weir or your bridge in them or, or Curry Grenfell? We need to make a decision and seek funding now. We have to do that work now. There is, no, there is no time for delay. There's a reason that in this motion it says urgently convene these planning sessions and workshops. That's because previous councils have put this serious policy work on the back burner for far, far too long. I don't think this should be deferred. I think we can set parameters for the administration uh, to work within uh, immediately, and I look forward to some fruitful sessions, potentially in January uh, or February, you know, urgent sessions so that we can start to do a deep dive into these areas and ensure that we're setting the city up for success. I think this is an excellent way to finish the year. I think it's an excellent message to send to our ratepayers who are very, very concerned uh, about skyrocketing asset renewals uh, and skyrocketing rates as a result. So I do feel strongly that we need to resolve this as quickly as possible. Members, uh, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin. 
I mean, quite simply, um, not deferring this is important. Why? Because it gives it gives the administration the opportunity to start straight away to the new year looking at this. It also gives us the maximum length of time <coughs> for which we we can interrogate it and look at our options. Because the previous one uh, 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 you know, motion that was offered to us was, you know, it was uh, uh, it didn't allow us the breadth to find ways, uh, new ways of, of income, uh, allowing us to how how we're going to use our assets. Uh, to the benefit of the city. What we're trying to do here is give ourselves some time to, give, uh, to make some considered judgments and give some considered guidance uh, to the administration and it allows us the time to do the workshops. Otherwise, we're going to be back uh, in the back end of the, the year again and we have to make a decision and we want the opportunity to give as many scenarios as we can. This gives that opportunity for that. And at least now it reflavors the conversation rather than from what was. That is a, a fairly linear uh, way of looking at it. It allows us a bit of opportunity for each of us to, do, uh, to think of ways that you know, we can uh, help our budget uh, and, and, uh, and also uh, solve some of our issues for the long-term plan uh, now while, we are, well, you know, while it's still fresh for us. Uh, because otherwise we're going to run out of time again and uh, you know and our ratepayers are going to be the ones suffering. Actually I'm going to go to Councillor Martin, my apologies as the seconder. I'm not sure I asked you whether you wanted to speak. Councillor Martin. <laughs> Councillor Donovan. Just a quick question Lord Mayor. Um, I, uh, I assume that uh, we or the state government and administration, administration isn't waiting for this amendment or any other indication from the chamber before speaking to state government around things like the Quartic Centre where I would presume that those conversations will, would have already commenced, would that be right? They have started at a political level and CEO? Certainly three of them, yes, both at political and operational level we're having conversations. Um, members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I, I thank the administration uh, for answering a question about how this proposal changes the calculations uh, in the modelling. Um, when it was suggested that we would move to a $60,000 surplus and debt of $142.9 million, what were we talking about? This year, next year, the year after, uh, every year. CEO. Can you respond, thanks? Through the presiding member, the operating deficit of 67,000 would be incurred in 21 22, and the borrowings would be at the end of the decade in 2030 31. And is that figure of 142.9 inclusive? of the significant borrowings towards the end of the decade for projects such as King William and so on. CEO. Thanks, Nicole. Through the presiding member, yes, that is correct. It includes the current allocation for all renewals within the long-term financial plan. Okay. So if I was looking at documents, um, what we were looking at in terms of the long-term uh, financial plan in terms of income is for 21-22, how much? CEO. Three, Lord Mayor. Um, Claire, could you respond? Um, I'm not sure what documentation Councillor Martin is referring to. Uh, I can I'm see a hard copy folder with some documents. No, it looks these... like some snapshots from the long-term financial plan. Is yeah, that no, QF1 these are your documents. or the budget? No, these yeah, are which... your documents. Mm -hmm. and they I'm sure are... they are. Yeah. Uh, they are. They're the only ones I ever see. I go to bed at night reading them. Glad, I, glad as do does. we all, Councillor Martin. Oh, look, Lord Mayor, I've even had to stop reading the Bible in order to make sure I get these through. 213, 214, 215, 216, 217, 218, 19. So what are we talking about in terms, and I'll refer particularly to the Uniform Presentation of Finances, for income for each of those years under this model, 20, uh, 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24, and so on. CEI. It's true, Lord Mayor. I've just questioned the validity of answering this question here at the moment. I would have thought that would be the sort of conversation we'll have through the workshops. No, I, uh, Lord Mayor, I understand that. 
Um, look, let me speak. Let me speak. I mean, essentially, I, uh, and let me declare at the outset, I don't disagree with what uh, Councillor Hyde is putting out. I know that's irregular, but I don't necessarily disagree. But there is a, a, a distinction here. I mean, the, the administration, having frightened the life out of all of us, presented a series of figures to us and uh, has, of its own initiative, come up with a recommendation uh, uh, um, advocating a particular approach to budgeting and to taxation. That was to therefore influence the way in which the budget is framed. Um, the, the, the administration is saying, do this. Now, Councillor Hyde has proposed an amendment which is entirely different and is saying to you, um, to all of us, um, this is a better approach, do this. Uh, in other words, don't look at them, look at me. And uh, in looking at him and his motion, I'm trying to ascertain what the significant differences are. Because his motion, as the administrations did, seeks to set us on a particular path. Now, that path may be a perfect path for us, but I don't want to commit to that path without knowing what the modelling is and all of the impacts are. Uh, and I feel disadvantaged in some ways because I've got all of the modelling from you, including the impacts. Um, I don't agree with the initiatives, um, but I've got all of the modelling. I have none of it from him. Um, so therefore, uh, I would s speak in favour of deferring this so I can just see the figures. Um, you know, the, uh, the idea of saying we are not going to punish you ratepayers is a wildly appealing thing for me. Um, and if there is another approach that would achieve an outcome that is acceptable to all, uh, including the administration, then I think we should pursue it. But uh, I don't want to commit to it uh, or limit it to the extent that we will by accepting that. And Thank that you, is why Councilor I've Martin. asked, can we defer this until we can have all that information? Members, if not, I will go back to the move to sum up on the deferral. Thanks, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Look, I don't think what I'm proposing is really very controversial here. Um, it, it is a, a difficult position to be in when a councillor comes to a meeting with a proposal um, that has significant implications for how the budget is crafted um, and presents it without circulating prior to the meeting, um, without the benefit of any administration comment and without even the benefit, quite frankly, of me being able to take a few minutes to read it closely and process the impl implications. I don't think that's a very sound decision um, making, Lord Mayor. It is the custom on this council when someone is proposing a motion that relates to a uh, budget, that it is done as a motion on notice so that um, members of council have the benefit of an administration comment. Now, in this case, Councillor Hyde has chosen to develop a covert alternative motion which he has presented on the floor of this council, rather than simply circulating it to his colleagues over the last week or so, he could have done that, and then I would have maybe had a chance to consider it and to seek information from administration. But I, I don't feel that I'm in a position to vote on this, um, having not uh, had the, the benefit of that information. And I suggest it would be very irresponsible for councillors to vote on a motion that has been presented in uh, this fashion. Members to the vote on deferral. Those in favour? Those against? Holy smoke. Uh, that fails. Uh, members, that takes us back to the alternate motion. Are there any other speakers on the alternate motion? If not, I will go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Uh, it just in summing up, I take on board. I take on board the comments that were made, and this, while the concept was developed over the course of the last week since the committee, uh, and I'd spoken with staff, I'd spoken with uh, some colleagues. The motion itself was only actually drafted during the deputation, so I apologise uh, profusely for that. It's a very busy time at the end of the year. Fundamentally, though, um, uh, I think we've heard these uh, projections, and I think the administration. Um, 
for providing that. I think if I can just take a stab in the dark, I think the reason that the modeling was to hand, I actually haven't seen it. The reason the modeling was to hand was because this is actually the way that we've operated. This is the basis on which we've operated for the past seven years. So it's not a massive departure. And I, I would assume the 3% um, rate growth target is actually not incorporated into that modeling um, either. So if we uh, take this course of action, start having these discussions with our administration, that $149 million in, uh, uh, in gross borrowers will actually probably look markedly better if we actually achieve the economic policies that are set out here. This is just asking uh, for us to start thinking properly about it. It's not, it's not asking to set the policy now, it's just saying, look, what do you think of this vision? Um, uh, and, and I think we're probably in agreement that we don't really want to come out of a pandemic and, and, a, and a pandemic recession putting up council rates. Um, uh, and that we don't really want to shrink the city of Adelaide because I, I do sincerely believe that we are at a tipping point. We are on the edge um, as a city and as a CBD and as a CBD economy, whereby uh, the decisions we make now will actually affect us for, for a long time in the future. And I think it's quite existential because if we pull back now, and adopt the aggressive surplus uh, previously uh, recommended approach, put up taxes, send bad signals to investment. Um, all, all we're gonna be doing uh, is shrinking the pie in the city. We're gonna be saying, you know what, city of Adelaide, it's, it's been a slow decline for the last 30 years, but you know, due to circumstance, we're just gonna accelerate that. Um, I don't think that's what anyone wants here. So I, I do fundamentally believe we need to grow our way back to surplus, not tax our way back to surplus. Um, and, and in doing so, we can give the city a brighter future. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Yeah. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour, please stand and remain standing till all names have been called. Councillor Abraham Zanay, Councillor Canole, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Hyde. Thank you members. We go to 10.14, which is the Adelaide Parklands Authority Strategic Plan and I look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Hyde, did you speak to it? I only wish to commend you, Lord Mayor, on the initiative of getting Appler to uh, develop this and for the incredibly thoughtful contributions that you managed to elicit uh, out of the wonderful expert, majority expert, I'm not an expert, majority expert um, board that we have. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Knoll, did you wish to speak? Members? Councillor Martin. Uh, look, just a, a question, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, this uh, is the Parkland Strategic Plan mm -hmm. uh, as it's being proposed. Th this, this is a plan. That is uh, the Parkland's management strategy. That's the management strategy Correct. plan. I understand that. And this sits in front of this, am I correct? They work together, correct. They work together. And the Parkland's management strategy is within the Parkland's at Parkland's management plan is within the Parkland's management strategy. I, I just, I, I just, I am looking for an explanation, uh, either from you or the administration. Very happy to give you one. Okay, I, uh, the administration's okay. I wouldn't discriminate against them, um, uh, but I just wonder how you capture all of this in our vision for the strategic management of the so The strategic management plan is uh, necessary through the charter. Um, with the, the change to the charter for the APLA and the membership, we have to do a strategic plan. That was done by all members. Um, it was a great consultative piece and it talks to the partners management strategy within the plan. And we've made it that small so that everybody could have it in their papers. Okay. Well, uh, look, thank you very much. Um, it is confirmation that we are a one-page council, no question. Thank you. I think that was very rude, but thank you very much, Councillor Martin. Oh, no, no, no. That was I'm actually a good piece of work. I'll pass on your comment to Atla. I'm sure they'll be pleased with that thank commentary. Uh, members, if not, back to Councillor Hyde. Sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, we go to 10.15, uh, which is the Study Adelaide Board. Uh, remember, there's no limit to the number of nominations that can be forwarded to the Minister, because the Minister then considers and makes the appointment of one City of Adelaide representative. So I look to the four for nominations. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. I'd like to nominate 
Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde. Yeah. Councillor Hyde, do you accept the nomination? Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Are there any further nominations? No, members, if not, then could I have a uh, motion that Councillor Hyde be put forward as a nomination? Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Abraham today. Sorry, just to confirm, there is no remuneration. Uh, I will double check. No. I don't believe so. No, right. no. And, and and sorry, who is the minister? Do we, which minister is it? Uh, this, if it's for Study Adelaide Board, uh, that would be that Minister Gardner. Gardner. Yes. Okay. That's fine. That would be Minister John. Sorry, Minister Gardner. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Abraham, sir. No, thank you. Members, if not, to the vote. Those in favour. Those against, that is carried. Uh, members, we have a, a 10.16, which is the appointment of council members to the Reconciliation Committee. I need three members to be nominated for the Reconciliation Committee, and I look to the floor. Councillor Donovan. I nominate Councillor Knoll. Councillor Knoll, do you accept the nomination? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mackey. Um, Lord Mayor, I nominate Councillor Donovan. Councillor Donovan, do you accept the nomination? Thank you. Councillor Donovan, I look to the floor. I need one more nomination. Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims, would you, a, would you accept? Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. But I've um, served on the committee many times in the uh, past, so um, I will decline, um, but certainly leave the opportunity for another councillor to take on. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Members, are there any further nominations? Councillor Sims. Nominate Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde. My time commitments are too uh, heavy, I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, but uh, perhaps would Councillor Mackey like to do it? Yeah. Councillor Mackey. Councillor Mackey. Um, thank For you, you Councillor Hyde. I'll, I'll, I'll respectfully decline. Thanks. Thank you. Members? Councillor Donovan. I nominate Councillor or Deputy Lord Mayor Kouros. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, but I decline. Councillor Hyde. Councillor Martin, given his interest in the Indigenous area. Councillor Martin. And achievements. Oh, uh, I'll have to decline, Lord Mayor. I'm embarrassed by our incapacity to meet our employment. Thank problems. you for your uh, explanation. <laughs> Members. Um, I nominate Councillor Abraham today. I have to respectfully decline. I have a three and a half month old at home that has taken up all of my time now. So maybe before I had a kid, maybe. Yes. Not now. Councillor, Deputy Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I'll accept it. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, members, could I have a motion, a motion that Councillor Knoll, Councillor Donovan, and Deputy Lord Mayor? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hyde, seconded Councillor Mackey. Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak? Okay. Members? Not to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um. Members, uh, that takes us to 10.18, which is the City Business Stimulus Program. I look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Look for a seconder. Councillor Knoll, Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak? Uh, I just wish to thank the administration um, uh, for pulling this together. Uh, I think it's uh, not going to deploy the budget by any means, reading the report, but um, uh, what it will do is divert funds uh, that otherwise may have gone to savings and ensure that we can continue to deliver and can ramp up delivery um, of a number of exciting initiatives in the city. Um, uh, obviously, activations is excellent, um, uh, but I, you know, I take Councillor Kira's uh, guidance when, when you say you need to support businesses other than hospitality. Uh, I think there are measures within this that seek to do that. Um, uh, and, and I'm really, really pleased to see the energy assessment pilot program um, in there because I think it, it could go a long way uh, to, to, to helping our businesses <laughs> reduce their ongoing costs. And, and at the end of the day, that's, that I think is one of the fundamental roles of government anyway, that we can reduce or help them 
to reduce their operational expenses. It means that they, the money in their p and can be liberated to either reinvest in their business um, or to ensure that they're financially sustainable um, over the long term. So I would also highlight uh, uh, as well that the reprioritization of a quarter of a million dollars from coming out of Q2 uh, to complement and leverage the uh, SATC's great state vouchers um, is a fantastic initiative and, and having that go towards hospitality and experiences as well will keep some of those providers going and it brings a reason uh, uh, to, to it has a, it, it gives a reason to bring people into the city and and hopefully when they do that they can actually linger longer and you know spend more on all those buzzwords and everything but um, uh, again I just want to thank uh, all the administration particularly um, uh, the CEO and, and, and directors Hill and deputy CEO as well for for working with myself and other elected members on this um, uh, and, and hearing the call when we say that, and of course the Lord Mayor as well, when we say that businesses need this, um, I think there will be a lot of very happy businesses um, when they see this passed. Um, Councillor Knoll, as a seconder. Yeah, just a couple of words, and that is that, I mean, one of the greatest things that, uh, that I've always been saying is that we need to find ways to attract people to the city. And that's the, that's the one thing that we can really do that will benefit not only you know the businesses themselves by having you know access to more customers, but we're supporting them with things that uh, hold them front and centre uh, as part of our assistance. And it's far more valuable to bring people in the town and uh, using using the city for what it is intended, um, you know, then trying to find some way of giving them a few dollars of, of financial relief. And this is this is helping to build the business rather than necessarily just finding a way to sustain them. And I think it's more important. And with AIDA and all those sort of initiatives, I think there'll be a lot uh, more uh, you know, activity within the city. Councillor Kira. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, well, it was perhaps foreshadowed by uh, Councillor Hyde. I. I, I um, I can't, I won't support uh, this motion. I don't uh, suggest that it uh, hasn't, uh, or that it has been brought in bad faith. I think it's been brought in good faith. Uh, I don't seek uh, to be uh, critical about it uh, for the sake of being critical. However, I think at this juncture, uh, what we have demonstrated is uh, what I see is an inordinate, and an inordinate level of, uh, uh, well, not inordinate, but, but a, uh, an assistance that is targeted towards hospitality uh, and to which non-hospitality are missing out. The majority of the city is non-hospitality. Uh, the majority of the city uh, businesses are not hospitality. Um, I don't, I can't support uh, the, the energy incentive scheme. I, I don't think that's business assistance. I think, I think that is an expansion. Um, sorry, we have a good <laughs> play. Um, I think, look, uh, I think the uh, $400,000, I, I don't think we should be uh, seeking uh, to, under the guise of assisting businesses, expand our climate uh, sort of activism or our climate uh, uh, portfolio remit. I think that is highly, I think it's highly inappropriate. Um, and, uh, and moreover, uh, I, I'm disappointed, uh, I'm disappointed, Lord Mayor, that uh, we, we didn't see the um, business, the small business rebate um, scheme uh, go through. I think at the end of the day, uh, what small businesses need more than anything is, for example, $1,000 a thousand dollar refund of their rates because a thousand dollars in your pocket is something you can spend on advertising on Facebook or uh, you can spend it on a on a sales uh, you know incentive that you couldn't otherwise. It's the kind of stuff that helps businesses at the end of the day directly. I don't think this umbrella spending is going to be the equivalent of anything like that. Uh, so unfortunately, I cannot support it. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I just want a clarification from administration regarding hospitality offerings and why swimming uh, is a vouchers for, for um, the hospitality sector, for the for restaurants and cafes. Sorry, very quiet. I can hardly hear you up here. So you're oh, sorry, looking at ma item six. I just wanted to seek clarification in regards to the paid, it's in the um, uh, point six, it says incorporating paid experiences and hospitality offerings. I'm assuming that that means uh, obviously vouchers and for restaurants and cafes. Okay, uh, CEO. Thanks, CEO. Through the Lord Mayor. So the Great State Voucher version 2 has been announced. It's not actually alive to the consumer yet, but it's been announced and that's purely focused back again on um, accommodation. Um, 
we've been in discussions with the South Australian Tourism Commission and they're working through stage three. Um, they haven't announced yet whether that will include um, tour guides, um, you know, things like roof climbs, things like um, uh, restaurants and hospitality. Um, so what we're seeking here is if we can leverage that, great, through the SATC, if they go down that path, if they don't, um, we'd be keen to do something that supports city businesses solely in that in that space. In that space. Um, so in, in that case, um, I'd like to declare that I have an actual conflict of interest um, and, and ask if we can uh, take that in part. So Certainly. With the leave of the Chamber, I'm happy to take that in part. Okay, thank you. Good. So conflict of interest on number six. Thank you. Uh, members, Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, just uh, some questions for the administration. Um, uh, each of these initiatives have been discussed in uh, some way or another, or most of them anyway. Um, but I'm confused about the total cost, even though there's a summary on the front, because some of the money is being expended by the council and some is being expended by uh, the Adelaide Economic Development Agency. Could I have a straight answer on how much is council spending directly and how much is being spent by the Adelaide Economic Development Agency? Through the chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Through the chair, Councillor Martin. Uh, I feel like I'm in an episode of Kath and Kim. Look at me, look at me. Uh, yeah, no, it's actually part of our meeting regulations. I know, Lord um, Mayor. I know. I, I'd be happy for you not to look at me, but actually it is part of our <laughs> meeting regulations that the members ask and speak to the I, chair. I understand, Lord Mayor. It's just so culturally counterintuitive. To be, to be asking something of Thank someone we'll, sitting we'll, next we'll to you, move on. but not looking That's, at that them. Is, they are the protocols of the chamber. I'm sure we're all well. Let's get on with Captain. CEO. Yeah. Through Lord Mayor, I don't know if we can provide that clarity tonight. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll give it a go. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Through the Lord Mayor, um, at the end of the day, um, aid is not established until the 18th of January, but all the the earlier item tonight we talked about it's a transitional budget so that is an existing approved budget of council so this initiative relates to all approved monies being redirected that are already city of adelaide um, funding and may i ask a, uh, a further question is that amount then in total one million dollars that is all of these initiatives ceo we can have clarity on the total. Michelle, thanks. Um, so through the chair, um, it's um, a reprioritisation re um, of existing funding that we have. So in some of those areas, say for example, Splash, it's within their, their current budget being re-prioritised. Um, in some other areas, it might be from across the organisation. Okay, Lord Mayor, can I, can so, I get my so question answered? How the, much? My, I, I'm reading uh, this on page three of this report. Yes, it I'm says, the proposed budget allocation of million dollars in 21-22 and a further million in 22-23 and the remainder of the money, which is 900,000, will be through budget reconsiderations. Now, I hear that, Lord Mayor, and the reason I'm asking that is if you go through and analyse each of the initiatives, the amount is in excess of $1 million. So I'm asking, what is the figure? Sorry. See Sorry, through the chair. Um, so the 900,000 is reprioritisation from across the organisation. And then you add that um, to um, 100,000, which is from within the existing splash budget. So that's 1 million. Um, and then if you add on top of that, the 50,000 within the city added activation budget. So that's a million and 50,000. Um, and then on top of that, you've got the 250,000 um, which is um, a reprioritisation as well as the other $250,000. So it's all within our current budget, but you're correct. It is more than 900,000, but okay. it's, it's for the purposes of clarity from where those budgets come from. Okay, thank you um, to the administration. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It is in fact 1.55 million in total cost. Um, may I speak, Lord Mayor? <laughs> 
Thank you, Mark. Um, look, I, um, and I really do, in fact, I can't ever remember doing it. I agree with Councillor Kira. Um, we talked initially uh, in the early months of COVID about providing assistance to business. Um, I proposed on three occasions assistance to business. Uh, Councillor Hyatt uh, finally uh, was shamed into proposing some assistance to small business which would uh, effectively cost about $5 million. And the intention in each case was to ensure that we assisted businesses that were not just hospitality, not just restaurants, cafes, hotels, but businesses which have been severely affected that don't fall into that category. And there are so many of those. In fact, the other day I was talking to a business operating within 500 metres of here, not related to hospitality, who was appealing to me uh, for assistance, saying, look, you, you guys have got to do something for us. I, I don't sell coffee, I don't sell food, but I'm going to the wall. I am going out of business. And you've done nothing. And that is the truth. We have done nothing. And indeed, these measures, and, and look, I will support it, Lord Mayor, because I think nothing um, is not a good outcome. Uh, 1.55 million is something, but it's still not enough. Um, it, we are basically employing more minstrels, more singers and dancers, more flyers, more online marketing, marketing rather, um, just more song and dance. Uh, and look, it, it might be that this council prefers a singing and dancing led recovery to COVID-19. But I think it needs more than that. We actually need to be giving money to businesses which have steadfastly paid their rates, huge tens of thousands of dollars over the years with very little in return when it comes to a crisis of this nature. Uh, and so it is disappointing. Um, I think this means the end of any contemplation of the real assistance to all businesses. Uh, thank you. Members, um, I will actually just make a comment. Um, I think it's a, a great report. I think it's much more than song and dance and particularly um, I'd like to uh, thank administration for the energy assessment pilot program. Um, if those businesses can reduce their energy costs, that's something that's actually going to save them and their pocket over many, many years and not just a, a, a single time. Um, it's also great to see that we can hopefully work with the Tourism Commission and support uh, again businesses through the city including those experiences as well as hospitality which would be great. And uh, the other one which I know um, Councillor Hyde was very keen on um, early in the piece is making sure that we increase the digital capacity of our businesses in the city and that marketplace. So uh, with that I'll go back to uh, hand back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Thank you. Awesome. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against. Councillor uh, Councillor Martin, are you voting? Sorry. I voted in favour. Oh, my apologies. My apologies. Um, members, if I could actually. Uh, vote to vote as well, Lord Mayor. We already voted. So I didn't actually see your hand. So it, well, it doesn't matter if the vote. If you didn't see my hand, that has no impact on the vote. Sorry, I did commit to do it in parts. So, according to my governance advice, I can do that again. Um, all parts, with the exception of part six. Those in favour? Those against? Sorry. I'm going to do that again. Three times, come on. All parts, with the exception of part six. Those in favour? Those against. Thank you. Members, just part six. No, you don't need to vacate. You uh, just don't vote. Members, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, we have uh, six items, I think. Six. No, six, uh, seven items to. Uh, to look in, at confidentiality. Um, 
Each item requires a motion and decision to or the exclusion of the public to enable consideration in confidence. Sorry, um, Lord Mayor, before we do that, I'm just conscious of the lateness of the hour and the public interest in some of the issues. Could we move forward the um, motions on notice and then deal with the confidential items lately? No, I won't. Uh, I'm just uh, Councillor Sims, I am very conscious of that. I'm also conscious of the number of staff members yeah. that are waiting uh, to uh, look at these reports. And uh, we have moved the confidential items specifically so that those members can go home. Yeah, just concerned about members of the public that might be interested in the Aquatic Centre and watching as well. Yep. Um, and uh, as you know, it goes to YouTube and that can be watched at any time. Um, and in fact, once we close for this, there won't be a gap when it's back on the YouTube station. Um, most members, I look for a mover and a second for each motion to order the exclusion. So uh, item 12.1.1, which is a recommendation of the Special Audit Committee in confidence of the 24th. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today, a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Canal. Members, to, uh, would anybody like to speak? Councillor Martin. Yes, I want to ask the administration what, why does this matter need to be heard in confidence? It's a straight out appointment. There's no, no money, no names, just a company appointment. CEO? Yeah, three, Lord Mayor. Related to the Audit Committee and on the 24th of November agenda, it included confidential reports in the agenda and it has financial details for tender and supply of services. So. That's why we would have it as a confidential one. No, but uh, uh, Lord Mayor, um, uh, and I am looking at you, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, there is none of that information in the documents presented to council. There is no financial information. It is a straight out appointment. Why is this in confidence? CEO, I think that's, there's a link to the agenda. Isn't there's it? a link with the full agenda of the work committee. But, but why? Because with, I think that your question has been answered because the audit committee considered uh, financial and other information. Well, Mayor, I understand that. But if the link was uh, not published, what? Why is this matter being heard in conference? It's but, not. It's, it's not the financial information. Um, I think the question has been answered, Councillor Martin. Um, of course, you you may wish to vote against it. Oh, no, I won't vote against it. I just don't understand why we hide this well, stuff. Sorry, Councillor Martin, the question has been asked and answered. Other members, anyone else wish to speak? If not, uh, to the move to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, I, the second item is 12.2.1, which is activating 88 O'Connell. Look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Today, seconder. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Members, any discussion? If not, back to the move to sum up. Members to the vote. Those in favour. Those against. That is carried. Item 12.2.2. I look for a mover and a seconder. Unnamed public road off Tom's Court. Mover, Councillor Abraham today. Seconder, Councillor Noel. Uh, members, if not, back to the move to sum up. Members to the vote. Those in favour. Those against. That is carried. 12.2.3 uh, is the contract award report, Moon Street Construction. I'll look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. Seconder, Councillor Knoll. Members, not to the vote. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. 12.2.4 uh, is the strategic property action plan. I'll look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Seconder, Councillor Abraham today. Uh, members, no, actually that was to see if we want to speak to, speak to it. No, uh, Councillor Knoll to sum up. Oh, you do want to speak to it. My apologies. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that while I spoke against going into confidence um, in committee, uh, now that we will be having a proper and fruitful discussion uh, around all of our assets and our long-term financial planning and what we do with the future fund, um, that will eventually come into council and then become public knowledge. I'm far more comfortable with us having this discussion now. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Uh, Councillor Knoll, oh, Councillor Martin? Uh, I'm not with him. <laughs> Councillor Knoll, to sum up. Members to the vote. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. 
Uh, 12.2.5, the Adelaide Economic Development Agency appointment of board members. Councillor Hyde, seconder, Councillor Mackey. Uh, members, if not, Councillor Hyde, sum up. Okay. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. 12.2.6, uh, Citizens of the Year Award 2021. Councillor Abrahimzade, seconder, Councillor Knoll. Uh, any discussion? If not, back to the move to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against. That is carried. Members of the public and staff, thank you for the attendance in the first part of the meeting. Members are uh, not associated with items 12.1.1, uh, 12.2.1, 12.2.2, 12.2.3, 12.2.4, 12.2.5 and 12.2.6. I uh, will please ask you now leave the council chamber. The streaming will cease while council considers these items on the agenda. Uh, the meeting will reopen and the streaming recommence at the conclusion of the last confidential item.
amount of confidence. And as soon as we start streaming, I will go to item number 13 on the agenda. We do? Okay. Uh, so members, uh, my presiding members report for December. Uh, I've had the opportunity to attend, as I hope many of you had, and also to host several Christmas events this month. Uh, with the assistance of Chelsea, a child from the Childhood Cancer Association, we lit up the Christmas tree in Victoria Square, Tate and Younger, on the 13th of November. And the following night, I attended the Christmas pageant at the Adelaide Oval. Uh, last week, I held my Christmas lunch here at the Adelaide Town Hall, and my special guests were the first responders to, so that we could say thank you for the extraordinary work they've done so far this year in keeping our city and our state safe, first from bushfires and then, of course, COVID-19. I also wanted to acknowledge our First Nations people as the first first responders on this land, and so I brought our emergency service chiefs together with members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, it was a great event. We had this year's recipient of my Lord Mayor's NAIDOC Award, Jack Buckskin, uh, join us and teach some Ghana language, and I thank members for attending um, that lunch. Over the weekend, we held the Christmas Gala at the Adelaide uh, Town Hall, hosted by Keith Conlon. This year's theme was made in Adelaide and featured South Australian artists performing Christmas carols and songs. And we also, uh, the following night, had a live screening of the ceiling carols by candlelight in the Adelaide Town Hall. Uh, which was a virtual event this year. Uh, with the support of City of Adelaide, the Grote Street Business Precinct has created a wishing grove on Grote Street, and I attended the opening night and made one of the first wishes on December the 4th. On the 13th of November, I hosted the Council of Capital City Lord Mayor's AGM. The Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Adrian Schrinner, came to Adelaide for the meeting and other Lord Mayors attended virtually. Unfortunately, Adrian got caught up with some COVID restrictions and then had to go home and quarantine for 14 days. Uh, he had a fabulous time in Adelaide. I'm not so sure he was uh, that excited when he had to quarantine. It was a productive meeting discussing the economic recoveries of cities as well as mental health and wellbeing in our COVID world. Um, I also held uh, further Hutt Street and Moonta Street roundtable meetings this month, bringing together stakeholders to focus on improvement projects, big and small. I attended the opening of the Sky City on, uh, uh, on the 3rd of December, as well as the openings of the Crown Plaza, Adelaide, and the Main Gallery, which is the first Turkish art gallery to open in Adelaide, uh, which was on December the 16th, uh, 16th, November 16th. I launched the opening of Baby Skin Laser and Cosmetic Clinic in Gawla Place on Saturday, the 12th of December. Great to see new businesses opening in the city. On the 10th of December, I joined with a generous group of donors for the unveiling of a new Queen Adelaide II statue at Government House. It is the only statue of the Queen in Adelaide and was created by a renowned Adelaide artist, Alfie Hannaford. November the 22nd marked the two year anniversary of our investiture of this council and my term as Lord Mayor and I issued a midterm report which summarised the many excellent outcomes that we have delivered so far or thus far as a council. Um, I thank members and our CEO and admin staff for their ongoing commitment to making Adelaide the most livable, creative and safest place in the world and I ask that someone accept my report. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kerr, seconded Councillor Mackey. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Item 14 on tonight's agenda is uh, reports from council members. Uh, it is to note, I look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today, seconded Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, members, are there any comments? No, Councillor Abraham today, did you wish to speak? Members? To the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Um, we have several questions on notice, um, which with leave the chamber we'll take as read. Members, just by a quick show of hands, we take as read. I'd particularly like to thank Councillor Phil Martin for his question about my new car. I hope many others uh, join me in changing to electric. Um, are there any questions without notice, members? 
Councillor Mart. Yeah, um, the first question is, uh, Lord Mayor, will you accept my congratulations for foregoing um, the, uh, the car which you're entitled to and the chauffeured limousine and for economising in a way that sets a standard for all Lord Mayors? Thank you, Councillor Mart. Pleasure. Um, may I just ask for a question uh, or clarification in relation to a question 15.7. Um, in relation to the 2019 Lord Mayor's Christmas reception, it's recorded that 22,000 of an expenditure of 51, almost 52,000 was devoted to catering. Does that include uh, refreshments, including liquid re refreshments or is it entirely food? I will just find that. I'm not sure I can answer that because I don't answer these questions, nor do I run the budgets. So now, I'm sorry, at uh, what point? Yes, it's point uh, nine. It says approximately 500 guests accepted invitations for the Lord Mayor's Christmas reception in 2019, uh, yes. for which yes. the total cost was 51,917, mm -hmm. 22,213 for catering. Mm -hmm. Is that catering, including all catering, drinks as Correct. well as food? It is. The rest is in performance and setup and staffing costs. Thank you. Um, uh, members, I did have a question on notice from Councillor Moran. Uh, we'll put that on notice for next time. That takes us to motions on notice. Uh, please note that Councillor Sins has withdrawn his motions on notice. Um, Councillor Moran has withdrawn her motion at 17.2 on the East West Bank Bikeway. Uh, she will uh, defer 17.6 to the January meeting. Um, and 17.7, she was satisfied that that was dealt with under the city uh, business <coughs> stimulus program. Uh, so that takes us then to uh, Councillor Mackey at 17.3. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Through you, um, I move the Council resolves to prepare a briefing paper for endorsement and funding by the Capital City Committee to progress the Greater Central West Precinct um, uh, as the next priority following completion of the Riverbank Master Plan. Look for a second, Dave. Thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I, I'll speak briefly uh, to this. Um, the logical question on many of your minds might be, what the hell is the Greater Central West Precinct when we don't actually have a formal precinct uh, designated that way? Um, I did in my initial uh, draft motion, uh, which I just submitted to administration for uh, some advice, um, uh, just prescribe it uh, and the advice I received was that perhaps let's just keep it keep it loose um, uh, but but for uh, colleagues benefit my my sense of the greater central west starts it's bounded uh, on the eastern side by King William and, and Victoria Square uh, from on the northern side uh, uh, Franklin Street on the southern side uh, Wright Street and extends down to West Terrace it, it, it therefore tr it, it, it overlaps a number of our existing Main Street precincts, uh, but in essence, the uh, the intent is to draw some some good thinking uh, and planning to that part of the city, which affords us the probably the greatest opportunity for a substantial residential population growth, and in so doing, helped to advance the sustainability prospects of the Central Market Precinct, the Chinatown Precinct, um, the, the, the uh, Guja Street uh, Precincts. These are all parts of council is, of course, commendably uh, investing substantially in the Victoria Square Arcade uh, redevelopment adjacent to Central Market. Um, we're also the owner, as was uh, highlighted in an earlier report this evening, of the old Franklin Street bus depot site and Franklin Street bus depot site. And um, the last, my last ride around the, uh, the, the term of council, um, we made the acquisition of the Balfour site and then subsequently um, uh, parceled that up for, for development um, and indeed moved on the, uh, the establishment of the new Franklin Street bus depot. Councillor Abrams, I'd like to speak. Um, 
Yep, very quickly, I just want to thank uh, Councillor Maker for bringing this uh, motion into the Chamber. I uh, agree with his sentiments around uh, population growth and what we need to do as a, as a city uh, in order to facilitate that and, and boost it. Uh, and I think uh, um, uh, too often we think about um, uh, precincts uh, uh, as, as in one street. So here, a precinct is, is an entire area where we've got a, a number of uh, a number of streets. So uh, I thank Councillor Maker, and I think uh, this will be a great motion. And I do commend it to the chair. Councillor Hyde, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, I just want to thank Councillor Maker. I think it um, fits in very well with everything we've been discussing, um, and certainly I think it has a uh, can have a prominent position. On the capital city agenda, and I know that we've got Councillor Ho, um, who's a central ward councillor who can champion champion it there um, as well. But it it actually it actually ties together um, so many good things. I mean, we we're talking about the West Franklin. We heard from them earlier today, and it's referred to again. I mean, that that is an example of a precinct that pursuant to you know the LMA was more or less planned in a sense, um, and it's that sort of precinct wide planning which I think um, gives people certainty. Um, it also gives developers certainty. So if we can have some certainty around our level of investment in those areas, noting that some people you know, want the east-west pipeline because of greening opportunities and what have you, and it's because it's so barren down there. Um, so that is sort of the hangover from our uh, light industrial past in the city of Adelaide. Um, uh, and if we can start working on uh, that plan to help get those quite large, there are some quite large parcels of land. I know that. You know, there's um, uh, there's the post office uh, as well, um, and, and potentially noting that we've got some other uh, uh, incentives that we're lobbying the state government for with regards to residential development. But, you know, maybe there could be a test case in there um, somewhere for that precinct, and we could factor that into our thing as well. But definitely, the most growth um, could occur down there. We need to make sure it's the right kind of growth, um, uh, and this this will help us do that. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, Lord Mayor, I was just going to um, speak in support of it, but I think we, I think it's all pretty unanimous and uh, and uh, just uh, mindful of time. Uh, members, not to Councillor Mackey to sum up. Sum up. Members to the vote. Those in favour. Those against. That is carried. Uh, that takes us to 17.4, Councillor Kerra. Uh, Lord Mayor, having uh, spoken to the administration, um, and just for your information, uh, McLaren Street is a very, very narrow, a very heritage protected street. It can be used as a I'll shortcut. Just, I'll just but get... I, I'm going to withdraw the motion. Are you going to withdraw? Explaining, I'm explaining why. Uh, the administration has indicated they will treat this as they would. Uh, it came by a constituent. Uh, they will treat this in a normal process in that matter, and they'll uh, follow up. So just uh, saves time uh, and effort uh, with the meeting. Thank you. One of my favourite streets in the city. Um, that takes us to uh, 17.8, Councillor Kira. Councillor Kira, 17.8. Yes, thanks, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, Move is printed and uh, seek a seconder. Councillor Hyde. Uh, well, um, look, Lord Mayor, um, I think this is uh, this is probably an example uh, of something uh, which I think it's worth reflecting on uh, in relation to why it is we we we, come, we run for council, why we might be in public life. Um, we're here to make difficult decisions, uh, Lord Mayor. We are not here uh, to make easy decisions. Um, if if we're only here to make easy decisions, then well, why, why are we here at all? Um, I would submit to the chamber that whilst, whilst this is indeed a difficult decision uh, being put forward, uh, it is also an obvious decision. Uh, it is also an obvious decision uh, given uh, the whole suite of factors that we have before us. Um, we Obviously, we, we've all heard the numbers uh, between two, 1.52 to 3 million per year, uh, potentially uh, going out into the future, uh, capital expenditure of another uh, in 10 or more million, 30 to 40 million dollars uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, but putting aside just the expenditure, there are all the other issues that we now know are manifest uh, in relation uh, to the aquatic centre. We have all seen firsthand uh, the state of dilapidation uh, of this facility. Uh, there can be no excuses. We have been inside and seen how dilapidated uh, it is. Uh, we know that the centre is not uh, designed to best practice to uh, prevent uh, indecent assault. 
Uh, we know uh, that the centre was never designed uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, indeed, we have a, a building uh, in 2021, uh, which was an open air swimming pool uh, with a roof built over the top. Uh, the energy costs alone are absolutely staggering. Uh, and I would put to some of those councillors, we did hear uh, some councillors uh, say that one of the reasons they wanted to uh, stop fireworks from occurring in New Year's Eve was the carbon cost, was the carbon emissions. Well, just consider how much uh, uh, carbon emissions are going on uh, every hour in running a facility that is so manifestly poorly designed for uh, for uh, and just 30 seconds more. I thought if that wasn't in three minutes. Um, uh, so look, uh, there, there are there are every there's every reason for us to seriously consider and seriously do this. Yes, uh, it's that there is a client base, but this is not a vote against having an aquatic centre. If we do this now. We have more chance of building a purpose-built and good quality aquatic centre down in the future. That is what this is about. This is saying have confidence in the product that we will undertake to deliver in the future uh, and don't be afraid of just holding on to the present uh, when it is so manifestly uh, inadequate uh, and moreover the City of Adelaide have, cannot afford this at this time. So. Thank you. I have Councillor Hyde and then As a secondary, am I able to it's just a very slight variation. As a seconder, is that possible? I know I can't amend. I think you can put forward a slight variation and see if the mover will see accept if the it. Mover is, um, I, I would just say um, after the uh, after the entirety of the uh, single sentence motion, um, I would just after operation I'd put comma unless the state or federal Governments commit capital funding to to a to a rebuild. To a So I'll look to the mover to see if you are willing to accept that, unless the state or federal government commit capital funding to a rebuild. Well, they've got till March, don't they? Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to two point seven or eight million dollars at the end of the long term financial plan. Over that period, we'll be spending almost fourteen million dollars on renewals. I mean, I'm very interested to have a discussion. And 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 honestly, it almost makes financial sense to spend fifty five million grow, go for the growth option and build one that generates revenue and make that decision now. But um, uh, but again, we should not be footing the bill entirely by ourselves for what is essentially a regional facility. Um, it, it is very much open to the state and federal governments uh, to come on board to see a worthy project, a project which we're already progressing the plans for, which can be shovel ready, um, perhaps in, in, in time for, 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 for the appropriations bills of the next state and federal budgets to be passed. Um, uh, and then we can get to work building it and potentially they could negotiate with us to have the existing centre remain open while we build something next door. So this is a no-brainer, um, uh, I think, Lord Mayor, if you put our ratepayers first, if you put our community first, um, instead of this ridiculous, ridiculous idea that for some reason we need to be taking care of hundreds of thousands of people who have their own local government, who have their own council, who have a state government and a federal government which they, which they elect. Um, I, I'll, I'll go to the Deputy Lord Mayor, then I do have some questions. I have an amendment, Lord Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Can I read this out? An all, yeah, an amendment, yeah. Oh, I will turn up motion. No, no, it's an amendment. amendment. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, notes, oh, that council notes the um, unsustainable and ongoing loss of the Aquatic Centre over the 2020 calendar year. On the basis of such loss, instructs council to again actively seek external funding from the state and federal government. Slow down, slow down. For funding assistance to enable an upgrade or replacement of the aquatic centre. In the event. Don't just, just slow down. Sorry. Aquatic Centre, in the event? In the event that the external funding is not obtained within the 2021-22 financial year to bring to Council a report of the Aquatic Centre's financials to consider the future of the centre. Um, I'm very sorry, but I have a point of order on this, a little bit of all respect to the DLM. Um, this amendment seeks to negate effectively the original motion, and I don't see that it is a valid amendment. Um, Um, it's because it doesn't talk about closing or ceasing operations. Can I just say so that it doesn't cease? <laughs> well, no, it it's, just, it's, it's a negative, it's a direct negative against that. Um, I think I don't think we can accept that because it's it's um, you know. Um, I, I, I was going to ask the question of the mover, um, the, the indefinite period or until a decision of chamber, unless it is, is for me very confusing because it's a matter of are we ceasing operations or are we just going to stop for a couple of months or are we going to stop until we decide we should go again. Yeah. And, um, well, Lord Mayor, um, 
and the advice from the administration is very clear that it's going to cost us more to cease for a short while than to either close or continue operating. Lord Mayor, it was simply to give us uh, some movement potential. It would simply allow us something up our sleeve to say we may re reopen, but if it is uh, dependent on that uh, uh, decision to stop rather than have the opportunity to, to restart in six months down the track for whatever reason, I'm fine with bearing that and just say six is the operation of the aquatic centre very much 21 uh, and just removing everything after 2021 uh, except for Councillor Hyde's uh, no, just... variation. If that's um, if you're more comfortable with that, I'm fine. No, that. look, it's not a, it's not about a level of comfort. It's just a matter of I think that the comment is very clear that it's going to cost us more to stop and reopen yeah. than may to stop. So I think the choice is really if we either stop or we keep going. May I ask, Seeking of funding, absolutely. May I ask the administration as to whether they believe the original wording provides a greater degree of flexibility that's warranted uh, or whether or not the uh, excising of that section uh, is going to be? CEO. Yeah, it's very Lord Mayor. I must, be, must resist entering the debate as, as you would know, but um, I think that the suggested changes right now provide the clarity that is required. As the report, as the response to, to the original motion details, having, having a, a kind of closure for a short period is problematic because of the holding costs. So at least with this suggestion, we have clarity over closure um, unless we receive funding. So to me, that is more achievable. Um, however, um, it, it, it's a very definite decision of council as compared to a, an indefinite period of closure, which does provide more flexibility, but it comes at a greater cost. Thank you. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, uh, I think given uh, the original wording would almost obviate uh, the purpose behind the motion, I would go with the um, second wording, which is as we have now. Councillor Hyde. Oh, I was As just going to suggest a further variation if that's what was necessary from a government's perspective, but it's already crossed out. As a seconder, are you happy with Yes, sorry, I am. Yeah, okay. that's great. Um, again, I need leave of the meeting for that variation, so I just need a show of hands. It's not You're not voting for or against it, it's just leave of meeting to, for the variation. Okay, thank you, members. So, um, Thank you for uh, allowing me to answer those questions to get that clarity. I just think it's important that we uh, understand what the information is before us as well. Um, members, I'll go to the floor. Are there any other questions or comments or would anybody like to speak to it? Councillor Martin. Uh, Lord Mayor, look, I can't tell you how uh, distressed I am to see this. Um, this is for me, a low point in this council uh, because this is not about money uh, this is an ideological thing it is a council dominated by people who don't subscribe to the notion that we are here not only to provide support to businesses but to provide services that aid the well-being of our residents and this one does it provides um, learn to swim classes, um, they did for my kids, uh, they may have done for yours. Uh, it provides um, learn to swim and recreational activity for all manner of people. I've mentioned previously that the disabled uh, use this centre on a daily basis. Uh, there are training programs for police and other organisations. And the cost to us uh, pre-COVID uh, uh, was uh, a deficit. Uh, the last one I saw was three hundred thousand dollars. The worst I've ever seen is seven hundred thousand um, dollars. And our administration has been working hard to get that deficit down, uh, so that the impost on ratepayers isn't as great. And yet, every time they try and do that, uh, and our administration keeps telling us that you guys actually damage us. You know, Councillor Kira stands up and says. Let's close the, the aquatic centre. And as a consequence, the loss grows because people won't renew their memberships. Uh, they don't go there because uh, they know that it's coming to a close. That's what our administration is telling us. Um, it is a sad state of affairs. And it is um, politically naive 
um, it, it is almost loony to believe that by closing an asset, you're going to bring the federal or state government to the rescue. I'd like another minute for this. Thank you. Um, you're going to bring the state or federal government to the rescue. Um, it, it actually works the other way. When you start to blackmail federal and state governments, they say, no way. They draw a line in the sand. Uh, you actually get money and, uh, and assistance from government by negotiating with them. Look at our own position. Do we respond to blackmail? We don't. We actually listen when people take us to one side and talk to us. And in this instance, we're just threatening. Now, I just can't fathom the disappointment which will turn to anger in the community from this motion, because it is going to be carried by this group of people here. I have not the slightest doubt. Um, and when that happens, we will be ending, I think, uh, what has been an important connection, not just for us with our residents, but with the city of Adelaide. We're a capital city. We found tonight $1.5 million uh, for business support initiatives. And tonight it's being proposed. Uh, we can't find a third of that to assist our principal service, community service that contributes to well-being in this community. Um, you know, I despair, I really do. And I am upset about this. Members, I've got uh, Councillor Knoll, then Councillor Mackey, then Councillor High. Uh, oh, apologies, I do have you. Uh, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, would you like to say? Okay. So I was just checking whether you can speak, but you can. Yes. <laughs> It's, well, you actually put an amendment forward which wasn't accepted, so you can speak. Are you going to? Yeah, one thing at a time. Well, he's standing. I'll go to you afterward. I'll go to you next. Look, um, I can appreciate the sentiment by any stretch, but we're obviously just coming out of COVID, etc., and. I am not against if at the end of, end of the day we need to shut the, the pool because of the, it's not just the $1 million, it is the 15 to $20 million we're going to have to find. So this is, it's it's hard to say what's the right thing to do. But I, I'm, I'm always a firm believer in that you um, you look at a problem, you, find, you, you look at ways to mitigate the, the issues that it has and to see what options that you have got and it, you work your way towards saying we've done everything we can, you give every opportunity for, for the people that are the stakeholders etc to do that and I mean COVID is, is, uh, is obviously has destroyed this year, has destroyed all the balance sheets and, and the, the, you know, your p &Ls. I think it is more, I'd rather do this as a structured way and work my way towards saying this is this is the, how we're going to do that. 21, 22 is certainly not unfair in that regard and allowing the community to support the, the pool and show their, their, you know, how that it is, it's integral to their, uh, their well-being, but also, and again, you know, as, as I'm sure the administration in so is doing, talking to all of the other state, federal governments, and also the other councils, because if you're serious, and that is that we cannot put this extra uh, burden on our ratepayers, who again, 9% are the ones uh, of the visitations pre-COVID. I mean, right now, the, the, all the numbers are terrible. So I, I personally always would enable people to, uh, to, to you know, support, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the pool and then allow you know that to, to determine uh, if we're going to close it or not because either they come to the party and you know do that uh, and in the meantime you use every avenue that you can uh, to uh, you know put out a new pool and uh, get whatever assistance you can and this way you have it uh, you know the community has the opportunity to show how they're interested Deputy Lord Mayor. Well, Lord Mayor, I have to say I am truly, truly disappointed. This is um, a really sad day and um, I have to express my disappointment to my, co my elected colleagues um, that have um, pushing forward, that are pushing forward to close this uh, aquatic centre 
it has formed, uh, been part of people's lives for 50 years. Um, it is very much part of the community. It is uh, very much uh, used by um, school children, um, learn to swim programs, the elderly, um, migrants, uh, disabled sporting groups, um, a vast range of the community. And I would have thought that as a council, we would be committed to ensuring that we provide the service in some way to the community. Um, sure, we, are, we all know that it has um, financial difficulties, um, but as I agree with Councillor Martin on this, we are also here for the community and taking this away is you're actually doing a disservice to them. So I would like to express my complete disappointment to each and every one of you that vote for this and um, I cannot express the sadness that is going to be uh, over the community in regards to this being closed. Uh, Councillor Mackey, then Councillor Ho. <clears throat> Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I, look, I share um, the Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Martin's abject uh, despondency um, at uh, the deeper implications of this motion. Yes, we know that our aquatic centre is wanting uh, for investment uh, and wanting for business growth. But we are, a, for goodness sake, we're a capital city and there are certain things that capital cities hold on behalf of their communities. Um, do we charge an admission to get onto the parklands? No. Are the parklands enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people who live in Greater Adelaide and our visitors? Yes. Do we expect um, that to be paid? It, it, it's a very reductive uh, exercise and you know a very slippery uh, slope. When we start to say, okay, because the Aquatic Centre, which is, as, as the Deputy Lord Mayor said, nearly 50 years old uh, uh, now, and has been a, a source of uh, delight, recreation and, and fitness to hundreds of thousands of people over those years. Um, uh, we have to take responsibility. We certainly have to be proactive in seeking uh, the partnership with the state and federal government for the investment that's necessary. Um, but I, I, I really despair. We, we're not a corporate, yes, we're, we are a corporation of the city of Adelaide. We're not a PTY LTD. We're not here to profit. We are certainly here to generate income. The ratepayers, uh, our ratepayers who elect us, are not the only source of income that comes into our funding mix. Um, every visitor to the city who parks a vehicle pays a form of rate or a form of tax, and that is the privilege of being able to park in the city. Um, that accounts for nearly 50% of our of our operating uh, budget. So let's forget this idea that ratepayers uh, are the ones who are propping up the aquatic centre. It's in fact actually the pe good people of Greater Adelaide um, who are paying the levy that we charge them to park their cars in the city if you want to start to bifurcate uh, where our, our money comes from. So look, I, I certainly can't support the motion uh, and I think we have a responsibility as a tier of government to, to remember the greater good that we are here for. Councillor Ho. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, well, I mean, same as some of the members in this room, I've used the centre for over 10 years myself, and my kids learn to swim in this centre as well. There's a lot of memories attached to this centre. Before, especially in the spa, I met with many elderly people from my community as well as the Vietnamese community. And in recent years, these people are gone. Why? because the facility is dying. We have closed the diving pool for a very long time, and now we even closed the steam and the sauna room. It, does, it is not open to non-members. We only have about 800 members, and the rest, 700 visitors, cannot use the steam room and the sauna room. Instead of seeing it as a sad day, I see this as a very happy day. 
Why? Because you, if you don't close this window, the new door will never open. We all know that the facility is dying. We can't save it. The previous councils have tried many times. Administration have spent so much time and efforts on this. They try to save it. We all know that our community love these facilities. I love it too. But can we offer something better to our communities? Can we offer something new to our communities that can last for another half? another 50 years this is the time we need to bring the government on board we as a we as a capital city we as a city as a capital city council all right we should be we should take responsibilities to maintain the facility maintain the aquatic center but we should only take part of the responsibility not a hundred percent of the responsibility the state government need to play a part on it it is unfair to our ratepayers to carry on 90 percent carry on carry on all carry on all the costs that the centers the, 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 i mean the center costs anyway and one more thing to mention one more thing to mention in regards to constant Oh, sorry, hold me, I might need another minute. Sorry. Yes. To, to answer Councillor Maggie's concern, there is a $4 million loss a year. Can we spend this money for better use? Can we push the state government to take to carry on their own responsibilities and we spend the four million dollars somewhere else to bring more people back to the city to help our residents to help our business in the cbd we look after our ratepayers state state government look after the taxpayers thank you ceo i'll just ask for a clarification of that loss thank you yeah it's true you look now i think it's important that we do understand fully the loss sean has joined us tonight perhaps you just quickly run us through those figures thanks sean Thank you. Through the Chair, um, the operational losses for this financial year that were budgeted were $2.76 million. Um, we're currently tracking about 571k favourable year to date to that number, but that's the current operational losses. The long-term financial plan has operational losses of next year um, that includes our depreciation of $2.4 million. Question on that. Yes. Well, if it's in a 10 years period, on one hand, it is the operational loss. On the other hand, it's the capital work. How much would the capital work cost in 10 years' time? Thanks. And altogether, put it this way, like in 10 years, how much are we going to loss? Councillor Ho, you need to ask through the chair Sorry, so that I can talk to the CEO. Should the Thank you. Yep, thanks, Sean, if you could respond. Through the chair, um, it's difficult to answer simply when we're mixing operational losses with capital. So the simplest way that I could answer for you over the 10 year period is operating losses in the long term financial plan of 17 million and capital works would cost 14 to 21 million. All right, thanks. Yep. Um, Councillor Martin. Um, look, thank you for that. Question? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, I wonder if the administration could detail for us uh, the uh, the operating loss. Uh, uh, I'm not interested in capital. Just how much the centre lost in 18, 19, and 17, 18. Thanks, Sean. Last financial year's operating loss was just over a million dollars. Um, and off the top of my head, that included an accounting adjustment of $350,000, um, which was a non-cash. So you would have to take that off in considering, you know, in considering the operational loss. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the prior financial year handy on me. I apologize. So I'm to understand then that 18, 19, apart from the accounting loss, it was $650,000, is that correct? So let me, can I clarify which financial year you're talking? Because I'm we asking, are in 2021, and so the last financial year was 1920. 
Um, I understand that we've had 1920, um, and so I'm asking about 18, 19, 17, 18, mm -hmm. which have been provided to us previously, but I haven't got I those have, figures. No, I don't have one. Three or maybe we need to take that on notice. Yep. Um, can I confirm that until COVID hit, that is at the beginning of this year, the operating loss anticipate, anticipated was around $400,000 or less? CEO. Thanks, Sean. Through the chair, the pre-COVID budget, the financial loss was uh, in the vicinity of $700,000. Thank you. Um, members, Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Just really briefly, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm flabbergasted this has even been taken seriously. Um, I think uh, Councillor Curis's um, proposed amendment that unfortunately couldn't get up for other reasons was, was quite reasonable. But to propose that we're going to close the Aquatic Centre with no other plan in place um, is preposterous given what has come before and the whole process that we've gone through with consultation. This is just no further action. Um, so, yeah, I certainly won't be supporting it. I would have supported Councillor Kouros's amendment, which was not possible, um, but I'm actually just utterly flabbergasted that this is even being taken seriously. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I do share um, the Deputy Lord Mayor's sentiment about uh, tonight being a sad night, uh, this year being a sad year, and, and the past decade being a sad decade because for the past decade, that, that centre has been losing money. And I've been a regular visitor of that centre for the past decade. Uh, and, and I've seen it go downhill. I've, uh, I, I, I saw it get renovated, um, whenever it was, seven or eight years ago. Uh, but it's kind of like, you know, when you're renovating a centre like that, it's like someone comes along and chops your arm off and you're, and you're there putting band-aids on. You know, it's, it's, it's just not going to do the job. Um, so one way to get around that, which we tackled, um, I guess, last year, and that was to attract private investment. And that's where the uh, Adelaide Football Club comes in. And, oh, no, no, don't, don't talk about that. Don't talk about private investment. Uh, don't talk about unsolicited bids. Don't talk about any of that, because that's just, uh, you know, that, that, that's horrible. Well, no, that was one way that we could get around it. That was a way to get around it. And there were certain members that made a, uh, made a lot of noise about that. This is, I understand that this is a community facility, but it's bad financial management on our behalf. And I guess, you know, we can, we can all sit here and point fingers, right, and say, well, previous council or the council before that, or this person or that body or that body. But one thing I've learned is the minute you start pointing the finger, there are three fingers pointing back at you. So here, right now, each and every one of you has a responsibility. That's what I put to you. Members, if not, I'll go to Councillor Kerr to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, well, look, um, the Deputy Lord Mayor spoke of disappointment uh, in her fellow councillors uh, this evening. Um, I I'm disappointed, uh, Lord Mayor. I'll tell you what's disappointing to me, uh, and that is the suggestion uh, that this has been brought uh, into the chamber in bad faith. or that those issues uh, uh, mentioned by the Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, that it's been in use for decades, that it uh, has a very strong uh, base of users, it's a very important facility to many people. Uh, the suggestion that those things haven't been considered by uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor's fellow councillors, well, I think that's disappointing. Uh, I have considered those things. Uh, of course they have been considered. Uh, what I'm putting to the Chamber is a difficult decision. This is not something that I uh, um, needed to do. I could have sat uh, back uh, this meeting and not putting anything up to the meeting. Um, there's nothing in this for me personally. Uh, what I'm saying to the Chamber is we've got to look at both sides of the equation and I had hoped uh, we would have a balanced and measured discussion without uh, you know, the suggestion that both sides aren't being looked at. Um, I would also have hoped there would be some addressing of the other side of the coin that I've mentioned, uh, the dilapidation of the facilities, the, fail the, the uh, shortcomings in its design in relation to sexual assault, uh, and its staggering and grotesque energy use. Uh, none of those things have been addressed 
by those who are simply, I would submit, taking the easy option and saying, well, this is a terribly sad day, you're just not considering the other side. Well, we are considering the other side. And finally, Lord Mayor, and most importantly, this motion has been brought into the chamber with the understanding that we are not about shutting an aquatic centre for good. That imputation is, is equally grotesque as the staggering energy is. And we are not about to shut an aquatic centre for good. We are all of the will of building a new aquatic centre, and I would ask for 30 seconds more. Um, we are all of the view of building a new aquatic centre that is purpose-built. Think of the money you could put into that aquatic centre if you saved uh, the eye-bleeding loss that is going on at the moment. Uh, so this is not about killing off the aquatic centre permanently. This is about saying, let's be realistic uh, about all of the negatives and let's draw a line in the sand and let's commit to something new and purpose-built uh, that will be much better for the long term. Members, uh, let's go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That fails. Division. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand and remain standing till all names have been called. Councillor Avraham today, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Ho and Councillor Hyde. Thank you, members. That takes us to 17. For actually, uh, members, would you mind if we have a five minute break? No, five, five minutes, minutes all right? Five, five, five minute break, thank you very much.
nine. Uh, CAP representations. Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, I require a seconder. Yep, moving as as read. Yep, thank uh, you. Seconder, Councillor Donovan. Um, Lord Mayor, uh, look, this, uh, I'll get straight to the point. Uh, the origins uh, of this uh, proposal are with ratepayers. Um, I have raised it uh, as a result of representations uh, uh, that um, ratepayers made in relation to the Childers Street property, which recently was the subject of some uh, controversy, uh, and this future has not been resolved. Um, and the circumstances were that uh, several ratepayers uh, entitled to make submissions to the council assessment panel uh, did so, but failed to tick the box saying that they wished to make a personal representation uh, and then changed their minds and sought the indulgence of the presiding member to allow them to speak uh, and they were denied that opportunity. Um, they were denied that opportunity in part because the advice of the administration was that current legislation doesn't provide that discretion to the presiding member. Uh, and therefore, this uh, uh, proposal is to allow the presiding member, with the concurrence of the planning minister, to do so. Um, it doesn't uh, propose that anyone else does uh, that, but it asks that those who make a written submission who change their minds are able at the discretion of the presiding member um, uh, to make a presentation that this would allow greater flexibility. Um, the second point, um, and I, I will ask you, Lord Mayor, uh, that this be taken in parts um, uh, because that uh, would be my intention. Uh, the second part asks, and again, as a consequence of representations from ratepayers, uh, in relation to the Jeffcott Street matter, uh, who believe that they should have had some uh, rights uh, to speak, even though they did not have adjoining property rights, um, uh, should be able to do so. Now, I understand uh, the administration's comment and that the planning reforms will allow uh, individuals to make representations, uh, and I would ask that uh, if it is agreed by the Chamber that a letter goes uh, to the Minister. Councillor Martin, that was the bell. So if you require further time, I'll ask to leave the Chamber. Okay. It's very short. Yeah. Bell tonight, isn't it? Can we have the time checked on that? Chamber, leave the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. I'm almost finished. Um, uh, it, it is, is uh, I suggest, possible for Lord Mayor uh, to ask the Minister or to at least mention to the Minister uh, that this matter was raised and that in the interim, uh, that is before the new planning changes are adopted, um, it is certainly uh, uh, the result of the Chamber that um, it is an important issue that needs to be considered in the interim. Uh, and I make that comment because uh, nobody can guarantee that the new planning laws will be adopted uh, anytime soon. Uh, given the, the controversy around those, and indeed the Minister for Planning's assertions that there need to be changes. Um, uh, that's all I have to say. Councillor Donovan, Members, Councillor Kira. Oh, I just have a question. Um, it all looks kosher. I'm just wondering whether those I are more familiar with the uh, actual operation of CAT uh, myself. Uh, so it's a question needed to the planning uh, staff and the administration through you. Uh, to any former members, or any other members uh, who have been on CAP. As number two, just in terms of efficacy, uh, does number two present uh, any issues whereby you might effectively have, um, you know, a children's street or whatever, you might have a thousand people uh, applying to be heard um, and it just becomes unworkable because each of them have to be considered as to whether or not they've got a case to be answered, whereas currently you've got, you know, the rules at least provide a structure. So I'm just. just uh, CEO. Thanks, Clinton. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, the, the current rules under the Development Act um, and the regulations 2008 do provide that structure. I guess the challenge will be um, adopting something that 
doesn't provide that structure. So what um, we're advising um, councillor through this motion is that, um, in our opinion, the new Planning Development Infra Infrastructure Act of 2016 provides that structure. Um, that then enables the presiding member to work to an instrument um, to, uh, to assess uh, through CAP. Thank you. I'm, I might just speak to the motion. Um, given that response, Lord Mayor, um, I vote this for you because it is, it is too unstructured, unfortunately. Uh, number two is too unstructured uh, and this, this presents real problems. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Councillor Abraham, today. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, I won't be supporting this for a, for a number of reasons. I think um, if, uh, if if the mover of the motion wanted to go about this the proper way, you probably want to, um, I guess, maybe go through the LGA and get get the LGA to, um, to to lobby on the on the council's behalf because we're not asking the minister to change this specifically for the city of Adelaide. We're changing them to we're asking them to change this. Uh, which um, has implications on, on, on all councils. So that's one point. And the other point is, I guess already highlighted in administration's comment, uh, third point, and that is the notification process. And it is changing, and it's changing so that uh, it allows everyone to comment on developments where you essentially get a sign on the, on, on the site. And even if you're from Melbourne, you can walk past and put your name on there and, and uh, uh, add your voice to, to those who wish to be heard. So uh, the PDI Act has, uh, has many, many changes that are yet to be um, discovered uh, and, uh, and I think time will tell in terms of how that's going to uh, play out in the planning space. Thank you, members. I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Lord Mayor, look, let me make it clear, I am making this representation on behalf of ratepayers and um, if uh, the Chamber declines, uh, the Chamber declines. Um, but uh, I'm saying that there is a desire uh, among ratepayers to see in respect of one. And that's why I'm asking this matter to be taken in parts uh, and Councillor Kira should note that his concerns are primarily about the second matter the first matter is pretty straightforward. It simply gives the discretion to the presiding member. The presiding member can decide if you've forgotten to tick, tick the box saying, um, I want to make a submission and you change your mind 20 minutes after putting it in an envelope and sending it to the council or, or filling out an email, you have that uh, option open to you to appeal to the presiding member. The presiding member remains in control and can say, yes, I agree, or no, sorry, you're too late. That is all it's asking for, to give the presiding member the opportunity, the flexibility to say, okay. In respect to the second, yes, I do understand uh, that the new PDI Act will provide that flexibility and all that is asking, and I do understand that that's a big ask, all that is asking is that the Lord Mayor raises it with the government as an interim issue, because the new PPI Act does provide exactly what's proposed at two. Um, Lord Mayor, I just ask members to, if they can't support two, to support one. There is no Trojan horse. It's a simple representation from a group of ratepayers, some of whom didn't tick the box and thought later on they should do it. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, members will take this in parts. Uh, if we can vote on part one, those in favour, those against, that fails. And I'll look to part two, those in favour, those against, that also fails. Thank you, members. That takes us to 17.10, Councillor Martin, uh, South West Bike, no, sorry, not South Bikeway, South West Bikeway. Well, look, uh, Lord Mayor, I don't need to say uh, too much about this. The administration has provided a very extensive... Thank you. I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, look, uh, I don't need to say too much. The administration has provided a fairly extensive re response uh, detailing some broad parameters about delivery and concludes by saying, should this motion be endorsed, that is that we receive 
uh, a report about the completion of these parts of the North-South Bikeway. Um, if uh, this motion is endorsed, further details, including drawings, maps, and funding details of the planned bikeway can be provided. That's all I've asked for. If the administration is prepared to do that, uh, I'd be very pleased. Um, and I need to speak no further. Deputy Long Mayor, do you wish to speak? Councillor Williams. Just, just a quick question. The information, can that come through e news? I would assume that you'll have to pack it into a committee or a workshop or anything. CEO. Through Lord Mayor, yes, we certainly can do it through e news, unless you specifically require a report to Council. Um, no, I think I need uh, just to have the notification. Uh, Happy to do that. Okay. Members, if not, go to Councillor Martin sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Wow. That takes us to Councillor Martin's 17.11 master plan spending. Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, uh, this is a, a matter again that I'm raising. I'll take on. that as read and I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. It's a matter that I'm raising uh, again on behalf of uh, businesses uh, in North Adelaide. And um, I must say, uh, there was a deal of excitement um, at the beginning of this term of council. Uh, when it was proposed and supported by the Deputy Lord Mayor and the Deputy Lord Mayor, sorry, the Deputy Lord Mayor at the time and the Deputy Lord Mayor currently, all of that time, uh, that we should have master plans for O'Connell Street and Melbourne Street, and then um, uh, Councillor Hyde, as he was then, I think, um, uh, proposed that Hutt Street be added, um, because it would give some degree of certainty to the areas in relation to um, uh, Council's planned infrastructure works um, so that there was basically a palette, um, a design that they were working to. Um, and uh, that motion still stands. Uh, however, I note uh, and I have referenced that of that $370,000 that was allocated, only $232,000 remains. Now, I do understand from the update at 3.51 this afternoon, and look, uh, um, Lord Mayor, I would ask that the administration, particularly where motions are lodged at least a week in advance, does distribute information sooner than one hour before meetings. It, it does help us in the consideration of information. And frankly, at one hour and 10 minutes before the meeting, I've not had the opportunity to study it thoroughly. Uh, had it arrived yesterday, uh, tickety-boo, I would have had it done. However, uh, having noted uh, the information that's there, um, it is clear that there is great progress being made. Um, what is absent, however, is that final detail about what the infrastructure looks like, what the, the street furniture is. Um, there are certainly observations about how it is. Uh, there are observations about what possible parameters might be. But there is no, is that three minutes? Three minutes? Okay. Okay, in that case, Lord Mayor, um, I won't ask for more time, uh, although I am conscious of the bit, but um, uh, Lord Mayor, um, I think that pretty much sums it up. I'm simply asking uh, for the council to ask the administration um, to complete those reports to provide certainty to our communities, uh, our business communities. Deputy Lord Mayor. You seconded it. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Hyde. Um, I, I was just reading the response that was circulated earlier. Um, and I just have a question. Ask the administration to get January 2021 with the remaining funds available. What, what is the administration's interpretation of that? Because it's sick. I mean, there are things in train. Yes, we all know that train's very slow. But um, are you going to be starting spending money in 2021? Have you always been spending a little bit of money? Are you not going to spend anything until you report back to us in February? 
like is, is two going to happen anyway? I suppose is my that's my question. It wasn't clear from the response. CEO. Thanks, Clinton. Uh, three, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm not sure the train is moving that slow. Um, there, there is a body of work that I sent through, um, admittedly later this afternoon, but um, I would implore members to go through that information. There's been a, a whole body of work done on the main streets um, to date, and a lot of that work is uh, investigation, planning, understanding the workings of each of the streets, um, talking to the local businesses, the traders, um, compiling a lot of that data that's been collated over many, many years of working and operating in those streets with the local communities. Um, notwithstanding that, we have committed to bringing a reporting to Council in February. Um, I would implore um, elected members to review the information and the data that's been sent through today. And we would welcome some discussion in February and some guidance on um, the future spend of that budget. If I could just talk to the current work that has been done, it's been resourced internally by council administration. So what you'll find is we haven't extended a large amount of the budget, but that's because a lot of the work has been done um, with internal resource. But in, with, with regards to the, to the motion itself, does that, is it inconsistent with your existing sort of work program? That's, that's what I'm, I don't understand. Like, it's too inconsistent. I mean, it looks like it's fairly open ended and loose. We ask you to begin, sorry, through you, Lord Mayor, if we ask for uh, the, the expending of funds to begin in January 2021, like, are there little things that have already been identified that, um, you know? I will go to the CEO because we've been working on the streets. Yeah, three, Lord Mayor, look, I don't think this motion is. It, creates a problem for us at all. Um, there is some work that's been going on for some time and I believe that it would be complementary to the work we're doing. But Clinton, any further thoughts? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, in answer to your question, Councillor, I think we're, um, as in regards to point two, we, I'm very confident we've already progressed work and started work, so I don't think it, um, it's um, detrimental in any way to what we've already done. Uh, if I'm just ready, it's just the, the master planning process has already begun. Mm. So it's to, mm. to ask for that to begin in 2020, it's just um, sort of a moot point because it's already underway. So that, I'm, that's uh, what yeah. I'm trying to get my head around. Yeah. Um, all good. Yep. Um, so members, are there any other questions or comments? No, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, and I predicate these remarks um, uh, on the fact that one hour before the meeting, I, I wasn't able to give much attention to the plans, um, but um, uh, they are impressive. Uh, they are the first time I've seen them. And in the quick look, yes, they are the first time that they've been distributed. Um, and parts, little bits and pieces have been seen before, but it, it's pulling it all together. And the bit that is missing is this is where we go in terms of what the streetscape looks like. Um, this is what we can commit to. And that's all I'm asking, uh, nothing more than that. And the reason I'm asking it is um, uh, uh, partly because of your comments. Uh, we are at the halfway, well, we're past the halfway mark of this council. This was one of the first initiatives of the council. and. Uh, the stakeholders are saying to me, it, it'd be great if we had that master plan, what's happened to that master plan. Uh, and so all this is doing is asking the administration uh, to bring to us something that we can see, something that we can share, um, and that will, to some extent, satisfy uh, the ratepayers, uh, businesses in the North Adelaide precincts particularly, but I'm sure in uh, Hutt Street as well, um, to see that council is making real progress and has some real concepts to present. Members, to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, members, are there any motions without notice? <laughs> if not, hilarious. No, 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 no. 
Yeah, look, I, I do have one. No. Um, and look, I, I'm um, open to any proposed uh, variations to it. Um, uh, it is um, uh, that council asked the administration uh, to report um, to elected members um, on the latest assessment of trees in the parklands, which may pay, pose any risk of failure, um, endangering city us users, um, uh, together with uh, any advice about necessary actions. Um, and I'm open to any advice about that. Um, do you want me to see? But if we just have the end we, of that, please. Endangering city time. users. Was there anything else there? Sorry, members. Can I just have the end of the motion without notice, please? Engage, endangering city users. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'll give you the rest of the words and I'll check it. Uh, together with advice about any necessary actions. Together with advice about any necessary actions. Okay, uh, members, I'll look for a seconder. Deputy Lord Mayor. <laughs> On, uh, look, Lord Mayor, it is nothing more than it seems. Um, I'm sure other members have had the same requests from ratepayers today. Um, uh, not only that, but media inquiries as well. Does Council have a register of trees? Um, is it aware of those which pose any risk? Uh, and if so, what are its intentions? Um, this is just asking for a report. I'm happy to have it on e-news. But there is a degree of concern in the community following uh, the incident on South Terrace today, in which a part of a tree fell on a car, yep. trapping a woman for some time. Thankfully, um, uh, she suffered only slight injuries. But this coming on the back of fatalities in other places has residents concerned that the city of Adelaide, which arguably has a greater number of trees in a greater number of places than any other local government area in the city of Adelaide or in the Adelaide metropolitan area um, is causing a degree of concern. It would be a good thing for elected members such as myself to be able to say th these are the facts um, and there is risk, no risk or whatever the answer is. Uh, based on the information supplied by the administration. I'm not asking for an investigation. I'm asking for some information that would allow a communication with great matters. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Uh, I too have received um, uh, great payers in, re in regards to this matter. Um, there is just some level of concern out there with um, some members of the public um, also, um, I uh, would just uh, would like to know also the new plantings that we had in some trees that are in the centre of the road, the big gum trees, on, particularly on Hospital Road, what would also happen when they grow to a maturity if that is going to oppose any risk um, to cars um, when they reach maturity. It is a, just a question that people are asking me um, as well. Um, I don't want to impose more work for administration but um, it is a question that has been asked by me from the public. Councillor Hyde, did you uh, Yes, I, I fully support this move um, uh, and I, I share, I too share uh, Councillor Martin Kouros' concerns and particularly Councillor Kouros' concerns around uh, the planting of new trees. And in actual fact, I think this is something that we will need to keep an eye on in the city of Adelaide because as the climate changes, um, uh, so too does the risk of these grand gum trees uh, having failing branches and falling on people. And I ultimately think we need to rethink um, our planting uh, design manual, whatever it is that we have in the city of Adelaide, um, and think of that within the context of a warming climate, um, because that's going to mean more gum trees falling on, you know, possibly more people more often. Um, uh, and so I, I, I honestly think we need to think about that. This information uh, will be the start 
uh, of that discussion, I think. Members. Councillor Martin, just sum up. I'm sorry. I know you're going to lose your bet, but could you please sum up? Welcome back. Councillor Martin, I'm waiting for you to sum up. Oh, sorry. I need you to Well, there's no way to let me speak for 15 minutes. No, I'm not. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Members, are there any further? Unanimous? Sorry? Could that be recorded as unanimous? Uh, members, are there any further question, uh, motions without notice? If not, I uh, call the meeting closed. Thank you, members. As our last meeting of the year, oh, that's not bad. 17 minutes, you would have won it there.